Hey, I'm not sure why you're here. You can't sleep, anxiety, stress, or maybe you just want to hear some true scary stories. Whatever it is, I hope this video helps. Just focus on the stories and the sounds in this video. Two things before we begin. One, this video was designed to help people relax or sleep. So I only put four ads in the entire video. Four ads after the first four stories. Then you'll have multiple hours of stories ad free. One more thing before the stories begin. Chilling, the horror streaming platform, now has video content in addition to the thousands of scary stories that are on there. Chilling now has full length feature films, short films, shows, documentaries, and more. And we have a brand new Chilling original film that was just released today, September 18th, 2023. It's called Gale, Stay Away From Oz. In this film, the classic enchanting story of the Wizard of Oz takes a haunting turn. And I have a special surprise. I have the official trailer right here to show you, right now. I give you Gale, stay away from Oz. Just relax. Listen to the sounds. The tempo. And just picture yourself there. In your dreams. Can you see it? Are you there? Yes. of Dorothy's? I don't know. Maybe? What you have there is a handwritten early draft of Dorothy's first book. Her writings were all based on her dreams of a place. Us? I feel... This is the best chance we have to unlocking all of this. To finding the truth. The truth? Yes, about Dorothy, the slippers. Stay away from us! Stay away from us! Stay Your away dreams, from us. they're the key Stay to all of this. I? Let's start at the beginning, and then you can learn for yourself. What do you think? This is a chilling exclusive film, and you can only watch it on Chilling. If you want to go watch it, Make sure you take advantage of this crazy deal. Use the promo code GALE2023 and for a very short time you can get 50% off an annual subscription plan. We also do have a free option with ads too, but exclusives and originals do require a subscription, so please keep that in mind. This film is by far the biggest thing I've ever done. Please show me your support. Go watch it and come back here and tell me what you think in the comment section. It would really mean the world to me. Now, without any more delay, let's begin.
When I was a junior in college, I took a modern American literature course under a professor who I will call Dr. H. Her class took place right after the lunch period, so many of her students would come into the classroom looking like they were ready for a nap. Dr. H sympathized with us, so before she started the day's lecture, she would tell us an interesting story in hopes for waking us up a bit. Usually her stories were tidbits about the author we were studying that day. Some stories were more successful than others in getting our attention, but there was one story she told that got everyone's attention. She said that the story was a little long, but she thought we would find it interesting because, as she put it, the devil is in the details. Dr. H was a senior in college at the time this story took place. She shared a room with another senior, who she called S. They had both spent the day reading and working on papers for the week ahead, only breaking once to eat some sandwiches while listening to the radio. About 8 o'clock p.m., Dr. H and S decided to reward themselves with the rest of the night off. Dr. H had a novel that she had been dying to read, while S wanted to treat herself to some cocktails. S told Dr. H that she would only be gone for an hour, tops. She then said in a joking manner, If I'm not back in two hours, make sure the police find my body. S decided to have a cocktail or two at a bar that was popular with her classmates because it was so close to campus. She sat down at the bar and ordered a dry martini. She did not notice that she was seated right next to a man until she looked up from her glass and was greeted with a smile. The man tipped his tumbler at her and said, Hello. S was immediately embarrassed, especially because there was an empty seat to her right. She was about to move to the other seat, feeling as if she had violated one of the unspoken rule of bars, but before she could get out of her seat, the man said, You don't have to move if you don't want to. I like the company. The man extended his hand to S and introduced himself as Chris. He said that he worked in construction and was renting a room in the area. He asked S what she was studying and she told him she was a psychology major. Chris's eyes lit up and to S's surprise, he began to talk about Freud and Jung. She told him she had to do an experiment for her final project and he asked her which method she would be using, an observational study or a survey. She told him she wanted to make a link between lack of empathy and the potentiality for criminal behavior. She told him she wanted to do an observational study, something similar to Milgram's controversial studies, but based on posing scenarios rather than shock experiments. Chris shook his head. You should do a survey instead. S pointed out that people could lie on a survey without thinking twice about it, but that it was a lot harder to lie to someone's face. Chris chuckled. Sweetheart, a psychology professor could look at a student, the same student, for three years and never have an inkling that the kid killed his mother and has her buried in his backyard. People can lie to your face if they want to keep a secret bad enough, but a true sicko can't refuse the chance to show his true colors on a survey because that guy wants to shock you. S listened as Chris argued that Jack the Ripper's letters from hell proved his point, but she had already decided that though Chris knew some things about psychology, his lack of knowledge was beginning to show. Nevertheless, S still appreciated how passionate Chris was about helping her make the right decision regarding her project. She eventually told Chris that she would bring up all the good points he had made to her professor, and this seemed to satisfy him. Though S was attracted to men her own age, Chris had a certain appeal. He was not bad looking for an older man, and most importantly, he was easy to talk to. Over the course of 45 minutes, they had talked about various subjects including psychology, politics, and places Chris had traveled to while working various construction jobs. In all that time, Chris had not hit on S once. If Chris was trying to seduce her, he was being admirably patient in his approach. He did offer to buy S another martini when she finished her first, and though S would have normally said no to the offer, she felt so comfortable around Chris that she let him buy her a drink. While she had carefully nursed her first martini, S quickly drained her second, and without asking permission first, Chris bought her another. S did not mind because she wanted to spend more time with Chris. 
It pleased her that Chris seemed to have no expectations for sex in return for his generosity. S's attention quickly turned momentarily from Chris to the television behind the bartender. The newscaster was giving a preview for the evening news, which included a story about a fatal car accident that had occurred earlier that morning. S told Chris that she had heard about the accident on the radio that afternoon. She said that she felt terrible because a whole family had been killed in a head-on crash. Chris replied, I wonder if anyone was beheaded. Then he chuckled. S was stunned by this sudden change in Chris's personality. It was like an invisible mask had quietly slipped off of Chris's face to reveal the true man underneath. S had an urge to leave the bar, but the psychology major in her was intrigued. She had read about inappropriate effect and emotional personality disorders, but she had never met someone who displayed any of those characteristics before. Any desire that she had to sleep with Chris was now over, but she thought that he might be an interesting story to share with her fellow psychology majors. S continued to listen as Chris started talking in graphic detail about some of the accidents he had seen at construction sites, including one guy whose hand and wrist got pulled into a cement mixer and another guy who fell four stories from scaffolding and wound up in a twisted mess on the rubble below. The whole time he was talking about his fellow co-workers being maimed or killed on the job, Chris was smiling and giggling. S tried not to show her disgust, but when Chris followed up on a story of one of his co-workers being impaled by a piece of rebar by inviting S to his room for some real drinks, S suddenly remembered that she told her roommate she would be back in an hour. Chris's face was suddenly indifferent, not angry or sad, but more cold and expecting. Most men would have tried to turn on the charm in hopes of salvaging the night with a potential conquest, but Chris had already caught the eye of a blonde that had just walked into the bar. S said goodnight. Chris gave her a little wave but said nothing. When S finally arrived back to her room, S apologized for being late. She told Dr. H that she had been talking with a man. Dr. H smiled at the news and said, So, what was he like? S replied, He was interesting, but not in a good way. Early that morning, Dr. H was woken up by a pounding sound on their door. She heard the RA shouting on the other side of the door, Wake up! The campus is on lockdown! Dr. H had to shake S awake. They went outside to the hallway and saw the other occupants on the floor standing in nightgowns and pajamas crying, whispering, or just looking dazed and confused. The RAs looked panicked and they spoke to each other in whispers. Dr. H learned through the various conversations that multiple girls had been brutally attacked on campus just minutes ago. Police believed that the killer could still be on campus. No one in that dorm at that moment knew the extent of what had just taken place. Later that morning, each girl in the dorm was asked if they had seen anyone strange that night. For a moment, S thought of Chris, but she told herself, more than likely, that Chris was with a woman right now. S told the officer no and thought nothing more about it. When a news report finally broke a month later showing that the campus killer had been apprehended, there was a collective sigh of relief and a few loud cheers from the young women gathered around the television. Dr. H smiled, but when she turned to look at S, her roommate was staring at the television. Her eyes were wide and her face looked pallid. S said, I think I'm going to throw up. It was not until two years later when Dr. H, who had just finished her master's degree, and S who was now a law student, were having brunch that the subject of that horrifying night was brought up again. Dr. H said that S suddenly looked like she was not feeling too good. Dr. H asked S what was wrong. There was a pause as S took a sip of her orange juice. Dr. H could see that S's hand was shaking. S finally spoke. That night at the bar, if Chris had asked me to go to his room 30 minutes into our conversation, I would have gladly gone. S began to tear up. She then added, I wonder if I would be here right now. The man S had drinks with that night 
was Ted Bundy. This story I am about to tell, only a few people close to me have ever heard. However, I never actually explained in detail what happened that night to absolutely anyone. For this story specifically, it is necessary to explain my general area I live in, as it pertains to this event. I live next to Yellowstone National Park, which in of itself has drawn millions of tourists each year. Part of the reason I am telling this is merely a warning to people who decide to visit during the summer months. Last year in the summer of 2020, me and some of my buddies decided to go have a night out and do some camping out near a spot where we have been to multiple times in the past. After all, this was right after things started to become normal again and lockdowns were lifted. I decided to head up to the camp spot early in an effort to make sure my gear was still set up from earlier that day. I did this as an effort to reserve the spot as its first come first serve. Therefore, with everything in hand, I left my house right before sunset. We were all supposed to meet up within the hour, so I didn't really have any concerns of being by myself. I then began my 30-minute drive up to the location. When I finally arrived, I immediately noticed my tent, and everything inside, was gone. Now just for some context, I staked the tent down in multiple areas just to be sure it stayed for the period I was gone. Inside was my sleeping bag and a few other miscellaneous items I left just to keep it weighted down. However, everything, literally everything disappeared as if it was never there. I looked around and even the stakes and rocks I placed on the outside were missing. I immediately knew something was wrong because I did not see any campers on the way up. Also, keep in mind, I do not have cell service as it's a couple miles back into the wilderness. I then decided to drive back down from where I came to get service and get a hold of my friends and let them know what happened. Least to say, I was not happy with the situation and knew that whoever took my belongings were still in the area as it had only been there for an hour or two. However, my friends insisted that I stayed and at least hang out for a few hours as it took weeks of planning. So once I made sure everyone arrived, I then decided to go around the area in search of any sign of footprints or indications that maybe these people were close by. As you can guess, I wasn't able to find anything. I eventually played it off and decided I would just look for it in the morning and contact the forest service to report it missing. I also didn't want to ruin the party for everyone and decided to stay. In hindsight, this was by far one of the worst decisions I could have ever made. As the night went on, everything seemed fine, so I thought. Around 1 or 2 in the morning, most of my friends decided to call it a night. I ended up sleeping in my truck. This was perhaps one of the better decisions I made that night. That, along with always making sure to bring my bear spray and sidearm for protection from unexpected guests. I eventually fell asleep. However, it's important to note that I was still a bit on edge as only a couple hours before all of my belongings were taken. I decided to leave my window rolled down a bit just in case I heard anything creep up on us in the middle of the night. After about two hours of me being asleep, my worst nightmare came true. At first, I just heard something moving around outside of our camp. This was enough noise to wake me up and I immediately froze and I didn't move whatsoever. Therefore, this was partially because I knew whatever was making the noise was large, not just a raccoon or any other smaller creature. I then was paralyzed, just listening intently to whatever was happening outside of our camp. My first thought was that it was a bear. We also had sightings recently in the area at one point, I swear, it could have only been maybe 20 or 30 yards away. Also, another key point I noticed was that there was absolutely no other noises. Usually, there's grasshoppers or birds, but it was complete and utter silence. Now, in a wilderness, that's never a good sign. 
it means there's a large predator or something of the like in the area. Meanwhile, it's pitch black outside, and our fire had completely gone out. After about 15 minutes of not hearing anything, I decided I just needed to stop being paranoid. But just as I was about to fall back asleep, I saw something to the right of our campsite. It was just a few yards away from our fire pit, and probably about 20 yards from me. To my absolute horror, it was a person. I immediately freaked out. This was no average person either, let alone the fact that it's 3 or 4 in the morning and you're in someone's campsite. This person was wearing what I made out to be some kind of mask. I got a very good look at whoever it was, and it was a deer skull on their face. They were wearing a black robe, and that's about all I noticed. I sure didn't want to leave my truck and confront this person, so I did what I thought was best. I turned my truck on and began honking the horn until all my friends were awake. I rolled down the window and told them we need to get out of here immediately. After seeing what I saw, then did exactly that. Meanwhile, this person hasn't moved, mind you. Just as I thought it was bad, the situation got even worse. More of these figures began appearing in front of us through the trees, wearing the same outfits as mentioned earlier, but with a multitude of different masks. I immediately put my truck into reverse and began speeding away. They began walking closer and closer, but luckily I was able to drive out of this spot in time. As I began to speed down the road out of there, three more of these figures appeared out from the side of my truck, this time with a dog and way more aggressive than the previous ones I saw. They began throwing rocks at my truck and chasing after me. At one point, they were literally right next to my passenger window until I accelerated even more and eventually lost them. As I looked back in my mirror, I saw only one figure left, just simply peeking and staring at me behind a tree. This image is forever seared into my head. From this night on, I refuse to ever go back up there. I have never, ever spoken of this to anyone. Even when I was around my friends that experienced this, we never mentioned it to each other. It's been over a year now since this happened, and all I can say is that I believe these people were in some sort of cult. I heard other stories about similar events happening, and even cattle completely disappearing. It's very barbaric, and you wouldn't think that such a beautiful national park that attracts so many people year-round would have such dark and disturbing secrets. My advice to anyone that decides to travel to these mysterious and preserved parks of intrinsic beauty would be to always bring protection of some kind. Likewise, make sure you let others know about your plans, and never go alone. There are hundreds of missing persons reports across the national parks inside the United States, and I could have very well been one of them if I had stayed just a few minutes longer. Nature has a way to attract very different types of people. Some want to explore and push themselves to their limits. Meanwhile, some simply don't want to be seen and lurk in the darkness of night. A former Green Beret once told me the key to survival was always being aware of your surroundings and listening to your instincts. If a particular situation doesn't feel right, chances are, it's not. Stay safe, everyone. I'll tell you the story about the two times that I was almost kidnapped in the same spot. I was in high school and in the best shape of my life. I wasn't an athlete or anything, but I was growing into a woman's body, 5'8 and a long youthful body almost completely muscle. For that short period of my life, I was actually interested in maintaining myself, so I started a morning routine of going for a walk before breakfast. I lived in a neighborhood adjacent to this great park where I spent my life growing up. Soccer practice, dates you name it. 
I believed that by hanging upside down on the monkey bars once a day before breakfast, that I would stretch my spine just enough to keep growing taller and to alleviate any compression that might cause pain as I got older. On a hot summer morning before 10 a.m., I rolled out of bed, got dressed, and headed for the park. I don't think it's necessary to describe the area beyond the fact that it was completely surrounded by houses. It was a pretty safe spot. The parking lot comes first between my street and the park itself. In the lot, I could see a white van. The park district has vehicles that look just like it for things like picking up litter, sanitizing the playground, and bringing out the mowing equipment. I thought this van was here to trim trees or something, so I paid it little attention and headed for those monkey bars. Before I could make it to the playground, a voice stopped me. Hey! A man called from the driver's seat. A second voice came from the passenger seat. Come over here. I walked away disinterested, but knowing that two men had rolled their windows down to watch me and talk to me made me feel self-conscious. I didn't want my shirt to roll up while I hung upside down or stretch my hamstrings and give them a show of any kind that would give them the satisfaction. These were grown men, and I was in high school. Needless to say, I was prey and I knew it. Pretty creeped out, I decided to go for my routine walk, determined not to let two idiots change my workout. A woman has the right to go about her business. Fear turned to anger as the white van with the windows rolled down, crept alongside me. I was on the sidewalk, so a safe enough distance from the van on the road. I couldn't remember what they were hollering at me, but you can bet it was degrading sexual, and not at all what grown men should say to a minor. My anger boiled up inside, and before I let them get away with making me feel so violated, I decided to express myself too. I shot my middle finger high in the air and wagged it around. Now here is where the big oops happened. I know that this road darts into several no-outlet neighborhoods, and turning into one, especially if you're not from around here, like these guys were, means that you're going to U-turn and come back around. That's exactly what they did. As soon as I saw that white van accelerate angrily and swoop into the adjoining street, I knew they were about to come back for me. My stomach dropped, and I knew that I had only seconds to hide. No, I wouldn't reach the park in time. I knew that by the time I reached it, they would spot wherever I was going and attack me. I was close to a turnoff into another neighborhood where I knew Mr. D lived. Mr. D was a police officer and whose son happened to be dating my sister at that time. So I had his number. I never ran so fast in my life. I dove behind a conifer tree in his front yard and made myself as small as possible in the shadows. Sure enough, that white van came from the opposite direction, inching down the road at only five miles an hour. The windows were rolled up this time, probably to make it easier to get away with stuffing a screaming girl in the back without anyone hearing. They stopped at the intersection where I disappeared. I took my phone out and texted Mr. D. Hi, it's me. There are two guys following me and I'm hiding in your tree. Help. I watched through the pine needles as the guys pulled over and got out, talking quietly and looking around. I hated them, just watching as they talked about me. The front door swung open, and Mr. D came out in full uniform. It turns out that I had texted him while he was leaving for work. He did not look for me, but stamped down to the end of his driveway and looked down the street. Seeing those men notice a cop staring at them, and watching that white van speed away, was a magnificent sight. The second time I was almost kidnapped on that curb, happened the same summer, but this time it was raining lightly. It was dim and kind of muggy outside, so I remember that no one was outside except for me. I started jogging regularly in the evening, and that day was no exception. I thought that the rain would keep me cool and enhance how much longer I could go. 
Indeed, I was helped somewhat by the rain, for I had been running for a while and wasn't that tired yet. I kept my eyes focused on the sidewalk in front of me, but I could see the park slide past me in my peripheral vision. I was on the opposite side of the street as the last incident. A pretty beat up, olive green sedan came rolling quietly up the road with its headlights off. I thought that was weird, but knew that it would soon pass me. The sedan was in the oncoming lane, so we were face to face for a few meters, and I noticed that it slowed down significantly before pulling over to the curb. I was running towards this parked car, which already rang my alarm bells. My suspicions flared into overdrive as the driver's side door opened and a tall bald man built like a refrigerator came out of it and crossed over to the passenger's side. But I tell you, I amazed myself in that second. Before he even crossed in front of the first headlight, before my foot could finish another rhythmic step of a long jog, my brain sent a flaming hot shiver of adrenaline through my body so fast that I actually sprang up in the air when my foot landed and pushed me off the pavement. I spun around in mid-air and darted in a new direction away from the man. The phrase fight or flight ceased to be a figure of speech as I actually witnessed it transform my body and put my conscious self into autopilot. If there's something I learned that day, it's that you can't choose fight or flight. Your body will do whichever it wants automatically. You might be programmed to be a fighter, or you might be someone like me, whose flight mode is so powerful that it thrusts you into space like a glitch in the matrix. I didn't spring in the direction of the sidewalk. No, that was too dangerous. He would just follow me in his car. I actually saw houses whirring past me as I made my way through backyards and patios. I wish I could say I never ran so fast in my life, but as you can recall, I had already run from my life once before, about this fast. I dared to look over my shoulder, and I could see a dark blur of a large human maneuvering unnaturally through the backyards on my trail. I don't know how, but I outran him. I think it was my knowledge of the neighborhood, having lived there all my life and knowing which house had a fence, which ones led to more cover, which would lead to dead ends, etc. I burst into my house and blubbered the whole story out to anyone who could listen. To be blunt, no one really cared. It's not like I had evidence of this happening, and because there was room for possibility that I misinterpreted his stopping and getting out to maybe ask for directions or check on a tire, that's exactly what my family chose to believe. For a long time, I felt angry. Angry that these men came to my turf, my home, my neighborhood, and made me fearful. I couldn't think of a way to violate someone even if I wanted to, but men like these do it in their free time. I stopped working out after my second close encounter with abduction. I guess I look fine as a 23-year-old shut-in, but that's mainly thanks to my strict diet of vegan chocolate, antidepressants, and atheism. And that's my story. This summer, I decided to pick up some graveyard shifts at my current full-time job, simply because it pays more and I'm a university student drowning in student debt. About two weeks ago, on the rare occasion that I get to sleep during the time the sun is down, at 3.30 to 4 a.m., I was suddenly awoken by a loud sound. Me being half asleep, I honestly didn't know what the sound exactly was, so I just chalked it up to being one of my neighbors dropping something because I live in an apartment with very thin walls so I just try to go back to sleep. After about 10 minutes of laying there with my eyes closed, I hear the sound again. But this time I am pretty much awake, so I recognized what the sound was immediately. Someone was knocking on my window. For context, I am a single female living alone and in a basement suite, so my windows are basically level with the sidewalk. 
Obviously, I am freaked out. I don't know what to do. I don't want to move and make any loud noises so they don't know I am home. And I am just frozen, laying in this bed. Then I hear the knocking again. I instantly bold up as my fight or flight kicks in and run to the front door which has my keys with my pepper spray on it. The keys clink together and make a noticeable sound and the knocking starts to get more intense and loud. This is when I realize the window with the screen by my bed is almost all the way open because my cat likes to sit on the edge and I forgot to close and lock it. I start to freak out already having major anxiety. I start looking for my phone just in case I need to call the police. Me being clumsy and shaking from anxiety, I drop the phone on the ground, and whoever is at my window proceeds to what sounds like slid either their fingernails or a sharp object down the screen. I realize this person's intentions are either to come in or scare me. So like an idiot and not thinking, I run to the window as fast as I can slam it shut and lock it while avoiding looking outside at whoever it was. The knocking stops, and I wait about 30 minutes without hearing anything else. I lay back down, and eventually, fall back asleep. The next morning, I honestly couldn't believe that even happened. I start to think maybe it was a dream. So I go outside and investigate, and I see an empty beer bottle and a ripped blanket. I text my only friend who knew where I lived and asked them if they were messing with me. And they said no, which I figured because they don't drive and live quite far away, and the buses around my house stop running well before 3 a.m. So I called my landlord and told him what happened, and he says to ignore it and that this has happened before, which is creepy. Anyway, I obviously recognize now I should have done a lot of things differently and called the police right away. It hasn't happened since. Nonetheless, still super terrifying. It was a Thursday in August of 2002. I was 12 years old and had lived with my mom for the past six years since she and my dad got divorced. Soon after their divorce, my mom met a new man who moved in with us a few months later. Looking back, I can remember a few times where he had shown red flag behavior. Like one evening, maybe in 1999, when we, my sisters and I, were watching a TV show finale very late. He was drunk and came into the living room smashed the TV with his hands. Back then the TV screens were made of glass. He cut his hand badly and yelled at us while bleeding. My mom forgave him after he probably came up with a million excuses in the following days. In the beginning of 2002, my mom finally decided to have a break in their relationship and her and I moved into a different apartment a few miles away to get some distance. Me still being the naive kid who thought she could have two dads wasn't very excited about the idea. I already hated seeing my mom and dad split and now I had to let go of a man I had gotten used to over the course of all these years. I was still just a kid and ignored all the signs and I even remember resenting my mom for leaving him. As I said, my story starts on Thursday the 8th of August 2002. I was in school and not feeling very well. I also noticed some type of rash on my hips. So my teacher sent me to the doctor and the diagnosis was shingles. I can still see the doctor right in front of me, telling me that if the rash gets worse and goes all the way around my hip, it could potentially be very dangerous. So I went home for the day and was allowed to stay home the next day too, Friday the 9th. On Friday morning, my mom woke me up about 20 minutes before she went to work so she could check on me, have a little breakfast with me, and bring me back to my bed to make sure that I would rest. After she left, I remember lying in my bed and being relieved that the rash had gotten better overnight, when I suddenly heard a noise from the hallway. My room was not connected to the hallway, 
so I could only see the adjacent room. And since my mom had left a couple minutes prior, I assumed it was her and called out to her. Seconds later, my mom's ex-boyfriend appeared in my doorframe, asking me what I was doing home and why I wasn't in school. After I told him that I was sick and had shingles, he immediately said to me how much he missed us kids and my mom and how sorry he is for not being there and that he would love to talk to my mom and make things right. Since I was still unhappy about their breakup, I said stupid stuff like I missed him too and I wanted them to get back together. I cannot believe I seriously believed that at some point. After a few minutes of small talk and him pretending to care about my well-being, he made me promise not to tell my mom that he came by before he left. I obviously told her the minute she came home because I couldn't keep secrets from her and I also just wanted her to know. And again, me being a stupid 12 year old did not even question how he even entered the apartment without a key, without someone opening the door for him. I never in a million years would have thought that this might be illegal or inappropriate behavior. I knew that man and he had lived with us for a number of years. The same day, just a few hours later, my dad drove me to my grandma's, as I had planned weeks in advance to stay the weekend with her, and I already felt much better. My mom was supposed to pick me back up on Sunday, but on that morning, my mom hadn't answered her phone for about 12 hours, which was unusual. A friend of the family picked me up, drove me home, and still no news from my mom. Since there's a rule in my country that a person has to be missing for 24 hours before breaking the door to the apartment, and she became missing on Saturday evening, the police were only allowed to open the apartment on Sunday. My sisters, my dad and I all went inside. I grabbed all of my school supplies and went to the bathroom. After exiting the bathroom, I found my mom's dental prosthesis on a counter in the hallway. Not realizing it could be potential evidence, I picked it up and brought it into the kitchen where my dad was sitting with the police officer. My dad later told me that as soon as he saw the prosthesis, he knew something had happened. My mom had her teeth fixed just a few months prior and would not leave the house without that. After picking up our stuff from the apartment, my dad drove us back to his house, and we waited. Monday morning, and still no message from my mom. We didn't go to school that Monday, but planned on returning the next day. Tuesday morning, I woke up on my own, even though my dad had said he would wake us up and take us to school. I was about to go downstairs when I saw the village priest leaving our house. Police had found my mother the night before. On Monday evening, one of my mom's neighbors went upstairs to do laundry in the attic when he noticed one of the doors being locked. No resident from the apartment building had a key to this specific room, so they had to call the landlord to open the door. I tried not to think about what they discovered, since it was the middle of summer, and my mom had been dead for about 48 hours. My mom was murdered by her ex-boyfriend after he returned to the apartment on Saturday afternoon to talk. The last person my mom spoke to was my aunt. Shortly before they hung up, my mom said, There's someone knocking on the door. It's him again. I gotta go. I'll call you later. He gained access to the apartment the same way he did on Friday, with a credit card. He was arrested only a day later in a bar after telling the barman that he had done something really stupid. Yeah, I'll say. Eight months later, in April of the following year, my sister and I had to testify in the murder trial. But before we gave our testimony, our father argued with the court and made sure that we didn't have to face the killer. I remember sitting down in a large and very cold room, my father right by my side, holding my hand, lawyers to my right and to my left, as well as the judge in front of me. I remember being asked about the day he came into our apartment and answering all of the questions as truthfully as I could. They sentenced him to nine years in prison. Manslaughter, in effect, was the official cause. 
seven of those nine years he spent behind bars, and as far as I know, he moved back close to our hometown, close to where it all happened. Over the years, people have told me that I was lucky. He could have killed me, too, if my mom had still been at home that day. If she had left just a few minutes later, maybe she would have run into him downstairs, or if he had gained entry to the apartment while we were still eating breakfast. Lots of ifs and could haves. I know I won't be able to change the past, but I am sure glad I can control my future. I live in a small, small town. You blink and you miss it. The best way we can boast about it is a single stop sign and a gas station which we only have because of the nearby highway. Any actual semblance of a town is 25 minutes away. So when things get scary out here, it's amplified. The occasional homeless person is no big deal. They are often drifting through. Addicts running rampant and will steal everything they can from your house. But it's the normal out here. However, what happened a few years ago certainly wasn't normal. Originally, I was dead asleep in my bed. I only woke up because it was burning hot in my room. But it was summertime, and there wasn't much I could do. I just remember tossing and turning until I got a creepy feeling that fell into the pit of my stomach. I glanced over to the bathroom door that was open with the light on. Everything was normal. I left the light on so I wouldn't trip and die if I had to pee in the middle of the night. Next I glanced at the window directly across from my bed. I had no curtains, but I did have a crappy set of blinds. Part of the blinds were broken from wear and tear, and the crappy AC output beneath it would make them move back and forth, so you would get a glimpse outside every so often. The yard light was still going, but what made me stop was the outline at my window. The figure of someone was directly at my window, almost like it was waiting for the blinds to move to watch me. I didn't have an imagination as a child. That had been trained out of me. But the sight was enough to pour every horror film into my head at that moment. I squeezed my eyes shut and pulled my blankets over my head and slept in a cloth oven that night. By morning time, the figure was gone. I remember running to my mom's room on the verge of tears in the morning, telling her what happened. She laughed at me like I was an idiot, and told me it was probably just a stray cat that had climbed up there for one odd reason or another. I almost believed her, since my window was pretty high off the ground, but something didn't sit right. Later that day, when we were doing yard work, I glanced over at my window and saw one of our metal patio chairs had been pushed up to it. I pointed it out to my mom, who then proceeded to chew me out. That's how the cat probably got up there, moron. Stop leaving furniture everywhere. But I hadn't moved it. It was heavy enough that I struggled with it. So we moved it back, and so began a pattern. At night, I would see the figure complain to my mom, and we would find a chair moved back every single morning. This went on for a few weeks. My mother stopped caring about my concerns until one morning, we saw where the outside screen of my window had been sliced open. I still remember her shaking her head and complaining about those dang stray cats that we had still yet to see. I could tell she was unnerved by that development. I couldn't handle it anymore, and I opted to sleep in our living room that night. The only problem was our kitchen and living room connected, which meant there were always several windows. The first night of my move went well, despite my back hurting from the couch. I avoided my room like the plague. It wasn't until about four days later when we ran into an issue. I woke up and glanced at the clock above the fireplace. 
It read a little past 3 a.m. I couldn't realize why I had woken up until it happened again. There was a beam of light shining in from the kitchen window, almost like someone was shining a flashlight in. I saw it trace along the walls and land on the love seats across from the couch I was on. I was mortified. When I told my mom, she continued to laugh at me. I gave in and decided I would sleep in my dad's room, even though it had a gigantic window. He slept in the recliner with a huge TV, so I felt more safe having someone around. The yard light was directly outside the window anyways. It seemed foolproof. That was until I woke up out of habitual fear and watched through the window across from the bed. Everything seemed normal as time drug on, and I felt like a moron. Maybe my mom was right. That was until I saw a lone figure come out of the woods by the backyard shed, walk directly under the light, and head to the patio furniture like he had been here plenty of times before. I still remember the large build the man had, and the confidence like he was the one who lived here and wasn't creeping around my yard in the dead of the night. I just remember listening to the TV until I fell asleep again, hoping to get another glimpse. My dad would have been angry if I had woken him up. He was grumpy on a good day and terrifying on a bad day. I didn't feel like risking it until I had solid proof because I was scared. The next morning, my mom chewed me out again for the patio furniture, which was routine almost a month later. But this time, something new happened. She demanded I stop playing in the toolboxes in the garage. A bunch of tools had been taken out and left on our doorstep. Screwdrivers, a hammer, flashlights, etc. It wasn't me. I begged with my mom and pleaded with her, just stay up with me one night. We couldn't close our garage because it was an open carport, and I wasn't going to get beaten for touching tools because of someone else. It was driving me mad. Finally, she agreed. That night, we would stay awake in the living room. I finally fell asleep before my mom did, but I remember her waking me up in a panic. She pointed to the window that overlooked into our garage. We could see the top of someone's head as they walked back and forth. There was a sound of someone placing metal tools down on the brick steps, as if they were trying to be quiet, but couldn't fully muffle it. She whispered for me to go wake up my dad. My dad was angry, having been woken up in the middle of the night by his frantic daughter. He grabbed his weapon and headed out from the back door, towards the front of the house where the garage was located. We heard my dad screaming and someone dropping tools. Then a shot rang out twice. The frantic footsteps pounding out of the garage felt like they were coming from my chest. My mom peeked out of the window and then opened the door and my dad stumbled in. He had missed both times because of his unstable aim but told us that there was a man crouching at our front door, looking at our door handle. None of us slept that night and in the morning, the law from the closest town arrived. They didn't do much besides ask if anything had been stolen, for a description of the man, and then told us that we should install cameras. That was it. They said the guy was probably just looking for something easy to steal for quick money. If that had been the case, why hadn't he stolen the tools, the generator, the welder, or broken into any of the vehicles just sitting in the garage. We finally set up hunting trail cameras around the house, but nothing has happened since. Coming home from college for holidays, I still have nightmares about the incident years later when I sleep in my own bed. I don't know what he was looking for or why he did the things he did. This story happened when I was a kid, probably around 12 to 13. This story is based on something strange that happened to my younger sister, 
that lasted a few weeks. At the time, she was about nine or 10. Her bedroom was on the first floor of the house facing the driveway, while mine was the hole upstairs because we lived in a bungalow style house. One night, in the middle of the night, my sister wakes me up from a dead sleep to tell me that someone is outside of her window whispering to her. This was in the summer and we did not have central air at the time, so she kept her window open. I immediately asked if she told my dad, who at the time was a police officer. She told me that she was too scared to wake him up and if I would please come check it out. So reluctantly, I began to get out of bed and follow her downstairs to her room. As I went in, everything was normal. She pointed to the window and told me to go look and listen. As I looked outside, there was nothing but a quiet street and the humming of a street light near our yard. I told her she was probably dreaming and that she should go back to sleep. She was scared, but said okay. I went back to bed and nothing else happened that night. A few nights had passed and I had totally forgotten about it, when suddenly, I was awoken around 3 a.m. by my sister again. She told me the person was back. I said, who is back? She told me that it was the person from the other night whispering to her from outside the window. I asked her what they said to her, and she said they kept saying, Peace me free. At this point, I was confused. That's not even a correct sentence. What does that even mean? I asked her if they had said anything else, and she said no. Just peace me free, over and over in a child's voice. At this point, I was starting to get scared. I almost woke my dad up, but figured I would just tell him about it in the morning. Fast forward to the next morning. I told my dad about what had happened, and he told us that he was sure it was nothing, and that my sister must have been dreaming. At first, I agreed. I didn't see or hear anything. She was just a kid, and sometimes kids have very vivid dreams. We left it at that, even though I knew she believed it to be real. At this point, my sister was afraid to sleep in her room. My dad told her to just keep the window shut and she would be fine. Unfortunately, keeping the window closed was going to be tough. We were in the middle of a hot summer, and with the window closed, it was almost 80 degrees in her room. No one could sleep in that kind of heat, so she had no choice but to keep the window open. She said that she heard the voice again after this a few times, but was scared to tell anyone, even me for some reason. Now, what happens next will not only be the end of this bizarre saga, but will leave my sister and I scared to sleep at night for quite a while. A couple nights later, I was once again woken up by my sister, this time, she told me the voice was not only telling her to peace me free, but to save me, please. I had enough, so I went downstairs and looked out her window to see a shadow running towards the back of our house. A small shadow. A child-sized shadow. I couldn't make out any features, so I immediately ran to my parents' room, woke up my dad, and told him that my sister heard the kid again and that I saw someone running to the back of our house up the driveway. My dad instantly jumped out of bed and put on his robe, told us to stay inside. He grabbed his weapon he kept in a safe next to his bed. He then ran to the back of the house where a sliding glass door leads to the deck. Me being the wannabe tough guy, I followed him. As we went outside, my dad began to search the area as he would do as a police officer. I stayed just outside the doors on the deck while he went around the garage and shed. All of a sudden, I hear my dad yell, stop, loudly. Then, put your hands up where I can see them and don't move. My heart dropped into my stomach in pure fear. It was real. Someone was actually there. My dad then yelled for me to go inside and call the non-emergency number to the police department, which I knew by heart and to tell them that my dad had caught a prowler in our yard. I did as I was told, and the dispatcher said they were sending someone right away. I informed my dad that someone was coming. As I did, he began to march the person from behind our shed up to our deck. It was dark, and it looked just like the shadow of the person I had seen. I thought to myself, it must be a kid. Why would a kid be doing this? 
Why wouldn't they be at home in bed during the times this all happened? Well, it wasn't a kid. It was a short, old lady, probably in her 60s or 70s. My dad told me to go out front and wait for the police, then send them to the backyard. I stayed inside with my sister and my mom while everything was sorted out outside with the police. After a while, they took the lady away, and my dad came back inside and explained the entire situation. As it turns out, this older woman was the mother of a criminal my dad arrested some months prior. He had been charged with various child abuse charges. I won't get into the details, but it wasn't good. His mom believed him when he said he didn't do anything wrong. She told the police that her son was so mad that my dad was the one who arrested him and told her to go to our house and quote unquote, haunt us. Haunt us? Really? Well, she did a good job. Why she said, peace me free, then please save me, we'll never know. But that is just downright creepy. We never heard from her again. Back before the quarantine, I was on a mini road trip with a couple of friends and their girlfriends. I was single myself, so we filled up the five-seater, which was enough of an excuse as any to not pick up any hitchhikers or people in need of a ride. We had a horror encounter before with that exact thing and didn't feel like explaining that to someone whenever seeing them. Hopefully, any hitchhiker would see the full car and get the point. Not that we won't call for help if they ask us, of course. So we were driving down a desert road. My group consisted of myself, a male in his 20s, Tony and Jane, which are fake names, by the way, Bruce, Lila, and Lila's dog, a Lhasa Apso female named Doris, Lila and Tony were the ones with the driver's licenses, and Lila was driving at the time, around 8 p.m. It wasn't dark out yet, but you could make out the beginning of the sunset, as she said, Ooh, look, and began slowing down. Bruce and Lila had only been together for a month or two at that point, and he had yet to share the story about the hitchhiker last time with her, so she didn't know better than to pull over for a rough-looking, dirty man with a cardboard sign saying the name of a town an hour away. We began to protest too late as she had almost stopped entirely and rolled the window down an inch and kept the motor going. The hitchhiker walked up to the car and glared with the most intense crazy eyes, nothing like the charming psycho of last time. He stared and made a huge grin asking for a ride. Lila told him the car is full, but she can call him a ride if he needs one. She even put a hand down to her side about to hand him some money for fare. He didn't even listen to what she had to say as he walked a step to his side and stared into the car right next to my window. I am a walking stereotype, the most dude bro looking person you could find, but it didn't seem to do more than make him look me up and down a bit before tilting his head and staring at Tony and Jane. I can ride in the trunk, it's no problem. He said, and without being given permission, he walked around the car and grabbed the handle of the trunk. Doris woke up from all of this, and the black tones window of the back of the car had him unable to see her as he tugged the locked trunk. Doris set off this extremely loud, high-pitched, cutting bark. It's hard to describe how loud Lhasa Apsos can bark compared to dogs even three times their size. The sound splits and cuts your ears painfully. And as Lila is getting ready to drive off from this weirdo, he looked stunned as we drove away, waving his arms up in the air. Maybe he was on something? Maybe just sick in the head or maybe a combination of both. But we drove off and everyone began to take it more easy. But just five minutes later, we see a 24-7 gas station and pull over for gas and snacks. Lila traded places with Tony for driving and took her dog out of the trunk to walk it a little for a potty break. I think Jane went inside the gas station with Tony while I stood outside chatting up with Bruce. When Jane finished inside, she went around the corner for the bathroom as I went inside for some snacks for myself. I didn't take long and when I got out by pure coincidence, 
I looked down the road, and I see the hitchhiker again. He is not holding the sign, and he is walking in a fast pace. He's a blurry red dot down the road, but there's no mistaking the brown jacket and bright red pants. I quickly tell Tony and Bruce, as Tony goes to fetch Jane, to look around for Lila, who have walked the dog out to a field. I don't know why we all went into such a panic. Bruce begins shouting for Lila, who said, Doris hasn't gone number two yet, and got almost loud with her, telling her we had to leave, now. She looked at him a bit puzzled, began walking, and that's when Doris stops dead in her tracks to go to the bathroom. Tony came around the corner with Jane and began loading in the snacks as Bruce and myself stood there, waiting for Lila, watching the hitchhiker come closer. He's no more than 400 yards away, and he must have recognized us as he began shouting, Wait there, hold on, to us. Doris finally finished, and Lila speed walked over. She put Doris in the travel crate in the back and got in the car. The hitchhiker was just over 40 yards away from speed walking over to us when Tony drove out of the gas station. That is enough for one day, Jane said as she laid her head to Tony's side. He chuckled and nodded in agreement, asking if we would be okay with going to a motel a city earlier than planned. The gas station employee had recommended a nice place without cockroaches and shady staff two towns over, one town further than the goal of the hitchhiker. We all agree that that's a nice idea, and two hours later around 10.20 p.m., we drive into the nicest looking motel parking lot I've ever seen. It had a concrete fountain surrounded by steel pillars to protect it from cars set up in the center. The entire motel was U-shaped, with mint panels outside and dark brown roofs. You park along the inside or outside, and the reception would be at the bottom short end in the middle. An overweight bald man sat there smiling sweetly at me. I couldn't tell if he was just happy to have a customer, or maybe a bit into me, but I played into it, leaning in, giving him a smile as I booked us a double room. Basically, he had a wall taken down with the pillar supporting it and making two small rooms a bigger one. He gave me 20% off as well, and that's when I asked if he was okay with a dog staying with us. I waved Lila over and picked up Doris, saying she would be scared sleeping alone in the car. He awed at her and pointed down between his legs. We were all a bit taken until a similar dog to Doris jumped up in his lap. He laughed and said that it would be fine as long as we do a pet deposit of $50 and that we would get it back when he checks the room when we leave. We all got situated and made our beds, checked for creep cams, and turned on the TV for a rerun of Chuck. We all sat on the two beds on the same side, snacking away, talking of work and stuff as Jane recommended I give one of her friends a call. She had said that I was cute and showed me very pretty pictures of her. We had all pretty much forgotten about the hitchhiker at this point and went to bed around 2 a.m. At 3 a.m., I wake up to Doris's wet nose poking me in the ear. I had the bed by the window and she made a smile as I woke up. All the others were dead asleep and I thought maybe she needed a walk. My own dogs were at a sitter, and I was a good friend of Doris, and I really liked Doris, so I put her collar on and walked up and down the grass along the windows before going back inside. But the entire time, I felt like something was staring at us. Doris then makes an odd stance, and I see that the motel clerk's dog is walking around freely and looking very happily at Doris. However, I didn't have Lila's permit or information about letting her say hello to other dogs, so I just went back inside. Once inside, I heard scratching at the door, first very soft, then more intense. I walked up to the door and shushed the dog outside and back to bed. Then I heard it scratch and bark, not the loudest barks, but loud enough. I pull the curtains aside and I don't see a dog. There's nothing there, so I go back to bed, but as soon as I do, it starts up again. I look over, and the other four are fast asleep. As I sit up in bed and put a shirt on, about to go open the door, when Doris stops me indirectly by standing in front of me and blocking the door, she stood in the guarding stance and looked up at me. For those who don't know, Lhasas are a smaller breed with ever-growing long hair, if not cut short like Doris's. 
They are very strong and muscular for their size, however. I looked at her, and it was like if she could speak with words looking at me, as if she said, Don't open the door. She wasn't barking either, which was kind of odd. The scratching picked back up, and I went to the window faster this time, swiping the curtain off. And just as I do, something moved out of sight. Now I know it's not a dog. It's a person. A person wearing bright red pants. I immediately remember the hitchhiker and wonder how he knew where we were going. I guess the gas station employee must have told him or something about the suggestions he gave us. I considered waking up the others or something, but settled on grabbing the motel phone. Even though the double room had all beds on one side and the couch and dining set up on the other side, both phones were still in. So I sat myself down on the couch and called the reception. Nobody picked up, but then again, it's about 4 a.m. and I wasn't expecting it either. So I Google the motel and look for the owner's name to see if I can call him directly. I found his number and he picked up confused and a bit annoyed until I told him who called. I explained the situation from start to finish and he told me that a homeless person had tried to get a free room for the night. He had obviously declined him and told him to leave, but the guy kept shifting his eyes around the cars like a paranoid sicko until he finally left the area. He had then double checked all rooms were locked and went to the back office. He told me he was going to get his big dog and scare him off with a weapon if he had to and just asked me to keep an eye out. I walked up to the window where the door for the further room had been before and opened the curtain a bit to see him stand there waiting outside the door he knew of. He didn't realize the double room feature and thought that he was sneaking like a pro on us. Lila and Bruce woke up at that point and asked what was going on, but as I hushed them, I told them not to move and stay in bed and they kind of laid down. Bruce began texting me asking what's up as I informed him. A little while later, I'm on the phone with the owner again, telling him I can see the guy. He hung up and said that he was going to get his dog as I waited. He started barking again, but this time I could see his silhouette moving with the sounds as he scruffed out barks before I heard the pleasing sound of the owner screaming, leave before I put you down. The owner was walking from the reception area looking angry with a smaller dog on his side walking freely and what looked like a 160 pound American Akita or something. The dog was massive and looked angry and if the overweight owner wasn't anchoring it to slow down, I think it would have bolted off and ripped the hitchhiker apart or something. The hitchhiker ran off scared and the owner returned to the reception area, dropping the big dog off before coming down to talk to me, Bruce and Lila. Doris greeted the other small dog for a moment and we discussed again how we met him and declined him a ride. The owner let out a, well, at least no one's hurt, and smiled a smile that went away slowly as he looked down at the door, squinting a bit as he let out a, what the heck, and pointed. It turned out the scratching at the door had been scratching with a knife or some other sharp object. The door's lower hinge was stabbed and scratched. Some wood chips lay on the ground, and it makes me wonder what could have happened if I had opened the door while he was pretending to be a dog? We let Jane and Tony sleep while going out to the reception area and having some cold sodas and beers with the owner to keep watch in case the hitchhiker came back. He told us some stories about weird motel guests, deaths and strange things happening in the motel. The rest of the early morning was lovely and we caught up Tony and Jane around 9 a.m. They didn't understand how they slept through the whole deal and Jane got seriously creeped out compared to Tony who brushed it off as not as bad as last time. We got in the car around 10 a.m. and I said goodbye to the owner after adding him on Facebook and being made clear that we were very welcome back anytime. We all gave him a five-star review. As we got in the car and drove around the corner to continue on, I looked into the tumbleweeds on the roadside and saw the red pants, brown jacket, and a pair of shoes dumped on the ground before them. I didn't see or hear him, but I could not shake the feeling that he was watching somewhere. We got on the road and drove over five hours before stopping again, and by then, we all stopped worrying. The rest of the trip was uneventful, and on the way back, 
we saw that just one shoe and parts of the jacket remained. We stayed at the motel again, and nothing happened, but the motel owner informed us it's not entirely unheard of for people to be going out in the desert and not coming back. Whether he went out and died, stole new clothes, or just hitchhiked somewhere naked, I still to this day am just so very happy that I did not open the door when I thought that it was a dog. In 2014, I moved to England from Canada to gain work and travel experience, and also to quote-unquote find myself. I ended up living in Essex with three other roommates. They were all women, all a bit older than I was. I was 24 at the time, Megan was 31, Cherry was 34, and Cassie was 38. Megan was from New York, Cherry from New Jersey, and Cassie from Poland. All four of us shared this three-story flat. The back of our home was the living room and kitchen. The back wall was complete glass that looked out into the garden. The garden was completely fenced in. The house had an interesting dynamic, to say the least. Tons of stories from that time in my life. I adored all my roommates, except for Cherry. After living with Cherry for seven months, I was over her antics. One day I come home from work, I lock the door, make myself something to eat, and go up to bed. I brought some work home with me, so I'm in my nightie with all these papers around me and my headphones in and jamming out. I had headphones on because Cherry was out to dinner with work friends. That meant booze, and then soon after that, a tantrum was surely to come. I just didn't want to have to listen to her crazy scream crying. I am working away, completely focused, until I feel something. I look up to see a man standing over me. I don't register it right away and passively say, Cherry's room is on the second floor, and continue to work. He doesn't leave. Again, Cherry's room is downstairs, you... He then interrupts me. I'm not here for Cherry. A cold chill iced my veins. My fight or flight kicked in just then. I start surveying the situation. I look him up and down. He has a bottle of Prosecco in one hand and a knife in the other. He is about 5'10", wild muddy brown hair and black eyes. He has a light blue polo shirt on, and one side of his collar is popped up, and a distinct Manchester accent. Once I focused in, I realized his eyes were black because his pupils were completely dilated. Crap. I was in trouble. I needed an escape plan. Unfortunately, this man was standing in between me and my bedroom door. I needed to get downstairs, but I needed for him to think it was his idea. I decided to play along. Just then, he uses his knife to pop the cork. Prosecco started flowing onto my carpet. I said, Oh no, let's clean that up. I prefer to drink out of a proper flute anyways. He nodded, replying, Yeah, you're a proper classy bird. Let's go. I try to act as natural as possible. I try not to show that I am shaking all over and try to gain control over my breathing. We take the long journey down to the main floor of my flat, all three floors. He has the back of my nightie bunched up in one hand and I could feel the point of the knife graze my back with his other. I was trying to playfully speak with him as we walked down the stairs. I couldn't tell you what I was saying. I was most likely rambling. I couldn't hear anything over my heart beating in my ears. We get to the bottom of the stairs, and there is a hallway to my left that leads to the front door. On my right, which is much closer to us, is the kitchen and living room. We make our way into the kitchen. I point to the cabinets that had the wine glasses. 
He said he knew where they were and started towards them. I now had the kitchen table in between us. It was time to run. I burst into a sprint down the hallway towards the door. My hands fumble over the locks, shaking and sweating. I swing open the door and see two men walking across the street. They must have been walking home from the train. There was a big train station in front of our house. I call out to them for help and suddenly I am flung onto the ground. Little pebbles piercing my skin sent sharp pains where they jabbed. The intruder pushed me out of the way to run and escape. One of the men chased after the intruder while the other said for me to go inside while he surveyed my home and to call the police. I locked the doors and I called the police. While I am on the phone with dispatch, I manically run around the house to double check all the windows and doors. Suddenly, I hear a loud bang on my door. I inform the dispatch of the banging and she informs me that police weren't there yet. I thought it might be one of the gentlemen who helped me. I go to look out the eye hole and it's him, the intruder. He came back. He's banging on my door screaming that I had his glasses and that he was not done with me. I absolutely freaked out. The dispatcher attempted to calm me down, but I am losing my mind. She then said, They are pulling onto your street now. You should hear their sirens. I did, thankfully. The intruder then blasts off. One officer jumps out of the passenger side while the car is still moving and chases after him. The second officer comes to my home, interviews me and the two gentlemen, collects some evidence, and takes photos. After some time of him being there, Cherry comes home and freaks out. Once the situation was explained to her, she said, Oh my gosh, that could have been me. Yeah, thanks Cherry. It's all about you. The next morning I am called in to identify a man they had in custody. I pointed him out. I go into a little room and the officer pulls out an evidence bag. He asked me if the items were mine. They were. They were my underwear and photos taken from my home. The officer informed me that the intruder had been stalking me for some time now. He estimates about three months. He had made a nest outside our home on top of a hill that overlooked into our living room and kitchen. He is a known offender and dealer. He then told me how lucky I was to get out practically unharmed. Others weren't so lucky. I really hope I never see that man again. However, I would love to run into those two gentlemen again. Every day, I am thankful for them. My name is Honey, I am almost 30, and I use Instagram to share pictures of my art. Alright, I know what you're thinking. Honey is a weird name, so please don't tell me what I already know. No, it's not a nickname. My parents are from California, and they are like uber hippies, so go figure. As you can probably guess, I grew up in this really overly loving, peacenik environment, which I'm sure sounds cool at first. But let's just say it left me wholly unprepared to deal with some of the darker things in life. Needless to say, I really struggled with my mental health in mid to late 20s. I don't want to totally blame my parents for that. I think they did the best they could, but they seriously didn't help with their just fill your heart with love bullcrap when what I needed was actual therapy and antidepressants. I did get access to professional help in the end, but what really helped me keep it together in the meantime was my art. Before I started to suffer with depression and stuff, I used to paint and draw some pretty basic stuff. Landscapes, portraits, floral displays, stuff like that. But when I started to really suffer, I let out all my stress, anxiety, and sadness onto paper and as weird as it sounds, that's when my art really started to flourish. 
It was probably the only silver lining to ever come out of my poor mental health. The more I posted my newer, darker art on Instagram, the more attention it got. My follower count shot up. I got offers of commissions. I actually managed to hook up with a t-shirt merch company and make a few sales that way too. Like I drew this pizza demon thing one time, and that's made me a few hundred bucks from people wanting that thing on a t-shirt too. But when I saw dark, I really do mean I started drawing some really messed up stuff. The pizza demon thing was probably the lightest hearted thing I put out there in that time. And even then, people said it was super messed up. So as you might imagine, my new followers included some pretty messed up people too. I don't say that to be rude or mean either. I say that because one of them in particular made my life pretty difficult. So I get a DM off this guy who says he's really loved my work and wanted a piece commissioned. Of course I say yes, so he follows up by asking what my rates are. I had no idea what I was doing in terms of dollar amounts at the time, so when I quoted him like 80 bucks for a picture, he started explaining that I needed to value my art more, how my work was just as valuable as any other, and how I should be charging a whole bunch more for my art. I had no idea what to up my amount to, so I kind of threw out a few ballpark figures before the guy makes my jaw hit the floor when he offers me a straight grand for an A3 sized picture of whatever I wanted to draw or paint. I couldn't believe it. A thousand dollars for a picture, which was way more money than I had ever made in my whole life. I got to work straight away, and within a week, I had poured my heart and soul out onto paper, sent it off, and got my money via PayPal. Having that kind of affirmation actually lifted my mood to the highest it had been in months. I felt valued, like I could contribute something to the world. I was still dealing with my demons, but when I learned I could actually profit from them, that I could make use of something that plagued me, it was a great feeling. I stayed in touch with the guy. I had never been so grateful to anyone in my life until that point, and I'd be lying if I said I didn't think I'd be able to get more money out of him if he wanted something else commissioned. We used to talk back and forth a fair bit, and he shared that he too was an artist. I asked him what kind of artist he was, and he told me that he worked in some very unusual mediums. Naturally, this only got me all the more curious, as I got super dark with my art too, but he seemed pretty timid to talk about it. I get that people can be shy about showing off their artwork. I was pretty shy too at one point, but this guy needed some serious coaxing in order to show me anything. When he finally agreed to show me anything, he told me he would only do it via one of those self-destructing messages that Insta now does. I didn't question anything, like I knew he had sent one of those self-destructing pictures, maybe so he could pretend his intellectual property or something. I was a little confused as to why he didn't seem to trust me, but hey, I pretty much adored this guy, so like I said, I didn't ask too many questions. I waited patiently for him to send me a picture of some of his work. It took a minute or two, but he sends me this three second self-destructing picture that I was honestly super excited to see by that point. But when I actually saw what it was, even if it was for a real brief time, I really, really wished I hadn't. It looked like a goat's head in a jar of some kind. Like I said, there wasn't enough time for me to drink the whole thing in. I had questions. A lot of questions. But the first thing I had to ask him was if it was really real or just some kind of mock-up. He told me it was very, very real. That he had gotten a hold of a goat's head from a butcher, preserved it, and then basically surgically edited the whole thing over time. Mostly using dental tools apparently for the sake of precision. I personally thought the whole thing was a disgrace. I'm vegan, and I try to stay as ethical as possible, but at the same time, 
I didn't want to go imposing my own world view on the guy, especially since I liked him so much. I also didn't want to offend him, so I told him his work was interesting and jaw-dropping, then asked if he worked with ink and paper or any variation on that. He told me no, that he only worked with skulls, how they were the capsule that held all the hopes and dreams and fears and needs of the once living creature they belonged to, and that working with them was kind of sacred. I didn't really know what to say to that. He was right in a way. He sounded absolutely crazy for saying it out loud, but I couldn't entirely refute his point. It was like talking to some kind of insane genius. Not long after, he asked me if I thought he was cruel to work in such a medium. I told him people might find his work provocative, maybe even objectionable, but that it was fascinating nevertheless. Then he asked if I wanted to see more. Unlike the first time, there was no doubt in me that I most definitely did not want to see any more of this guy's work. But like I said before, I also really didn't want to offend him. So what could I do? It took me much longer to reply to his message that time, but in the end I told him, Sure. And he replied saying he would use another self-destructing message. Again, I waited a minute or two for the message to come through, and when it did, I opened up the message thread and tapped the little reveal message thing with some reluctance. The first time around, for that goat's head thing, I at least had some degree of curiosity, but that time, I was just plain horrified by what I saw. It was a monkey's head, or at least, it looked like it was some kind of primate. I was a little more confrontational with him after that, telling him that this one was considerably more disturbing than the first, and that I thought I was maybe too sensitive to see any more of his work. He asks why, and I broke it down to him that I had been vegan for a few years, that I was a real animal lover, and although I could stomach the goat's head thing, I really couldn't handle the monkey, as it looked far too human to me. That's when he replied to me, It's interesting you should say that, and goes on to explain that it's his dream to work with the human skull. How he has put up a few ads on 4chan and stuff, asking if anyone would be willing to donate their head should they die, but hadn't gotten any replies. When he told me he was getting really impatient, and that he was worried he wouldn't get a chance to realize his dream. The whole exchange had reached peak creepiness by that point, as you can imagine, and it was fast getting to the point when I was reaching for that block option, as I just didn't feel safe talking to him anymore. So by the time he actually messaged me another self-destructing message asking if I would be willing to help him get a hold of a human head, I just noped out of there and stopped replying to him. Like I am not sure he was actually asking me to like, kill someone with him, or for him, but just the idea of going about procuring an actual human head? No. But I couldn't bring myself to block him, like he was a potential source of sales after all, and I could make a lot of money from the guy if I kept him interested in my work. I try not to think about it, but I get these really bad feelings from time to time. Like what if he catches on to the fact that I just ignore him? And what if he decides that it's my head that he would like to use to complete his magnum opus? I try to be very careful with what I post now, making sure it's only ever pictures of my art, and that the handful of landscape photos I had posted on my profile have been deleted, just so whoever it is can't get an idea of where I live. Because if they do work out where I'm at, there's just no way I'd be able to go around feeling safe, not which someone whose ambition it is to work with severed human heads, knowing where I lay mine at night.
I just want to start off and say that before this incident, I have always been a skeptic of the paranormal. Growing up, my mom and dad would tell me stories that they encountered with the paranormal in their early years, so I always had an open mind to the possibility, but since I personally haven't encountered anything, I have always thought, if I didn't see it, then there might have been a logical explanation to their experience, so who knows if it's actually true. Moving on to the incident that made me a believer. This all happened back in the early fall of 2011. Me, my son, and his mother lived in a two-bedroom second-floor apartment on the east side of Cincinnati, Ohio. My son at the time was a little over two years old and was starting to say words and communicate in ways typical kids his age would say or do with body language and gestures. I say that because this ties in with the story later on. On this particular afternoon, his mother was over at her mother's house for the past two days and was staying one more night there to help her cope with the loss of a relative that recently passed. So me and my son, who I will call Kevin to protect his identity, had the place to ourselves for the night. Around 5 p.m. that early evening, I invited my longtime buddy, who I'll call Tony, who I've known since fifth grade and also lived downstairs in the same apartment building, over to my place to watch a baseball game. I also called my dad over to my place to partake in the makeshift guys' night I set up. During the game, everything is going well. We ordered pizza and soda, and we were having a good time. During all of that, for reasons I can't remember, my dad started retelling me and my buddy his paranormal experiences that he told to us as kids. Even in our mid-twenties, we still felt like nine-year-old boys hearing those ghost stories for the first time. Regardless of my skepticism, my dad is an amazing storyteller, so hearing them again is never a drag. With that said, it's approaching 10 p.m. at this point, and the baseball game was over, so my dad headed out to make it back home at a decent hour. Tony stuck around a few more minutes to smoke a cigarette with me on my balcony, and then head back down to his place. So before bed, I decided to clean up some of the pizza boxes and soda cans laying around the living room while my son was rolling his toy cars on the laminate floor in the kitchen. To give you a quick layout of the apartment to get a better visual as this story continues to the creepy stuff, as soon as you walk in the door of my second floor apartment, the opening to the kitchen is right in front of you. To the right is the small closet and to the left is the living and dining room. If you were to be standing in between the living room and dining room, straight ahead, opposite the wall where the front door is, there's the opening to the hallway going left and right to each bedroom, and straight ahead is the bathroom. So let's get to where things get spooky. Remember me saying my son was just starting to communicate with words and gestures? I am in the living room still cleaning, and in the midst of my son joyfully playing with his toy cars, I hear him abruptly stop it Johnny and then immediately began to cry I froze we didn't know a Johnny so how does he know this name I think to myself I then head into the kitchen to see my son on the floor holding his hand in tears I get down to examine it but see no injuries no red marks no blood etc I quickly calm him down and ask him what happened it was at this point he turns his body and points at the kitchen wall and says in mumbled crying two-year-old broken English, Johnny in the hole in the wall. Every hair on my body stood up, met with a shiver down my spine. To give you an idea of how terrifying it was seeing my young child point towards a wall and say a random man's name, kids at that age don't fully grasp the concept of lying or playing a prank. If he is pointing at something and calling it by name, that means he had learned it and is doing his best to communicate with me about what he'd experienced. It was in that moment I knew I had to get out of there. So I picked him up and grabbed my keys, wallet, phone, and phone charger, and was heading to my dad's for the night. He lived 10 minutes up the road, but then it hit me. I would need the mattress from his car bed, See, behind that wall my son pointed at was his bedroom. I stared at the door handle for a moment, debating whether or not to just leave, but knew if I was going to, that I at least need his mattress. With a swift jog into the bedroom, I pulled that bed up with one hand and got out of there ASAP. 
I leave, calling my dad and waking him up, telling him that I was heading there for the night and that I would explain it all to him when I got there. He said he would leave his door open and to just come on in when I get there. Now this story isn't over yet. It gets even weirder. As I was driving to my dad's, I decided to call my buddy Tony to tell him what happened. Immediately upon him learning that I bolted out of the apartment in the manner that I did, he laughed. I can't blame him. I'd probably laugh at me too if I heard he ran out with a toddler in one hand and mattress in the other at 10.30 at night. But I wasn't him. My son saw an entity in our apartment, and I was seriously considering never going back. However, in the middle of his laughter, he remembered something. He stops and says, Hey, wasn't Johnny the name of Fran's husbands that used to live there? Let's rewind to a few months back. I was just moving into the apartment, unloading things from my pickup truck, and I noticed a sweet little old lady walking her dogs out in the courtyard in front of the apartment complex. As I was walking by her, I introduced myself and told her I was moving into the building. She introduced herself as Frances, but went by Fran by people who knew her. We exchanged pleasantries as I walked into the building. She followed because her two little pups finished their business, and we all started walking upstairs to the second floor to our apartments. My apartment was on the corner of the building, so I went left when I got up there, and Fran went straight to her apartment. But as I was walking to mine, her little dogs followed me. I said, Wow, I must have made a great first impression. But Fran replied, No, honey, I actually used to live in that apartment with my husband for 15 years. But when he died six months ago, I couldn't live there anymore and had to move. I sat there not knowing what to really say besides... Oh, I'm so sorry for your loss. Fran replies with a slight frown on her face. It's not your fault. When it's our time, it's our time. And then immediately follows up with. And just to let you know, he didn't die in that apartment. It was at the hospital. I immediately reply with. I wasn't thinking that, but thanks for at least letting me know. But in the back of my head, I was wondering that and glad she informed me. Fast forward back to the night of the incident. My buddy Tony tells me I probably need to talk to Fran about what happened and to maybe see if she had a picture of him and to see if my son could point him out, just to see if that's what really happened. I tell him I'm not sure how I feel about bringing this up to her, not trying to stir her emotions not even a year after her husband's death. We hang up and I arrived at my dad's. I go in and explain everything to him. He understands and then during the night convinces me that I need to talk to Fran as soon as I could to make sure that Kevin saw her husband in the apartment instead of something possibly sinister. So the next day, I decided to do it. I decided to bring this up to Fran and not to just clear up if my son saw the ghost of her deceased husband in my apartment, but if it were him, maybe Fran could get some comfort in knowing that her husband was still there for her. I pull up, and who do I see outside walking her dogs? You guessed it, Fran. I approach her, saying if she has a few minutes, I would like to talk to her in private about something important. Confused, she politely invites me up to her place to talk. We go in and sit down on our couch. I start off with informing her that I wasn't there to tell her any BS considering how the last year has gone for her. She looks at me still confused, so I tell her that I'll just get right to it. I tell her that I think my son saw her husband in my apartment and told her to just give me a few minutes to explain why I thought that. I told her the story and how I thought if this wasn't her husband that I would like to at least make sure that it was nothing sinister before I bring my kid back in there. She understood, but seemed skeptical. I can't blame her. I would be too, hearing all of that. I then asked Fran if she had a picture of Johnny, perhaps one with him with multiple other men in it, so that if my son points him out, that it would prove even more that he did see him. She obliged and brought out an old photo album from her bedroom. 
She opens it and flicks a few pages over and then shows us a photo of three men. In the photo, it looks like three guys at a cookout enjoying each other's company around the grill. I then ask Kevin if he remembers Johnny that he saw last night. He looked at me and nodded his head, yes. I look over at the photo and ask my son to point Johnny out to us. He walks right up to it in heavens to Betsy. He, without hesitation, points right at Johnny. Fran immediately broke into tears and I was right behind her. I reached over and hugged her as we both cried. She said in a sobbing voice that almost a whole year has passed and that she was feeling alone. Her husband for 27 years died and she had really nobody and to know that he was still here looking after her took away some of that loneliness. After wiping away the tears, I told her that anytime she wanted to come in there and talk to him alone, to just let me know. She said that she would, and I told her that I was going to hold her to that. She then told me what probably happened was when my son was playing in the kitchen, that he might have reached into the drawer where we kept certain steak knives, and that Johnny possibly closed the drawer on his fingers and was making sure he didn't get a hold of those knives. Whatever the reason, I know that nothing odd ever happened to us in that apartment before that night. I think when my dad was over telling those paranormal stories, perhaps Johnny felt that this was the best time for him to communicate. I was telling Fran that it's time for me to leave, and asked if she wanted to come with me to maybe talk to him. She politely declined and said that she needed to let all of this soak in before she tried to do anything like that. I understood and told her to never hesitate to ask me to talk to him when she was ready. She said she would, and I hugged her and left. Me and my son headed back over to the apartment. I walk in, realizing I left the door unlocked all night, due to me running out of there the previous night. I set my keys down and began to talk out loud, saying, Hey Johnny, it's me, the guy that ran out of here last night because he's too scared of ghosts. I just want to let you know that Fran is three doors that way and that she would love to have you go over there and keep her company instead of me, who scares too easy. Anyway, thanks for protecting my kid from the knives. Please don't try to communicate with me though. I obviously showed signs last night that I cannot handle it. Anyway, thanks. And again, Fran is three doors that way, buddy. After that, I never felt creeped out in that apartment. Nothing ever happened, and my kid never saw Johnny there again. Fran never came to me to talk to Johnny, and when we would talk after that, the topic never came up. Seven months later, we moved out. I walked up to Fran's door and hugged her goodbye. I handed her the keys and said if he wanted to go over there, that it's all hers to do so, until they rent the place to a new tenant. She took the keys and hugged me with a tear in her eyes. We said goodbye, and that was it. I don't know if she ever went back in that apartment to talk to him or not. However, I do know my son seeing him that night and pointing him out in a picture to her must have made her feel not alone, that her husband was still here with her, and that to this day always brings a smile to my face whenever I think about the incident that made me a believer in the paranormal. This story may not be scary to some, but it remains as one of the most unnerving things I have ever experienced. In the summer of 2017, I was working at a satellite campus of my university as a residential assistant. Allow me to give a description of this campus before continuing the story. It was once an estate and, for a college campus, relatively small. To put things into perspective, I was one of only 22 students on the entire campus in the spring semester, and one of 60 in the fall. I am not sure what the population was during the summer, but you get the idea. Not only was it small, but it was very old. The former estate was built in 1712, over 300 years before this story takes place. To save on budget when acquiring the property, 
My university did not demolish any of the older buildings. They just stood there, empty and condemned. One of these buildings was a big mansion at the center of the campus, which served as the administration building for the university that owned the property prior to my own. The most prominent feature of the campus is the old windmill, a historic landmark, and a playhouse for the daughter of the family who owned the estate. The story behind the windmill goes that the daughter used to run to the top floor, waving to the seafarers as they sailed on by. One night, while coming down from the top floor of the windmill, she fell down the steep stairs, broke her neck, and died. Rumor has it that her ghost wanders through the windmill, and while the structure remains locked throughout the year, some say they can sometimes see a lit candle coming from the top floor window. I wish I could say this is where my story takes place, but unfortunately, it doesn't. With all of this being said, this campus is no stranger to the paranormal. As this campus is very small, there are only six residential buildings for the students to live in. These buildings are all named after historic nearby towns, and one of which, Sagapanak, is said to be haunted. The dorms are arranged in two rows, three in the front and three in the back. Each dorm is only two stories with two suites on each floor. When you walk in, there are doors to the left and the right leading to each suite, and a staircase leading to the second floor where the two other suites are. As an RA, one of my duties was to make rounds. This involved us going to each suite to make sure that the main doors were locked and that the residents didn't need anything. One night, it was time for us to perform our nightly rounds before closing the RA office for the night. The other RA and I decided to do them together, since it was a rather tedious activity. To expedite the process, I would check the first floor doors while the other RA would go upstairs to check the second floor doors. As we are in Sagapanak, I am standing around waiting for the other RA to come back downstairs. When I notice a couple of pairs of shoes at the bottom of the staircase, a pair of brown work boots, and black sneakers. Nothing too far out of the ordinary, right? We make our way to the next building, and seconds into stepping into it, the other RA and I stop dead in our tracks. At the bottom of the staircase is a pair of brown work boots and black sneakers. I quickly stepped outside to check what building we were in, and to my disbelief, I found myself staring at the sign for Sagapanak. Dumbfounded and creeped out, we decided to end our rounds there and close up shop for the night. To this day, I am still not sure if what had happened to us was due to paranormal activity, a glitch in the matrix, or an unusually silly mistake that neither I nor my partner noticed. How did we end up back in Sagapanak? If this does have a supernatural explanation, who or what wanted us back inside? I will never truly know. To understand my story, you sort of have to know a tiny bit about trespassing laws in our country, in that we don't have any, so long as you're respectful and non-destructive. You can walk over any hills you like, and in my case, camp on any beach of your choosing, so long as once you leave the area is how you found it. I used to love camping when I was little. Our family would go multiple times a year with a large group of my parents' friends and their kids. On average, there were maybe 10 of us at a time, which was a bit of a logistical challenge since we always headed out to this one really remote beach on the coast. Actually, we weren't the only ones. There's always yachts bobbing just off the shore with people in them and other campers lining up and down the beach. Most of them also had children or teenagers so it wasn't a wild party scene. It was very much an informal family holiday spot. There was even a small building with toilets and showers installed nearby, even though this was in the middle of nowhere. 
I guess the local council must have figured it out and got sick of people peeing behind bushes. We took a trip up in spring 2011. I am really bad with time, but I know this because I got my dog in winter 2010, after picking her out that November from the shelter as a birthday gift from me to me, as I paid her adoption fee. Let me tell you a little bit about my Parmesan. Parmesan came to me as a six-month-old puppy who had been rescued from a dogfighting situation. We are not entirely sure what breed she is exactly, but my best guess is a lurcher, staffy mix. She is a wonderfully well-tempered dog with people, and most dogs, but you absolutely do not threaten her. She'll have you. So by the time of this camping trip, I had had Parmesan for a few months. She had never come camping with us before, but as far as my family are concerned, dogs go on camping trips. So when we all piled into the car, she came too. Unusually though, none of the family friends could make it, so it was only me, my sister, my dad, and my mom. I wasn't that attached to the other kids. I would rather play with my dog, and I'd still have my sister. The drive took about six hours, and because we had left a bit later, although I don't remember why we had left later than normal, we arrived at sunset. Not a good time to be building a tent, but we had expected to arrive to other campers already set up and the beach illuminated by campfires. The beach was empty. In spite of this, my parents started taking stuff out and trying to build the tent. They asked us to fetch some of the lighter bags from the boot of the car while they sat pointing a flashlight at the sand to see properly. I rolled down the window of the car for Parmesan before getting out. It was pretty hot for that time of year, and I wanted her to have some fresh air. Always gotta be looking out for my furry little homie. As we're fumbling about in the dark, on a beach, in the middle of nowhere, it's pretty spooky. The only road that led to this beach was circular and had a bridge over the water, meaning you could basically circle around the beach like a big O shape if you felt like it. I wasn't really paying any attention to the road. I was complaining that I was tired, as kids are. After maybe 15 minutes of my dad trying to nail the tent into the sand, my mom is asking him, had he seen that car drive around? It's been a few times now. My dad kind of shrugged her off. He's sort of like that. I don't know if he said anything back to her, but after a few more minutes, a car pulled up next to ours on the road and someone got out. It was maybe 15 or 20 feet from the cars to where we were, and the light was pretty low, except for the torches. We weren't expecting to see anyone else out here at this point, and I think my mom said it must be the security. I don't know why a random beach would have security. I think what she meant was the wildlife trust or something, as they do occasionally come down to do their nosy checkups. The guy was walking pretty unevenly, he must have been intoxicated because he had that stagger to him. There was absolutely no way this guy was sober. Cool, a junkie. Not an unusual find, but it's rare to see them in the wild. As he walked into flashlight range, we realized he was carrying a large knife, maybe 15 inches. Although I was small at the time, so maybe my sense of scale was off. I don't like my dad, but credit to him, once he saw this, he got up immediately, holding on to the camping mallet and put us all behind him. The man began to shout wildly at us that we cannot camp here, and he was just letting us know. My dad tried to initially be a bit low-key with the guy, and told him that was fine, we would leave. But this didn't work. He kept coming closer to us, so my dad started shouting, and the man shouted back. My sister and I were crying. I remember shaking. I was utterly terrified as I'm sure anyone would be in that situation. It really did seem like this guy and my dad were going to fight. And I'm going to be honest, I didn't fancy my dad's chances. While it's grim to consider, I am absolutely convinced this man would have killed my dad and possibly us as well once he was done.
as I don't think my mother would have had the common sense to run with us. I love her, but she has always put my dad and her relationship with him above us. This isn't how it went down. A bolt from the black, like a wolf descending on its prey, took us all by surprise. Most of all, the man with the knife. In that moment, Parmesan was the apex predator large canines represent in nature. She got him good by the arm and clamped down hard, ripping his jacket and shredding the skin underneath. He dropped the knife as it was in the arm she bit. He kicked her, he punched her, and eventually got her off. He grabbed the knife from the sand and ran back to his car and drove off. Parmesan did not follow. She stayed with us, her mouth covered in blood. As quickly as we could, we all gathered our things and all got back in the car, all pretty shook up by the incident. I looked Parmesan over. She was okay, but the car's window was much more open than I had left it. We think what happened was when the shouting started, she must have put her paws up on the gap I had left for her. As it was an old car and had those rolly down windows and not electric, we think she must have been able to hit it with her paws to force it down enough to squeeze out. This is not the end of my story. We were all pretty scared and since we had the dog with us, we couldn't book a hotel for the night. My parents decided to just drive home so we could all feel safe. But first, we had to drive into the nearest town for gas as we were kind of low. I spent that time trying to clean up Parmesan. I had always loved dogs, but what she had just done blew my mind. As we drove into town, we came across a gas station, but it looked closed. My dad drove up closer to get a better look and stuck his head out the window to get a better look at the sign. My mom asked him what on earth he was doing and he told her he was trying to see when it opens. My heart sank. Parked in the corner, behind a van so we hadn't seen him at first, was the man with the knife. He was sitting on the back of his car using some tissue paper to clean up his arm. It looked pretty bad. Without stopping to refuel or look anywhere else in town, my dad drove us right out of there. He decided to go to the next town over, but the next town over was 60 miles away. He didn't have that much gas, we realized as we began driving. We were going to run out. That's fine, Dad said. We had AAA. They would come tow us home, or at least get us somewhere acceptable for the night. Better than staying in the last town. After driving for maybe five minutes, lights flash us from behind. Another car. The same car the man had been driving. It was him, following us. The next half hour was one of the worst half hours of my life. I had a complete and utter breakdown, as did everyone really. I could tell my parents were trying to keep it under wraps so it wouldn't upset us, but we were not that little. We were both double digits. We knew how dangerous this situation was. My dad turned off the radio and the man followed us for 55 miles before he peeled away onto another road. Our fuel meter was on the big red E for the last 10 miles. We were driving on fumes. I don't really believe in God, but if he does exist, this seemed like one of his miracles. Once we got there, we drove into a gas station and refilled to a full tank before driving the rest of the way home. My sister and I slept in the car after that. I only woke up once we made it all the way home, just grateful that nothing worse had happened after that. After getting some sleep, my mom phoned the non-emergency line for the police and reported what happened. They never got back to us after that, but apparently the woman she spoke to said they may wish to in the future, as he matched the description given of a suspect wanted in relation to a murder charge. No idea if he actually was that guy or just a random psycho. As I said, they never got back to us. So what's the takeaway, other than crazy man on the beach? Well, for me, it's that I love Parmesan. I love dogs. 
she's still with us now, old as the hills, and twice as grizzled as one of my mom's friends likes to joke. I don't know why she did what she did that day. I could not tell you what her thought process was. What I do know is that this poor dog was born into an environment where they abused and neglected her, only to be rescued and taken to a shelter where her mother and siblings all found homes before her. Despite how badly people had treated her, when I took her home, she forgave, but not forgot. I think the saying is, I never trust a person who doesn't like a dog, but I always trust a dog when they don't like a person. They have a very good understanding of human body language, and I think she must have understood how dangerous this guy was. If you're able to, please adopt. You might find yourself in a situation like mine someday. Hopefully not. I promise you if you're willing to save a four-legged friend's life, they will pay you back tenfold if they're able to, without a thought for their own safety. I paid $78 for Parmesan's adoption fee, which is a lot when you're a kid. But it chills me to my bones knowing if I hadn't been so insistent on getting a dog, I might be dead. When I was a kid growing up in North Carolina, I was a member of the Boy Scouts of America. I know it might seem corny, but my time in the Boy Scouts honestly made for some of the fondest memories of my childhood. And as much as my friends these days like to make jokes about the deviant proclivities of my former Scoutmasters, nothing remotely weird or unsavory ever happened with any of them. There was a lot of fishing, camping, field craft and community service, just some good old-fashioned wholesomeness that gave my parents a break from me from time to time. Well, all except for this one time. So one summer, my scout troop goes on this big camping trip up into the Smokies. For those unfamiliar with the term, the Smokies, or Great Smoky Mountains, are a part of the Greater Appalachian Mountains and are also home to the Great Smoky Mountains National Park one of the most highly visited national parks in the country. The name Smokies comes from the natural fog that often hangs over the mountaintops, appearing as large smoke plumes from a distance, and originate from organic compounds that are exhaled by the local vegetation. But excuse the high school science lesson, I'll get on with it. So we were up in the Smokies having a good time, when one night, while sitting around the campfire after dinner, one of our scoutmasters decides to tell us a creepy campfire tale. He starts telling us the story of Udlunta, which is the Cherokee name meaning spear finger, or one with the pointed spear. Spearfinger supposedly lived in the western part of North Carolina, right up in the Smoky Mountains where we were camped at the time, and her name referred to the long, slender, sharp finger on her right hand which she used to slice up her child victims, whose livers she ate raw. As legend has it, she apparently clutched the stony skin on her right hand tightly because her heart was actually hidden in her palm there. Our scoutmaster goes on to tell us how, because Spearfinger's skin was made of stone, she was invulnerable to the arrows of the Cherokee, and her footsteps sounded like thunder as she walked along the mountainside. Whenever her deep voice rumbled around the hillsides, it would scare all the birds away, a warning sign to those she was hunting as she sang her favorite song, Ue la na siku, or Liver, I Eat It. Spearfinger was also said to be able to take on the appearance of her child victim's family members, often taking the form of a kindly old woman to trick her victims into feeling safe around her. She would lull the child to sleep, running her fingers through their hair to calm them, before stabbing her pointed finger through the back of the neck, or through the heart. She would then tear out the livers of her victims before feasting on them, leaving her mouth covered with fresh blood. 
Needless to say, by the time our scoutmaster had finished telling us the story, we were all completely and utterly terrified, and only managed to stop freaking out once he had gotten out his old guitar and sang us a few songs. But that night, while back in my tent with a buddy of mine, I found myself totally unable to sleep. I kept imagining that, if I did, Spearfinger would come, rip my tent open, and stab me in the heart with her long, sharp, stony finger, all before tearing out my liver and eating it. Then, right as I was about to drift off to sleep, a bright light lit up one side of my tent. I was completely frozen in fear for a moment, whispering for my sleeping buddy to wake up, but I was totally unable to rouse him. I carried on staring at the side of the tent, wondering where the bright light was coming from, as it seemed way too intense to be from someone's torch. Then, I just about let out a whimper of fear when I heard a hissing sound and saw a shadow passing over the fabric of my tent. I called out to them, asking who was there, but no one said a thing in response. There was just another faint hissing sound as the figure seemed to creep closer and closer to my tent. Then, I saw the figure raise a hand, and I almost choked in terror when I saw a single, long, pointed finger and a hissing voice whisper, I screamed, ripping my way through the front flap of my tent and tearing around the campsite screaming, It's Spearfinger, it's Spearfinger, she's come to eat my liver, please don't let her eat my liver. I expected the rest of the camp to start screaming too, to burst out of their tents in terror, or to maybe just stay inside them in the hopes that Spearfinger might pass them over. And don't get me wrong, there were a couple of other cries of fear that accompanied my own, but the sound that made me slow to a stop and peer around in confusion was the sound of laughter. When I looked, I saw another one of the scouts, this kid named Devin, and he was just about doubled over in hysterics with a long, slender twig tied to one finger. I must have been boiling with rage at the time, but Devin just thought that it was extra funny, waving the long wooden twig at me and making the same hissing sound again before bursting into laughter. I swear that was probably the most scared and embarrassed I ever was during my entire childhood, and all because that little punk Devin decided to pull a prank on me. Ever since then, I have never been able to hear the words Smoky Mountains without remembering that Boy Scout camping trip, even if it does make me kinda smile these days. But what doesn't make me smile is seeing liver in the deli section of a grocery store because all I think about sometimes is the idea of Spearfinger hushing a child to sleep, stroking their hair, singing them a little lullaby with the voice of their grandma or favorite aunt, all before ripping out their liver and feasting on it with her stony, skinned lips drenched with dark, fresh blood. There have been three instances in my life where I have felt like I was going to be abducted. I am a woman and I am currently 23 years old. I am also on the petite side, standing at a whopping 5'3 and weighing around 115 pounds. Because of this, I typically wear heels or platform boots so that I can appear taller than I actually am. This story happened this spring while at a secondhand store. I was looking to find a good side table styled cabinet and my boyfriend came with me because I have already been nearly abducted twice in my life. And I suffer from CPTSD in part because of that, so I am not really able to go out in public by myself unless I am with someone, going to class, or going to work. Lucky for me, my boyfriend is 6'3", lean but muscular, has a very deep intimidating voice 
and has absolutely no issues with taking physical action if I needed that kind of defense. So it's nice basically having my own caring personal bodyguard. For context, the area I live in is bad for trafficking. I live in northern Wisconsin, but close to Minneapolis. The I-94 runs basically straight to Minneapolis from the Dells. I grew up near that area, and I know full well that the Dells has bad trafficking issues too, because of the high levels of tourism in the area. Plus, Baraboo, the next town over from the Dells, still has running cargo trains that are rumored to contribute to trafficking. But that's not entirely relevant. The town I currently live in is split in half by the same interstate, and there's a Walmart right by the exit, also infamous for trafficking. There have been many abductions of women in our town in various locations all over, and it isn't a secret to anybody that it is an issue for the area. Now, moving on. My boyfriend and I go to the next town over to look for a cabinet-styled side table because the second-hand shops in our town don't sell furniture. We get inside and look around for a little bit before my boyfriend says that he needs to go to the bathroom. I keep browsing nearby the bathrooms in a display area for desks, dressers, etc. And I find this really neat vintage vanity with hidden organizers in the top of the desk and I start looking at it and checking out its little features. While doing so, I feel eyes on me, so I look around to see if I'm being watched by someone. Sure enough, in the row of desks behind me, there is a middle-aged man looking at me with no facial expressions. I am dressed in a skirt and knee socks, and this is one of my go-to looks. So glaring at creepy men eyeing me up isn't something new to me, but since I am alone at the moment and don't want to upset the guy, I give him the cliche Midwestern half smile and move up the row away from him, but towards the corner of the section. All of a sudden this guy practically runs to the row I'm in, so I take a right and head up towards where he was standing when I spotted him initially. He picks up pace and I am now half running trying to get away from him and after a small chase around furniture, we end up in a situation where I am standing on one side of the row of desks and he is standing in front of me on the other side, waiting to see which way I go, at a standstill. At this moment, I try looking to my left towards the other furniture and bathroom to see if anyone is around to witness this, and thank Gaia, my boyfriend is out of the bathroom already, walking towards us with very squared up posture. He looks absolutely livid, and his eyes are locked solidly onto this creep that was chasing me around furniture just a second ago. My boyfriend reaches my side and puts his arm around my shoulder protectively, and he and this creep make eye contact. They honestly both looked equally pissed off. The guy doesn't say anything, just walks away. But every few minutes or so we see him looking at us a few aisles away wherever we are in the store and I am extremely anxious at this point and just want to leave. But my boyfriend is trying his best to reassure me and calm me down in ways he best knows how with little avail. He eventually distracts me from the guy by finding a perfect side table for what I was looking for. Dark cherry wood, glass door, shelves, absolutely beautiful and only $30, not to mention a student discount. We pick it up and head to checkout, and the entire time I am paranoid and looking around to see if this guy is near us. He is currently being checked out at the register, and we are being separated by two other customers. My anxiety spikes again, but I try not to let it show. When he is done, he walks through the first set of doors to exit, but is still in the first entrance of the store just standing there. He looks at me, and we make eye contact a few times while I am in line and then checking out. I make it a point to stand on the right side of my boyfriend carrying my new find out and holding eye contact with the creep the whole time we exit and get into the car. He doesn't say or do anything. He didn't follow us. He just stared at me and we get into the car safely. Although I am still paranoid and trying to get the side table in the car and secured as fast as possible, which is just making me fumble even more. But regardless, we left safe and made it home okay. I can't say for certain that this man was trying to abduct me, 
let alone if he was working with traffickers. But I highly doubt he was chasing and stalking me around the store with pure intentions. Last night, I was laying in bed, reading a little before I went to sleep. I think it's important to clarify that I live on the outskirts of my town. Still in town, but definitely on the edge, off the highway that leads out of town and into about a 15 mile long stretch of lots of country, woods, fields, a few residences, but mostly open highway. So other than the other tenants in my actual apartment building, it's normally very quiet in my area. My building is a square with four apartments, and for each of us, our door simply faces out into the open. There's no lobby or foyer or anything. My door in particular looks out into a large field that goes up a hill. I don't remember the exact time, but sometime between 1 and 2 a.m., someone randomly started banging on my door, which would freak me out in the broad daylight, but especially in the middle of the night. I nervously went to ask who it was, and this guy with a deep voice claimed he was a police officer and that I needed to let him in. Not that I needed to open the door. Luckily, I watch and listen to a lot of true crime stuff, so I got pretty suspicious real quick. I got near instant alarm bells because he couldn't tell me why I needed to let him in, what I supposedly did, and he never asked what my name was. He also didn't really sound like a police officer, if you know what I mean. Obviously, I was feeling creeped out, so I called 911 to confirm that there was actually an officer at my address, and they said there wasn't. At this point, I am freaking out and I kind of call out through the door that I'm on the phone with the police, and the guy just kind of bangs on my door one more time, then stops making all noise. I presume because he ran off. They dispatched two cars to my apartment, and the officers took a good look around. Unfortunately, the guy was long gone by the time they got here, and I never saw him, so I don't have a description of him or anything but the cops said two things to make me feel better. One, they would post more patrols in my area over Halloween weekend. And two, it was most likely a Halloween prank because the bar down the street from my apartment had had a party and it was just closed not too long before. Always trust your instincts. And remember that if you have any doubts about someone claiming to be a police officer, Call 911 and confirm that they are who they say they are. Dispatch and the officers who came tonight told me, you will not get in trouble for making sure the person talking to you is actually an officer. This also applies to situations where it's nighttime and dark, so you can't really see for sure if it's a real cop car behind them or not. If you see flashing lights behind you on a back road or a dark area at night, Put on your hazard lights and call 911 first to make sure it's actually a police car. You won't get in trouble. Better safe than sorry. Okay, so I will preface this by saying that these events happened exactly 20 years ago pretty much to the day. I will also mention that this could come across as anticlimactic, as it does not end with a dead body or an imprisonment. It is, however, true and accurate as I remember it. So it was not long before my ninth birthday. I was a shy, introverted kid who only had a few friends. Therefore, I was eager to impress them. A few friends are better than none, right? This story involves my closet friend at the time, whose name was Damon. Being so shy, I would never turn up to any parties or social events. I just couldn't face it. 
but it worried me that this would eventually cause me to lose my few friendships. You can imagine my horror when my dad picked me up from the school gates and Damon's mother picked him up at the same time and asked me on the spot, Damon and his brother are going to Caravan Park this weekend. Would you like to come? For those unfamiliar, a caravan holiday in the UK is just a cheap couple of days in a huge field full of trailers with tacky nearby entertainment and amusements. On the spot and terrified of being rude, I accepted, and come Friday evening, I was sat in the car in the back in between Damon and his little brother Lucas, who was two years younger than us. It was only a short car ride, but all this felt so uncomfortable and unfamiliar to me. Floating through the dark back streets I hadn't seen before, as wind and rain lashed the windshield while the wipers did all they could to keep up. When we arrived, it was already late. We watched some stuff on TV and went to bed. I had one of those brick Nokia phones that you could play Snake on that I promised I would text my dad on to let him know I was okay, which I did. The strong gale swayed the caravan that night as I fell into an uneasy sleep. The next day, we hit the shops to spend our pocket money, and then in the afternoon, we went to the quote-unquote entertainment with Damon and Lucas's parents. It was just awful live acting with clowns and such things. I may have been eight, but I wasn't a baby. So then later on, at around 8 p.m., the adult entertainment comes on a comedian of some sort, and me and Damon and Lucas are absolutely bored stiff. Me and Damon decided we just want to head back to the caravan, watch some South Park, and look at our cool new stuff we bought earlier that day. I saw Damon ask his parents who are happily drinking away and chatting to other parents, and as a child it seemed, swapping life stories. Eventually, they gave Damon the keys to the caravan, which was about a five-minute walk away, but instructed us to take Lucas, too. We took the keys and headed out. We walked for about two minutes in the cold and dark, mindlessly chatting about our eyeball rings we bought earlier at the gift shop and saying how they automatically give you a super hard punch. Just stupid eight-year-old chat. When we noticed that in between two caravans, there was a white van. I know cliche. It had its back doors wide open. I thought nothing of it. Maybe someone had just got here and was unloading his stuff. Wrong. As we walk by the van, a man emerges from the blackness and approaches us very slowly. This was not a normal walk. I remember it being like how you would walk in the dark being very careful not to step on anything. Strangely, we still weren't too worried until he actually spoke. He stared at us for a few seconds, but did not smile or physically acknowledge us. Then he blurts out an enthusiastic, All right, boys, can one of you strong lads help me shift this heavy box into the back of my van? I hurt my back. Now, back then, stranger danger wasn't as commonly spoke about as it is today, but I absolutely knew this was not right. His walk, his voice, his eyes. I had a million thoughts in about 10 seconds. What can I do? Call my dad? He's miles away from here. Scream for help? There's no one in these caravans. They are all at the entertainment. Fight this guy? Yeah, right. I thought things couldn't get any worse. I was wrong. As me and Damon stood frozen, his younger brother naively says, Yeah, okay, I'm strong. And starts marching towards this guy's van, which was only about 15 feet away from us. I will never forget his horrid face when he saw Lucas walking towards him. It was like a spider that had caught a fly. I heard Damon let out a broken screech. Lucas, no! It is at this point I am ashamed to say that I continued walking the way we were originally meant to go, 
and fast. I couldn't watch this. What if he murdered Lucas in front of me? What if he came and grabbed me? The only thing I could think to do was walk quickly and try to find someone, anyone, who could help. About ten seconds later, Damon and Lucas came sprinting up behind me and shouted, Run! And ran, we did. Oh, how we ran. I don't know how Damon got Lucas away. I don't know if the man chased us. I don't know what he wanted with us, but I have a few ideas. As we approach the caravan, I begin to feel semi-rational again. As we catch our breath, I can remember saying to Damon, Why couldn't we just run back to the entertainment area to get your parents? And Damon replied, What? And run towards him? It was a good point, but I was too busy trying not to cry to say anything else. As Damon fumbled around with the keys at the caravan door, for some reason or another, the keys just did not work. We tried all of them, turning them in all directions, pushing and pulling and hoping and praying. I can clearly picture in my mind being stood there on that dark night with Damon and Lucas, the key halfway hanging out of the lock, the fear and the confusion. But most of all, I remember Damon looking straight at me after turning bright red with puffy eyes and bursting into tears because he had realized what I would then realize seconds later. We had to go back. Strangely, Lucas was the only one not crying. I think he was too young to understand the danger that we were truly in. After deciding that we were in just as much danger standing there as we would be going back, we headed back towards Damon's parents. I have never ran that fast in the 20 years since then, and I dare say that Damon would say the same. About halfway there, we hear the most disgusting primal wail you can imagine. It was about five seconds long, and it sounded like a mixture of anger and pain. We never stopped, just made brief eye contact and kept going. Had the man killed someone? Or was this man screaming because he knew that we had gotten away? We would never know. We burst through the entertainment area doors and sprinted towards Damon's parents, who were blissfully unaware of the horrors that had just occurred. I remember his mother staring at us wide-eyed with her mouth open, and we burst into floods of tears, half because of the trauma and half because of the relief. I felt so warm and safe. We tried to explain in babble and gibberish, but I am not sure we got our point across. The next morning, I asked to go straight home. I don't truly understand what happened that night. I don't know who he was, what he wanted, or why he screamed. But like I said, I have my theories. But no one was killed that night in the caravan park, and nobody else was around to scream. You might be able to describe 17-year-old David Faraday as the all-American boy. David was clean-cut a good student and a member of the Boy Scouts of America. He was also apparently something of a moral arbiter, having once confronted a dealer outside of his high school when the man had apparently been attempting to peddle to members of the student body. After threatening to inform the police, the dealer was said never to have hung around the high school again. And although by today's standards we might consider this to be so-called snitch behavior, David was clearly simply trying to protect his fellow students from something he was concerned would affect their academic performance. He was a good person, with a good heart, and almost all of what he did came from a place of love. But like many boys his age, David found himself increasingly interested in the fairer sex, and there was one particular young lady that caught his attention over all others. 
Betty Lou Jensen was 16, a year younger than David, but she was incredibly popular, and her reputation as a charming, well-mannered young lady preceded her. She was also a very talented artist who took a great deal of interest in all things creative. It was at a local youth function that David got the chance to talk to Betty Lou, and his affection for her seemed to be entirely reciprocated. Betty Lou shared a great deal with him, and even invited him to visit her after school so that he could walk her home. After a few weeks of wholesome, teenage dating, something of a relationship began to blossom between the two bright-eyed young people. But all was not entirely well, as there was another boy who had his eye on Betty Lou, one who was not about to let David have her all to himself. He squared up to David when the young man was waiting outside of Betty Lou's high school, and although the confrontation didn't become physical, some pretty harsh insults were exchanged, and David was warned to stay away from Betty Lou. Other boys might have been deterred by such a display of possessiveness and aggression, but not David. He was determined to secure his place as the only boy in Betty Lou's life. And so one afternoon, on their way home from school, David asked Betty if she would like to go on a date with him, their first date. And to his absolute elation, Betty Lou said yes. David racked his brains for a solid first date idea, and given that it was late December, decided that a great way to capture that festive, romantic spirit would be to take Betty Lou to a local Christmas event. And being the gentleman that he was, he made a promise to her parents to have her back home by 11 p.m. at the very latest. Rumor has it that David and Betty were planning on attending the Christmas-themed party with a few other local high school students, but perhaps this was simply a cover to reassure the young girl's parents, because what we know for certain is that they ended up driving over to Lake Herman Road in David's Rambler station wagon, parking it up in quite a well-known spot that was known to many as Lover's Lane. The whole appeal of the spot near Lake Herman is that it was quiet and unfrequented by members of the public, hence why young couples might use it to gain some privacy for certain unsavory activities. But it wasn't just infatuated lovebirds who noted the location's seclusion, because someone else wished to take advantage of the isolation for something that was considerably more malicious. At some point during their stay up on Lover's Lane, David and Betty Lou noticed another car pull into the spot, one that parked up alongside them before turning its lights off. At first, David and Betty were worried it was the cops, come to arrest them for committing lewd acts in public. But as they peered through the darkness to study the vehicle next to them, it became increasingly obvious that it was not in fact the police. All the young couple could do was watch, growing increasingly scared, as the shadowy silhouette in the front seat stayed state still, staring at them through the passenger window. Betty Lou told David she was spooked and asked him to see if he could get the person to leave. But unlike previous encounters, where David's bravery had shown through when confronted with a source of maliciousness, he too was far too frightened to do anything. But as he prepared to start up the Rambler's engine so he could drive Betty Lou out of there, the driver of the other vehicle got out and approached David's side of the Rambler. David was transfixed, frozen in fear like a deer in a car's headlights. But when he saw the mysterious stranger pull out a weapon and aim it at his window, his flight response kicked into gear. Betty threw open the passenger side door, throwing herself from the Rambler before David following suit, but neither of them was fast enough to outrun a bullet. The stranger fired once through the roof of the Rambler, then sprinted around the back to fire another shot at David through the vehicle's rear window. Both shots hit the young man, and he crawled along the ground near the station wagon's back wheel on the passenger side, trying and failing to escape. Betty Lou, however, began to sprint away through the darkness as the first shots were fired, but the stranger was fast. He took aim and fired five shots at the right side of her back, each bullet striking her torso before she fell, and she lay dying in the darkness. The killer turned his attentions back to David, and pulling the trigger one last time, sending a bullet crashing into his skull just behind his left ear. Apparently, 
the killer then simply got back into his car and drove away into the night. Sometime later, someone who drove past the spot on Lover's Lane must have seen the bodies lying in the dirt and then rushed to call the police. David was still breathing when they arrived on scene, but was completely unresponsive and was dead on arrival when he was finally taken to a nearby hospital for treatment. The double homicide stunned and horrified the local community, and rumors abounded that there was a crazed madman on the loose, with it only being a matter of time before they struck again. One of the first people contacted by the police as a potential suspect in the murders was the young man who had confronted David as a result of his own jealousies over his and Betty Lou's blossoming relationship. But it was discovered that this young man had a strong alibi for his whereabouts, meaning there was no way he could have been the mysterious, bloodthirsty stranger who pulled into Lover's Lane that night. As the summer of 1969 drew to a close, journalists and law enforcement alike wondered if the teenage lover's killer would ever be found. But little did they know that the nightmare had just begun, and what would follow would continue to baffle all those involved for decades to come. Because the man who took David and Betty Lou's lives that evening, the man who relentlessly fired into the Rambler station wagon, would come to be known by a name that would echo through the annals of true crime all over the world. The Zodiac. Zodiac's identity remains a complete mystery, even to this day. The killer's nickname originated from a series of taunting letters and cards sent to the San Francisco Bay Area Press. These letters included four cryptograms based around a number of ciphers, one of which was recently solved by the FBI after over 50 years of research and study. We know for certain that Zodiac murdered five people in Benicia, Vallejo, Napa County, and San Francisco in the 11 months spanning December of 1968 and October of 1969. It seems he preferred to target young couples, which is how he seemed to have come across David and Betty Lou while the pair were on their first date. Yet despite only five confirmed victims being attributed to the Zodiac, he once claimed to have murdered 32 other people, bringing his total body count to 37 victims. A killing spree that started with two young lovers, so excited to finally have some time alone together on their first date, never being able to imagine that it would end in such a brutal moment of painful finality. So the next time you're on a first date, don't be so quick to go somewhere secluded, as you never know who might be watching or following, just ready to turn a perfect, romantic moment into a living nightmare. Geraldine Largay kept a detailed record of her journey along the Appalachian Trail during the summer of 2013 in a small black notebook. Due to her pace, she had adopted the trail name Inchworm, but for a slow walker, she had still managed to cover an immense distance, hiking almost a thousand miles from Harper's Ferry in West Virginia with a close friend of hers named Jane Lee. George Largay, Geraldine's husband of 42 years, was driving ahead of them, arranging care packages and supply pickups for them, occasionally ferrying them to motels for the relief of a hot shower or a night in a soft bed. But on June 30th, as Jane and Geraldine reached New Hampshire, Jane was forced into an early end for her adventure due to a family emergency, but Geraldine insisted on continuing the hike. The trail was almost at an end, and she would not give up so easily. Jane would later say that Geraldine had a poor sense of direction, had taken a wrong turn on the trail more than once, and would become flustered whenever she made such mistakes. Then, while she was all alone, Geraldine ended up taking another wrong turn up in Maine, wandering into terrain so wild that it is used by the state's National Guard for military training. She kept riding after she lost her way, even as her food supply dwindled along with her hopes of being found. 
She ended up waiting nearly a month in the Maine woods for help that would never come. Geraldine had left the trail in one of its most rugged sections, with thick underbrush and fir trees packed so tightly that the landscape became a maze of greenery. You step off the trail a little, then turn around, and it's very difficult to see where the path is, reported a volunteer who spends time doing trail maintenance in the area. If you didn't know which way the trail was, you could easily walk in circles for hours. Knowing she was hopelessly lost, Geraldine sought high ground in the hopes of getting a signal on her cell phone. Lost since yesterday, she texted her husband. Off trail three or four miles. Call police for what to do, please. She tried over and over to send messages, but none went through. In some trouble, another text to George read. Got off trail to go to the bathroom. Now lost. She asked him to call the Appalachian Mountain Club to see if a trail maintainer could help her. But again, the message was never received. Around July 23rd, she set up her tent atop sticks and pine needles under a canopy of hemlock trees so thick that they obscured her from rescuers searching from the air. She tied a shiny silver blanket between two trees, possibly to attract attention, but the foliage was simply too dense for the blankets to be seen from the air. Geraldine was scheduled to meet her husband on July 23rd in Wyman Township, but she never showed. The following day, George reported her missing. Multiple agencies and volunteers would take part in a search for her, using horses and helicopters to traverse the tough terrain. Agonizingly, it would turn out that Geraldine was less than a mile from the trail itself, close enough that, in all likelihood, searchers had probably passed by her campsite without actually realizing it. Infuriatingly, the rescuers were bombarded with a number of false tips regarding the missing woman's whereabouts. Some purported that she had been murdered and strung up in the trees, saying they had seen her with sketchy-looking men who might have intended to harm her, while others suggesting that she had fallen in a river and drowned. A number of psychics called to report visions of her, including one who incorrectly insisted that she had broken her ankle. Others injected a kind of social justice warrior agenda into the situation, contending that Geraldine had been spotted at a women's shelter in Tennessee. This actually diverted valuable resources away from the search with accusations that her husband was a batterer, when in reality, he had never laid a finger on her for the entirety of their marriage. Her last entry reflected a strikingly graceful acceptance of what was coming. When you find my body, please call my husband George and my daughter Carrie, she wrote. It will be the greatest kindness for them to know that I am dead and where you found me, no matter how many years from now. It would be two years before a logging company surveyor stumbled upon her campsite and remains solving a mystery that had been tormenting her family and defied teams of experienced searchers. Mrs. Largay, a retired nurse from Tennessee, had survived nearly a month on her own, longer than many old backwoods hands thought possible, before dying of exposure and starvation. Her dead body was found on October 14, 2015, still inside her sleeping bag, in a campsite she kept tidy until the day she passed away. Around her lay her final few belongings, including a blue and white bandana, a rosary, birthday candles, lighters, dental floss, a sewing kit, and two water bottles, one still containing water. Two weeks after she was found, Geraldine's family visited the area in which she tragically lost her life. They left a white wooden cross decorated with messages etched in black marker, one, written in a child's handwriting, said, I wish you were here. It is quite simply terror-inducing that, even in a country as populous and settled as the United States, a person can still go missing on a simple mountain trail and vanish almost without a trace, only to be found months later, 
having starved to death in a country where there is such abundance of sustenance and civilization. Humankind has tamed more and more of America since the nation's founding, but it seems that some particular areas of the country will always be wild. I'm kind of weird about social media these days. I used to be really into Facebook when I first moved to college. It kept me in touch with my friends and family back home, and it was nice feeling like I wasn't so far away from them. Building up a collection of photos, checking into places, sharing every little detail of my life so that everyone could see how great I was doing. My entire world was online for all to see. And because I'm dumb, I was pretty liberal about my privacy setting too. So one day, I get this message request from someone I have never heard of before. It just said, hey. I checked their profile to see if they were in the same class as me or something, but it turned out we had no mutuals and they lived on the other side of the country. So as you can imagine, I am pretty confused as to why they are messaging me, but I'm also curious. So I just reply, Hey, do we know each other? I don't know what I was expecting him to say when I saw that he was typing a reply. And I remember thinking that maybe he was looking for someone with the same name as me or something. But then his response pops up. And all it said was, I'm going to kill you. With the cowboy emoji on the end. I stare at the message for a few seconds, not scared at all. Just like... What the heck? I then take another look at the guy's profile, seeing a bunch more pictures of him wielding knives in the woods somewhere. I mean, that was at least a little intimidating, but what really got me were all these rants that he had posted about how much his life sucked, how unfair things were, and how he would love to take it out on someone who deserved it. And then the videos that were unplayable because they had been removed by Facebook admins, but still had captions like, That chainsaw goes through his neck like butter, crying laughing face. That's when I started to worry. It didn't seem like this guy was just having fun, playing a prank on a stranger by trying to scare them. He seemed legit crazy and seriously angry. That nutcase could have been studying every one of my statuses, picture posts, and check-ins for weeks before he decided to message me. He could have screenshotted all my stuff, too, so it didn't matter if I had blocked him or not. He had my name, my school, where I hung out, the names of my friends and family, everything. I thought maybe I was just making a big deal out of nothing at the time, but later on I could barely sleep thinking about it. How horrifying a thought it was that he could have been driving across the country as I lay there in bed, having just picked a person at random to kill, and being crazy or angry enough to actually do it. You can call me paranoid all you like, but I just couldn't get this guy out of my head. Like the idea of him hunting me down or whatever was unnerving enough. I mean, he had enough info on me to be able to ambush me at a dozen different places that I just couldn't avoid, because they were school, or grocery shopping, or just my dorm room. But what had me freaked out is that the creep might have been able to learn so much about me, and I was dumb or vain enough to let it happen in the first place. I knew the internet was full of crazies, I just didn't expect it to reach out and touch me in the way that it did. If I didn't make it clear already, I did actually block the guy, but some weird grim curiosity had me unblocking his account one day so I could sort of check up on him and make sure he wasn't about to do anything too nuts. There were no rants, no threatening statuses, just a long series of photo posts that made me think he had taken up photography or something. I am scrolling through them when I start to get this familiar feeling from looking at that scenery. I couldn't be 100% sure, but I'd swear a lot of the pictures he had taken were of things that were around the town I was living in. 
There were no street signs or anything, nothing to actually confirm he had actually driven across the country. But if he wasn't taking pictures in a town that looked remarkably similar to mine, then I could have been in a lot of trouble. I expected that guy to jump me for weeks after, like I was a complete nervous wreck. It messed with my sleep. I lost a bunch of weight, being in an almost constant state of anxiety for the better part of a month. He didn't find me. Nothing happened as a result. But just knowing that he could pretty much come and get me anytime he liked got to me in ways I never even imagined it ever could. We put ourselves on Front Street in a big way with social media, and there could be literally anybody out there just lurking on our profiles. So like I said, now I am kinda weird and cautious about social media. I don't put too much out there. I don't use my real name. I run the strictest privacy settings possible. And I really recommend that you do too. The worst thing I ever bought off the market, hands down, this coffee machine I bought using Facebook Marketplace. The thing was an absolute steal, so I expected it to have a few flaws or whatever. But man, it was barely functioning by the time UPS delivered it to my house. Yet still, it was made in Italy, and it would do for making my coffee for the time being. But over the next couple of days, I started to hear something weird going on in the machine, a kind of low ticking noise that I had never heard any other coffee machine make before. I could have just called a repair guy, but I figured I would just buy a new one come next paycheck. So I just ignored the problem and figured I would throw the coffee machine in the trash once the new one arrived. Then one morning, I am making coffee when I could have sworn I saw something moving on the top of the machine. I just put it down to a sleepy brain and drank my coffee, but the thought kept bothering me as I went about my morning. So I finally decided to actually take a look inside the machine. It took me a little while, but I finally got the outer casing off. Yet when I pulled it off to reveal the machine's guts, I screamed. I swear I could have cracked the kitchen windows Inside the coffee machine was the biggest nest of cockroaches I have ever seen in my life, to this day. The little buggers absolutely disgust me, and seeing so many of them in something I have been using to drink my coffee, the thought makes me want to throw up, even after all this time. As soon as I screamed and dropped the lid onto the kitchen counter next to the machine, they all got spooked and scattered in every direction just a storm of skittering legs that, I swear, had me literally traumatized for like a week afterward. I just bailed. My husband had to deal with pretty much everything, but you can bet that I was infinitely grateful for it. Getting roach eggs in the house meant that we needed to have the whole kitchen fumigated, but it was a small price to pay to get those evil little things out of my kitchen. Still, with the few hundred that we had to spend on exterminators, turned out to be the most expensive coffee machine I ever bought. Don't try to cheap it out, people, because sometimes you get what you pay for, with a nest of cockroaches thrown in as a creepy, crawly freebie. In late 2008, I came one night to find my mom sitting in the kitchen, all alone, in floods of tears. When I asked her what was wrong, her answer made my jaw drop. My dad had left her. There was absolutely no indication that anything was wrong with their marriage, or that he was remotely unhappy. But that afternoon, while I was out, he had apparently packed a few things into his suitcase, told her he was leaving, and just disappeared. I only mention this because it explains why my mom and little sister just didn't want to be in the house over Christmas and New Year's. 
That kind of family-oriented time of year would have just been way too hard on them. So they basically buggered off to Mexico for a month to just decompress or whatever. The point being, I was all alone for Christmas and New Year. Christmas Day sucked, and I realized they were right about not wanting to be alone in the house at that time of year. So for New Year's Eve, I decided to throw a little get-together for me and a load of my friends, hoping that a little party might take away some of the sadness I felt as a result of my dad leaving. So on the night itself, it ends up being about 20 to 30 of us getting together in my parents' place, getting drunk, listening to music, playing Xbox, just a big hangout among some of the people I was closest to. It was a really good night to start off with, and it really did help take my mind off things for a little while. We did the whole New Year's countdown thing, set off fireworks, generally having a brilliant little night together. But the drunker we all got, the messier things became, until it was just a medley of people throwing up or arguing among themselves. Two of the people who ended up fighting were my friend Chris and his girlfriend at the time, a girl named Katie. From what I could gather, Katie thought Chris had been flirting with a mutual friend of ours and had taken issue with it. Chris was insisting that they were just being friendly and it was nothing to worry about, but Katie was adamant that something was going on, that he was cheating on her, blah blah blah. You know how it is. Teenage drama. Now I know Chris really did love her, so it wasn't like a stand-up argument. It was more like him begging for her to see reason and to not get too mad and dump him over some perceived bit of flirting. He swore he would never do anything like that, that she was the only girl for him, how much he loved her, all this romantic, theatrical stuff that you might expect from two young lovers. It wasn't really any of my business, though, so me and the other party guests just sort of left them to it while we got on with trying to have fun. Then a little while later, I find Chris sitting in the back garden, swigging off a bottle of raw vodka on his own. I go up to him and ask if he's okay, only to find that he's crying, completely drunk, saying that Katie dumped him and left. I tried to be a good friend and console him as best I could, saying that she was probably just drunk and over-emotional, and saying there was a good chance they'd get back together over the next couple of days when she realized this was a mistake. But he was insistent that she was gone for good, and that they wouldn't be getting back together. All I could do was get him on his feet and hug it out with him. The poor guy really was in one bad state. I managed to convince him to hand over the vodka, drink some water, and then get some sleep in my bed so he could maybe sober up a little bit before heading home. He agrees, and I tuck him in, and then leave him to get some rest. About an hour or so later, the party is winding down, and the remainder of us are just chilling in the TV room, when someone goes off to use the toilet. They return like seconds later, saying someone's in the bathroom throwing up, and then asking if they can go pee in the back garden. Of course I tell them no, I didn't want them peeing all over my mom's flower beds, and that I will run upstairs to see if I can get whoever it is out of the bathroom. So I get to the bathroom upstairs, and I can hear someone gagging and retching on the other side of the locked door. My friend Julia joins me, a little concerned, and starts trying to help me talk to the person who's locked themselves in the bathroom. It's sometime then that I noticed that two doors are open, the first being my bedroom, the second being a little cupboard on the first floor landing. I check my bedroom and see that the bed is empty, so it's obviously Chris that's in the bathroom puking his guts out because of all the vodka he drank. I shut the door to the bedroom, then go to close the door to the other room, which happened to be a little cupboard that my mom kept cleaning supplies in. My first thought was that Chris had opened up that door, thinking it was the bathroom in his drunken haze, then ran to the right bathroom in his desperation to puke. But I noticed something that, at first, I didn't really understand the significance of. The cleaning supplies that my mom usually kept all neat in a little plastic box were spilled all over the floor. Not like open fluid spilling out. They were just all out of the box like someone had been rooting through them. As I'm wondering why someone would do something like that, Julia calls out that the person who had locked themselves in the bathroom 
presumably Chris, had gone quiet all of a sudden, and that they weren't responding. That's when I put two and two together. Violent vomiting, cleaning supplies missing, deep drunken depression. Chris was trying to end it all. I flew to the bathroom door and started to kick the doors off the hinges. Julia screams in shock at what I'm doing, and the people from the living room start piling out towards the bottom of the stairs in utter confusion. I had been really protective of the house all night, not wanting people to smoke inside, not wanting people peeing anywhere they shouldn't, trying to stop spillages and all that. Then there I was, booting down my own bathroom door. It was way too heavy to actually kick off the hinges, but I did manage to kick a hole in the wood paneling, and that's when I got a look inside. Chris was laying there, a bottle of bleach next to him, and there was a pink fluid all over the floor and his clothes. It was pink because he had drank the bleach, and it had corroded or burned the inside of him so much that he had vomited up blood. We were distraught, terrified, almost sure he was gone, but we were extremely quick to call an ambulance. Chris had his stomach pumped, and he survived, but it took a long time for him to be back to normal. Because he puked, the fumes had damaged his lungs or something, so he had trouble eating, drinking, and breathing for at least a month after that. Twelve years, and I have never forgotten that, and I am sure neither has he, because as far as I know, Chris never drank vodka again, because if the smell of it makes me think of that night, who knows what horrible memories it brings back for him. A couple of years ago, me and my girlfriend, now wife, were selling some of our old stuff after moving into another apartment, and one of these items happened to be our big old TV. We put one ad up on eBay, and another on that Facebook marketplace thing, since it was kind of new at the time, and just decided to kind of wait and see what kind of offers we got. My wife was pretty sure she had found a decent enough buyer who'd come pick the TV up from our flat and save us a job but I had gotten a message from someone who, although they couldn't quite afford our asking price, made us an offer we couldn't refuse. It was from an older guy who seemed to be living on his own with his dog, whose TV had recently broken and he couldn't afford a new one. He said he could pay about 70% of our asking price and would make the rest up to us in plumbing services should we ever need it. I ended up getting into a long, touching discussion with the guy he kind of reminded me of an old uncle of mine, and I just instantly liked him. He had fallen on hard times and through no fault of his own. If anyone deserved a little kindness, it was him. After a brief discussion with my wife, we decided we would just go drop it off at his house for free. However, we also knew there's no way this guy would accept our charity right off the bat, or at least very little chance of that happening anyway. So, when he politely asked us to wait three weeks to drop it off at his house, since it would take him a little time to get the cash together, we were only too happy to oblige him. But still, we make a note of his address and whatnot, then tell him we'll call in a few weeks. A few weeks goes by, and we decide we'll drive the TV over to the guy on a Saturday morning. Before we leave, we give the guy a call to tell him that we're on our way. But there's no answer. We try once or twice more, but still the guy isn't answering his phone. Now this might sound kind of selfish, but the TV was all boxed up and just taking up space in our hallway. So even though the guy wasn't picking up his phone, we decided to drive over anyway and possibly leave the TV with a neighbor of his. I mean, that method seemed kind of preferable to us too. If we left it with a neighbor, we wouldn't have to go through all the potential awkwardness or refusing to take the guy's money. Anyway, so we drive over to the guy's address, keeping the TV in the car while we ensure that there's definitely no one home. I get out of the car, walk up this guy's driveway, and knock on the door, which gets no answer. Right then is when I lean back and look into the guy's front room. 
you know, to check if there are any lights on or anything. Who knows, the guy might have been a little deaf and just couldn't hear his phone or the door. But as I'm looking through his front windows, I see all these little black spots all over the blinds and on the windowsill. I'm like, what are those? Thinking they might have been bits of dirt or something. Then, one of the little dirt pieces just straight up moves in that lightning quick stop start way that insects do. And that's when it hits me. I am looking at about 50 houseflies, big ones, that are grouped together on his window. It's weird how we can see one housefly on a window pane or a window ledge and be like, oh, that's a fly. But when we see so many in one place, it's like our brains just don't quite compute what our eyes are seeing. That kind of brittle sense of perception that humans have never fails to creep me out. Like most people listening to this, I instantly knew what was wrong, and this horrific sense of dread came over me. I think I might have involuntarily let out a, oh no, when the penny dropped. You only ever get a concentration of flies like that when there's either a massive buildup of garbage, or there's a dead body. And in that case, someone had died. And horrifically, it was the older guy we had grown so attached to throughout the saga of getting rid of our old TV. The whole thing was just horrifying, from having to call the cops to the fire department showing up with them having to bash the guy's door down. When they did, the smell started to drift out into the street, and it was just about the most stomach-churning thing I have ever experienced. I know the guy wasn't exactly my best friend, but I feel like even though we only swapped a few texts and calls with the guy, we got to know him pretty well. He was good-natured, independent. I'm pretty sure he was a veteran, too. The whole thing really shook me up. Those flies, man. Those fat carry-on flies that were so big and engorged that I barely even recognized them for what they were. They had been breeding and feeding in the rotting flesh of the same guy I had been having heart-to-hearts with just weeks before. It's just scary to me how death is sometimes. Like, yeah, the prospect of what happens to us when we die is daunting enough, but it's how sudden and seemingly random death can be with all its grim little details. Like I couldn't shake the image of those flies on the window, like they were his ghost or something. Maybe we do leave a little something of ourselves behind when we die, but that thing happens to be so very ugly. During college Christmas break of 2016, I had traveled all the way back to Pennsylvania from California to spend the holidays with my parents. It was kind of weird going to mostly independent college kid in a place that hardly ever gets cold to going back to living in my childhood bedroom in a state that becomes a legit winter wonderland around December and January. But I love my mom and dad, and I don't care how much the flights cost. There was no way I was going to spend the holidays alone in California. So anyway, my old room is on the second floor of the house, directly above the sliding door that heads out into the decking in our backyard. It's a really heavy door, so anytime someone opens or closes it, it rumbles right up into my bedroom. This is in a house that was built back in the 50s too, so as you can imagine, the whole place has a lot of creaks and groans to it, but it is otherwise pretty sturdy. I should also add at this point that the part of town that my parents live at is pretty safe, with a relatively low crime rate, especially to that of nearby Philly. The most intrusive calls they ever got tended to be from magazine salespeople and the odd Jehovah's Witness, and after my dad refused to speak with them, they stopped calling altogether. Point being, They never had anything remotely close to any kind of break-in or home invasion for the entire time they were living in that property. Next thing is a brief confession for myself. I picked up a pretty horrible smoking habit during my freshman year of college, so whenever my parents went to bed, 
I tended to stay up playing Civ on my laptop, sitting next to my open bedroom window while I smoked and drank tumblers of scotch that I had pilfered from my dad's liquor cabinet. After midnight, I would have my window open for anything from 30 minutes to 2 hours. I mean it would purely depend on how cold it was outside, or how tired I was, but I would generally let the room air out before spraying some air freshener so that tobacco smell didn't cling to anything too bad. I also had to use headphones to watch TV or listen to music so it wouldn't wake my mom and dad up, but I would tend to only ever use one earphone so I could keep an ear out for anyone coming down the hallway since they really wouldn't be happy if they found out I was smoking in the house. So one night, I was in my usual routine of conquering the known world in an online multiplayer game of Civ when our house alarm suddenly starts blaring. I don't think I had heard that thing since I was about six or seven years old, and I had completely forgotten how loud it was. So hearing it had me practically filling my underwear from being frightened out of my skin. The point being, everyone in the house is now incredibly awake and ready to head off whatever is about to go down. Now my priorities might sound way, way off here, but initially, my big worry wasn't so much that something bad might be happening, like a home invasion or something like that. It was more like me being terrified that my parents were about to realize I had been smoking and stealing booze from them. I was 20 years old at the time, technically underage, and my parents were old-fashioned types real sticklers for the rules. If they found out what I had been doing, there would be drama, and lots of it. But somehow, when my dad stuck his head around my door all bleary-eyed to make sure he knew where I was, he didn't seem to smell anything. I don't know whether this was because he was too tired and freaked out about the alarm to notice, or that he had noticed and actually just didn't care. But either way, he told me to go into their bedroom and stay with my mom until he could give us the all clear. So my dad goes downstairs, I'm assuming with a weapon in hand, and gets to work clearing the house, as well as checking out the front and backyards to make sure there's no one hiding in the darker areas out there. He comes back up, tells me and my mom that he couldn't find anything, and that it was probably just a false alarm, and then we all head back to bed, or rather, they went back to bed. I went back to being a diplomatic genius on Civ 6. About an hour goes by and I start getting pretty tired, so I get up to close my bedroom window before heading to bed, when the alarm goes off again. Once again, my dad goes downstairs, does a sweep of the ground floors and the yards, then comes back up to tell me not to worry and that he figured it was just the wind or something. I mean, it had been a pretty windy night which honestly suited me because it meant the breeze aired my bedroom out. Like I said, it was an old house, so it wasn't out of the question that the wind could have rattled the doors or windows and set the alarm off. My point being, both me and my dad were chill about the alarm going off. Neither of us thought there was anything to worry about. So the next morning at breakfast, my dad is going through the alarm system's app in his iPhone checking out some of the data readouts from the night before. All of a sudden, he says, Okay, that's weird. Apparently the backsliding doors were opened 14 times last night. Number one, I was impressed the alarm system was so sophisticated that it could feed him that kind of info. I guess he shelled out big boy cash for that thing. Number two, how could it have been opened that many times? Then I am not kidding, like five to ten minutes later, there's a knock at our front door, and it's the neighbor guy from the house down the street. He asked us if we had had any intruders over the previous night, and we tell him no, or that at least we didn't think so. It's then that he tells us that he had actually caught someone on his security camera trying to break into his house, that the guy had tried to jimmy a lock or something before looking right up into his camera, before getting spooked and bailing. We assumed that's about the time he had moved to our house, then kept at it when he realized it was the weaker target. That seriously freaked me out. The whole time I had been sitting there, innocently playing Civ and sipping stolen scotch, 
there had been a guy trying to get into our house, maybe only six or seven feet below me. If I had bothered to look out the window at any point and directly downward, I would have locked eyes with this guy. He must have smelled my cigarette smoke, known someone was in the house, and it just didn't bother him in the least bit. He was more than prepared to face off with someone, although apparently not when he had seen my dad with a weapon sweeping the house and the yards in the dark. I have always liked a scary story or a good horror film. Ghosts, vampires, werewolves, they're my jam. I have never found like serial killers or whatever to be scary though. Like I didn't think that human element to the horror was particularly potent. After that night though, that all changed. It struck me how evil and predatory human beings can really be. How that guy had been creeping around our backyard for basically hours, right under my nose, and I had absolutely no clue that he was there. It was how he had managed to just disappear when the alarm went off too, and how he had the balls to come back once we had all gone back to bed. I mean, he was like a ghost or something, just vanishing into the darkness. I mean, think about it. My dad had checked out the backyard, tried to make sure there was no one hanging around, hiding out in the dark spots underneath the trees. And there was. There had been someone there, just watching my dad walk around in his slippers or whatever he had on, just waiting for him to call off the search before creeping back up towards the house. Just thinking about it now gives me shivers. And now that I am back in California telling this story, I always make sure that all the windows and doors of my dorm are locked, and that I double or triple check whenever I think something bad is about to go down. Because sometimes, it seems, you'll never know if someone is just lurking in the shadows until it's way, way too late. I am from Aotearoa, New Zealand. We do have the odd missing person or scary case, but it's otherwise safe here and not much happens. I mean that in a way that as a 19 year old girl, I feel comfortable to walk the streets at night or go on hikes alone because it is pretty safe and everyone looks out for one another, generally. This happened in the summer of 2019. My boyfriend and I were headed out on a picnic date to a spot we had visited before plenty of times, Karakuriki Track. It's at the end of a very long windy rural farm road off the state highway, so you drive for like 15 to 20 minutes from the main road down a long farm stretch and at the end is a large cul-de-sac and the surrounding massive farm. The owners of the farm have left the land kind of open to the public as a reserve because there are native trees and other things, because about a 15 minute walk from the cul-de-sac car park, there is a small waterfall you can swim in. The track is really popular as it's one of the closest swimming spots to the nearest city, Hamilton. And it's really scenic. You cross footbridges, pass by creek beds, etc. The farmers still go through every now and then to do their farm work, and there are fenced off areas that the public can't enter, as they still actively work the land. This particular day, my boyfriend and I were super happy because it was empty in the parking lot, and it was a super hot summer's day, so that was really rare. The farmer was crossing the cows through the gate on a quad as we arrived, and he smiled and waved at us. He's an older man, and we had spoke before, as we were regular visitors. So we set off towards the waterfall. We crossed one footbridge and passed through a big paddock of cows. The track is quite narrow, and the creek is right off the edges, so you have to be careful. We saw the waterfall, decided against swimming, as we had no towels, and headed back toward the car park. Now on our way back, we decided to go down a little bit of a steep gravel off-ramp on the track that led to a more private tree-covered area right by the creek. Here is where it starts. We were kissing and whatnot. I was laying on my stomach reading a book 
and my boyfriend was sitting up playing on his phone, and he was rubbing my back and playing with my hair. We were there for about 10 minutes before I turned and glanced up the gravel path, and way up even further on a hill through one of the farmer's gates, I saw a big man on a quad bike, who I did not recognize as one of the farmers, as there is only the one old couple who work the land. He was just sitting there staring at my boyfriend and I, and I don't even want to think about how long he had been there before I noticed. I told my boyfriend, and as soon as the guy saw we were both looking at him, he opened the gate and started heading down. Now both of us immediately got up to leave, as we did not want to have a conversation with a farmer about us getting freaky on his land, which is what we both assumed would happen, but it was so much worse. This guy came down the gravel track and ran his quad right through the creek. He left it there running in the water and got off. He was talking to himself, saying things along the lines of, Ah, oh, I messed up the engine, over and over before he even got near us. My boyfriend and I were gathering our things to leave at this point, and he starts to head towards us. He didn't even make small talk, which was really strange, because he went straight into saying, Have you guys seen any fish? I'm looking for some fish to kill. My boyfriend tells the guy that there's no fish in the creek, as it's fresh water, and he's probably best off to catch some eel, and this sends him into a fit, and he starts saying, I don't want no eel, I want to kill some fish. I had made it a point to not look at the guy in the eyes as I didn't want to draw the conversation towards myself because I was already extremely freaked out and I didn't want him to notice that. My boyfriend is much more of the calm and strong one when it comes to stuff like this. But for a second, I did look at the guy and I thought he looked like his face was slightly deformed, possible Bell's palsy, as I work in aged care and I have seen it a bit, and it looked similar. I bent down to tie my shoe, and when I was standing back up, that's when I saw the weapon on the man's waist. Listen to me close now. This is my first and last time in my entire life I have ever seen a real-life weapon. It is incredibly hard to get one in New Zealand, especially after the regulations following the incident in Christchurch. And not only that, he had one weapon on his belt and was waving another one around in his hand while he talked to my boyfriend about wanting to kill some fish. He was aiming it down to the creek every now and again, and then swinging it around on his finger. My boyfriend gave me this stern look, and stern is the best word for it, because the look spoke a million things to me in the moment, and he nodded his head towards the gravel hill leading back to the track. I grabbed the two bags we had, Fake checked my phone and told the man that our family were waiting for us back at the car park. He completely ignored what I had said and instead said, That's a cool hat you've got on. Or something about my hat that was completely irrelevant. So I dismissed myself and said goodbye and made my way to the hill. In my mind, I did not want to look back and see my boyfriend be hurt and then have a weapon pointed at my head. I knew that our best bet was me getting up this hill onto the narrow path he couldn't ride his quad down and sprinting to the farmer's house. As I'm walking up the hill, this guy says to my boyfriend, That's a really pretty girl you got there. And it was like all the intentions of his I didn't want to believe were confirmed. I felt like I would die. My boyfriend, though, said a quick thank you. We'll be off now and headed up the hill with me. The guy kept talking on like the conversation hadn't ended, even as we headed away, and he stood there, weapon in hand, watching us leave. As soon as we were around the corner, we sprinted all the way back to the car park where, we hadn't noticed before, there were over 10 empty shells laying on the ground. We had run into two girls in bathing suits just arriving at the spot as we did, and informed them about everything. They got in their cars and left immediately. We tried to go to the farmer's house to ask if he knew the guy, as we had never seen him on the land before, but they were not home. As for the weapon, 
It's still so freaky to me as I had never seen one before. Not a big deal, I know, but it looked quite old and rusty, and when we discussed the incident on the way home, my boyfriend suggested that they were probably handed down to him from someone else. This incident has stuck with me for the past few years, and my boyfriend and I have not been able to return to the spot, which sucks, because that's where we had our first date, and it was a really sentimental place for us. I had to drive past the road leading to the track for like a year as I commuted between towns, and it always made me feel sick. I could have lost my life or my partner that day, and I'm always extremely grateful that my boyfriend is the man that he is, and was able to steer the guy away from us for us to leave, and to communicate to me through movement to tell me what to do in my freaked out state. He told me after that, that he was ready to die if he had to, because knowing the guy had been watching us beforehand, and complimented me in the way that he did was clear that he could have had some scary intentions. It's also made me way more fearful now to travel in the bush alone, which I have done my whole life. I feel like every neighborhood has a family of absolute psychos. Almost everyone I have spoken to about this sort of thing seems to remember one group of absolute wrong-uns, be it from their childhoods or from their current lives. And if there's one thing I have learned from their collective memories and stories, it's that whenever there's a family like that around, it's only a matter of time before something comes to a head or something finally boils over. And that's exactly what happened with the psycho family that lived in the neighborhood when I was a kid. The only thing is, most of the people I've spoken to said the breaking point came with some kind of family argument or confrontation with neighbors spilled out into the streets outside. Police were called, arrests were made, usually a for sale sign or two went up in the aftermath. But I almost wish my story was that simple or ended that relatively amicably, because what happened in my case is something that haunts me to this day, with possibilities and ramifications that I find genuinely terrifying. I grew up in 70s Britain, in a pretty small town in a place called Wiltshire. We were quite a small community. Everyone knew everyone, and consequently, everyone knew everyone's business too. There was this one boy called Lewis, and he was the only child of the Prestige family. A very peculiar family name if ever there was one, but that's not the reason I'll never forget it. The Prestige family were peculiar by name, and peculiar by nature too. But then peculiar seems like entirely the wrong word to use. Peculiar makes you think of something quaint and adorably abnormal but there was nothing adorable about the Prestige family. They were just weird, scarily weird too. I think one of my earliest memories of Lewis is during an assembly in primary school. It's about eight in the morning. All the kids in the school are sat in the main hall and it's deathly quiet apart from our headmaster making announcements and the soft sobs of young Lewis. He did not stop crying for the entire assembly and it didn't just remain this quiet weeping either. His tears built in pitch and intensity until he was wailing so loud that a teacher had to remove him altogether. I remember feeling really sorry for him, but as time went on, it was just something you sort of got used to. They were the weird family in our town, and since they didn't get into any serious confrontations outside of their own family units, people just sort of let them be. The next serious incident I remember was years later, in secondary school, when the schoolyard suddenly became a buzz with people gossiping over something. People were crowding around the school gates, looking at something, some of them laughing, some of them just gawping at the sight of a lad dressed entirely in a school uniform, except for one crucial piece of it, his trousers, it turned out to be Lewis. From what I heard, 
He had been basically pushed out of the car by we assumed to be his dad. And rumors went flying around that Lewis hadn't been quite ready to leave the house when his dad was ready to take him to school that morning. Instead of waiting for him to put on his school trousers, Lewis's dad just drug him to the car and took him to school with no pants on, basically to teach him a lesson to be ready on time. I'm not entirely sure how true the reasoning was, but I do know that I witnessed Lewis having to walk into school in nothing but his school jumper, his shoes, and his underwear with my own eyes. I am also not entirely sure how Lewis was still allowed to live with his evidently abusive parents either. Again, rumors went around that they had had a visit from social workers, but this I believe, because for a while, there seemed to be little in the way of serious incidents coming out of the prestige household. Obviously, the visit from child welfare services had been enough to shake them up into changing their ways, or so it seemed. Now, all this came to a head when I was 15, maybe just over a year before we all left secondary school, and bid farewell to compulsory education for good. One morning, Lewis turns up to school in his own clothes, a pair of pumps and a colorful jumper. He gets pulled aside by a teacher, who I think at that point was well aware of the situation at home, and Lewis says something quietly to him before the pair of them disappear into the building, which housed the main office. The next thing I know, apart from the shoes he was wearing, Lewis has an entirely new school uniform. New blazer, new tie, new jumper, everything. And from that day on, he seemed like an almost entirely new person too. He didn't get dropped off at school by his parents anymore. He seemed more confident and open more talkative with other kids. He even started playing football with us at lunchtime, something he had never done before. We actually got quite pally with him for a while, and on more than one occasion, he invited us back home with him to play. We politely declined, of course, thinking of some made-up excuse to not have to go around the prestige house. But still, things seemed to be making a vast improvement. Emphasis on seemed, though, because after a long holiday weekend, Lewis failed to turn up to school at all. This didn't have anyone talking about it too much. Kids were routinely off on the odd one or two days with illness, but Lewis went an entire week without showing up for school, and that really did get us talking. I don't know if it was because I was so young and naive, or just didn't connect the dots, but I didn't think there was any link between all the police activity around our town and Lewis not being in school. But one Saturday afternoon, my mom and dad called me into the kitchen and asked me if I had been around Lewis's house at all recently. I told them no, but that I had been invited at one point. And when I said that, my mom gave my dad this look that seemed to be a weird mix of horror and relief, like I had dodged a bullet or something. Not long after that, I got word through some friends of mine that there had been a brutal double murder in town, that someone had been arrested for it too. Our little town barely had any crime at all. I think the most serious thing to happen for decades at that point was a car theft, so the idea that there had been a single murder, let alone two, just set the town alight, and there was much speculation over who the killer was and how the killings had come about. Looking back on it now, I can see why the adults might want to shield us from the whole thing, and it was only a few years later than I realized why the police had made such an effort to keep the identity of the murderer a secret. It's like that, when a murderer is under the age of 18, when they are a minor, their identity is kept secret for as long as possible. But that's only really possible with the media, because it did not take long before the residents of our town figured out what happened, and it was bound to trickle down to us sooner or later. The reason Lewis's parents didn't seem to be around anymore, the reason he was so happy and confident and carefree, was because Lewis had killed them. He had finally rid himself of the people that had made his life hell. I get that. 
but the fact that a kid killing his own parents could make him so happy, that is something I have never been able to truly understand. The horrible thing was looking back on the event years later and sort of piecing together the puzzle. For example, the day he came to school in his own clothes was probably the morning he had killed them, and since he had gotten blood on his school uniform, he had to dispose of it. All the times he had invited us back to his place to watch TV or play football, his parents would have been dead in the upstairs bedroom, assuming that's where he had killed them. If we had gone around, maybe we would have been able to smell them or see flies buzzing around the bedroom door or something. We were all just one little spur of the moment yes from finding out, finding their bodies. Maybe if that was the case, then Lewis would have killed us too. I used to work at a place called O'Hurley's General Store here in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. It was a real old-timey general store, the kind that sells everything from buckets and barrels to books and pocket watches, in addition to the regular selection of groceries and liquor. It was an all-right job for a young man such as myself, patronized by generally polite and well-meaning folk. Sure, I had a fair few drunks get a little rowdy when I wouldn't sell them hard liquor on a Sunday but nobody ever put a gun in my face. But that ain't to say that I didn't have one or two incidents in there that put the fear of God into me. And this here is one of them. So I'm working late one Saturday night, stacking shelves and cleaning house, when a man walks in wearing a black tailored suit. It was one of those that fit him like a glove and gave off an obvious air of wealth, which marked him as an out-of-towner in my book but that suit was just about the only normal thing about him. He was white as the cotton fields, so pale he was almost gaunt, with razor-sharp facial features and slicked-back silver hair. I hear the little bell on the front entrance tinkle, so I do my thing and walk back behind the counter to serve him, which is where I laid eyes on him. He walks up to me, and with this wolfish smile on his lips, asks me for a can of lighter fluid. I fetch him what he asked for, making a little small talk as I ring him up on the register. I asked him where he was from. DC. He replies, just passing through. I give him a polite smile and ask him if he was one of those politician types, to which he gives the vague reply of something like that. He then proceeds to take out the biggest roll of dollar bills I have ever seen in my life, all hundreds from what I could tell then places one down on the counter in front of me. I give the man his change, remarking that it's a good thing it had been a busy previous few hours, or he'd have wiped me out for change. I said it in this fairly jokey tone, expecting him to at least give a polite chuckle in return. But he doesn't so much as smirk. He just takes out this Zippo lighter from his suit pocket, just about the shiniest I had ever seen, and proceeds to fill it up with the lighter fluid right there in front of me. I have seen a fair few of those lighters in my time, but never one that I could have sworn was plated with silver. I figured he must have been hankering for a smoke something fierce, and I told him as such, but he replied that he didn't smoke. Right as he says that, he finishes up filling up his lighter, but not before accidentally spilling a little of the lighter fluid onto his finger, then, just before he pieces the shiny-looking Zippo back together, he brings the finger to his mouth and sucks the drop of flammable liquid off his finger like it was a drop of homemade wine or something. Now naturally, I quietly recoil when he does that, not quite being able to believe what I just witnessed. He sees me do so and shoots me another one of those wolfish grins, like he enjoyed the idea of freaking me out like that. I was just on the verge of asking him what that was all about, when I hear the doorbell of the general store tinkle again. I look over towards the front entrance, and in walks this young lady, who looks to be about the same age as my little sister. Couldn't have been no more than 14 years old. Only, she's dressed much younger, 
almost like how you'd expect a toddler to dress, in this denim skirt type thing with white embroidered flowers on it. She addresses him as daddy, so I figure it was his daughter, and tells him she needs to use the bathroom. The man in the suit then turns to me, asks if there's a bathroom his daughter can use, so I give him the key to one that we had inside the store. Only, instead of just handing it to his kid, he takes out a little leather wallet-looking thing from his jacket and hands that, the lighter, and the key to the little lady, who then makes her way off towards the door before locking it behind her. I started to feel incredibly uncomfortable. Something about this whole situation just didn't sit right with me at all. I had a sneaking suspicion of what was contained inside that small leather wallet thing, but I didn't feel like I was in any position to confront the suited man, especially not based solely on a hunch. But it wasn't just that. The kid looked absolutely nothing like him. She had these soft, rounded, delicate features, along with really curly hair. While the suited man's face was so sharp, he looked like he could have cut a swath through a pumpkin patch. And the way she called him Daddy, a girl that age should be well into calling her father Dad, Pop, anything but Daddy. I tried to distract from my discomfort by asking him where he and his daughter were headed. You ask a lot of questions, don't you, young man? He replied, dropping what had once been a kind of formal civility entirely and proceeding to stare a hole through me. His eyes, man. He had these narrow brown eyes so dark they were almost black, and I felt a shudder run through me as he fixed his gaze to mine. Just making conversation, I remember saying back to him, shifting nervously behind the counter. Well, you know how the old saying goes, don't you? His voice was smooth, just creepily calm, like there was no emotion behind it whatsoever. Curiosity killed the cat. The suited man turned, then started walking up and down the aisles, eyeing up the products like we were some quaint backwater relic, which I suppose was exactly what we were. I get back to cleaning house for a minute or two, only it's more just going through the motions while I keep an eye on what this guy is doing. I figure it'll only be a minute or two before his kid emerges from the bathroom and they fix to get back on the road. But five minutes goes by, then ten, and still no sign of her. Just as I'm about to ask him if he thinks she's okay in there, the bathroom door unlocks with a loud snap, and the door opens up. There's no flush, nothing to indicate that she had actually been using the bathroom for its intended purpose, and when she emerges, she seems all sleepy and dozy looking. Then she hands back the keys, the lighter, and the black leather wallet to the suited man in a daze, before giving him a lazy sounding, Thank you, Daddy. The way she said it right then, I knew he wasn't her father. It was dripping with sleaze, and the look he gave her in return was one a father should never, ever give his daughter, under any circumstances. It made me sick to my stomach and I wanted the pair of them out of my store immediately. But we rarely just come out and say something like that where I'm from. We'll say something with an implication if you catch my drift. Safe travels now, I remember saying to the suited man. My tone was friendly, but the look I gave him was not. He turns and looks at me like he was about to go through me for a shortcut, like he could have eaten me without salt there and then. Then he walks up to the counter, places the bathroom key down on top of it, and says one final thing to me. Remember, young man, curiosity killed the cat. Then he walks that little lady out of the store, and they drove off into the night. I seriously considered calling the sheriff right after they left, but what was I going to tell him? That a man was traveling with a girl that appeared to be his daughter? I'd be laughed right off the line. I could have mentioned that I thought there was something illegal in that leather wallet he handed her, but I got the distinct impression that nothing we could ever accuse him of was really going to stick. He had all that money, and that look he gave me too, 
so I didn't say a word to anyone. But for the remaining few hours of my shift, and for the next few days, I heard his words rattling around my skull whenever I paid any mind to him at all. Curiosity killed the cat. It started the first time I caught the bus to work. I had been having some major car trouble, and it looked like my car was going to be in the shop for up to two whole weeks. That meant, for ten whole days, I'd have to take the bus to and from work. It was an inconvenience, sure, but I am not so stuck up or sheltered that I was dreading taking public transport or anything. My main concern was getting caught in a rainstorm or something, but investing in a sturdy umbrella pretty much put those fears to bed. If I had only known that the trouble with taking the bus wasn't the time spent or the exposure to the crazy weather we get here in the Pacific Northwest, it was the people I'd be riding with, or more specifically, one person in particular. So, another thing that sucked about having to take the bus was how much earlier I had to wake up. Okay, 30 minutes earlier isn't all that bad, but it still sucked seeing 6.30 instead of 7 o'clock a.m. I would have to be at the bus stop by 7.15 in order to be at work by 8 a.m. sharp, and given the area I was living in at the time, this usually meant I had the stop to myself. But then either the third or fourth day I arrived at the stop, I discovered I wasn't alone. At first, the guy just looked like a construction worker, as he was wearing heavy boots, jeans, and one of those big, warm-looking highlighter pen jackets with the reflective strips on it. I didn't pay him any mind. It was way too early to interact with anyone. So I just stood there under the shelter, just listening to my podcasts. The next thing I know, I feel someone tapping on my shoulder. There was literally no one else around. So of course it was the guy in the construction jacket. So then I take out my earbud, turn to him, and ask him if I can help him. To which the guy repeats, Good morning in this passive-aggressive way. I assumed he thought I was just ignoring him, so I apologized and made it clear that I just couldn't hear him. Only right in that moment, I swear I smelled one of the single grossest smells ever. It was a mix of the guy's breath and his general odor, which I guess I hadn't picked up on at first, because it was so cold outside. If I had to guess, I would say the guy probably hadn't brushed his teeth in a decade and this was sharply evidenced by the state of his mouth. Honestly, it looked like his mouth had died, and was just waiting for the rest of him to catch up. It was truly awful, and I found myself severely pitying the people who had to work with him, not to mention myself, who had to share a bus with the guy. I tried sitting as far away as possible from him, but I swear, he literally followed me right to the back of the bus to sit in the opposite seat. And yes, you guessed it. He tried talking to me the entire time. I know what some of you might be thinking at this point. Just take an Uber or stagger your schedule to avoid the guy. Well, I had already spent $45 on a month's Orca Pass, and I wasn't exactly in the best of financial situations at the time. So, that was definitely guiding my poor decision making. That, and the guy wasn't at the stop every morning. Not at first, anyway. So I figured I would just suck it up and keep using my Orca card. But then he was there another morning. Then another. Always trying to talk to me until it was on the verge of being harassment. Then one day, I get the call saying my car would be ready the following afternoon. Meaning I would only have to take the bus one more time. I was elated. But naturally... My not-so-secret admirer was waiting for me that final morning. I had already asked the guy to leave me alone by that point, but he just wasn't taking the hint. So to try and get back at him, I decided to give his employer a call to see if they knew what he was up to while in uniform. And when I saw in uniform he had a company pass hanging around his neck, and his jacket had the company name on it too. So I looked them up, gave them a call, and told them one of their employees wouldn't leave me alone. I know that these days that probably seems like a super Karen thing to do, 
but to me, it was preferable to getting the cops involved. And all I wanted to do was just scare the guy. Not like actually get him fired or anything. But none of that mattered anyway. Because when I called the company and described the guy, the secretary hit me with, Oh, we fired him months ago. He didn't return his uniform, so we took it out of his paycheck. That's when it hit me that, after that first chance meeting the first week I was riding the bus, he had only been there to harass me. He sure wasn't catching the bus to work, at least not to work for the company whose pass he had. So, the idea that I was totally oblivious to the fact I was being stalked, legitimately one of the worst feelings of my life. The only thing is, as bad as things seemed right then, they were about to get so much worse. So I was back to using my car. About two weeks had gone by, and I was halfway to forgetting about this guy and the whole thing. Then this one evening, I finish up late at work and get home at like 6.45. It's dark. It's cold. I'm starving. And all I want to do is just curl up on the couch and go to sleep. My apartment at the time had two locks each requiring a different type of key. You unlocked the first one, so you could use the second to actually open the door. But when I go to unlock the first lock, it seems like my key is jammed. It wasn't. It's just that the lock hadn't been locked at all. It wasn't out of the question that I had just forgotten to lock it that morning, but it was like a built-in part of my routine. It seemed really odd that I had just neglected to do it. Anyway, I shrug it off, too focused on my planned pre-dinner of coffee and molten hot Pop-Tarts, then walk into my apartment. That's when I smell it. It was that same rotten mouth smell that had clung to this bus guy like a dark cloud. It's weird how your brain just files those kinds of smells away, and the moment you smell them again, certain memories just come flooding back. Well... It was exactly like that as I stood in the dark hallway of my apartment, hand on my heart. I think that's the most terrified I have ever been in my life, knowing that he was close, without being able to see him. I just bolted back out of my apartment, back down into the parking lot of my building, jumped into my car, and called the cops. The whole time, I am locking up the second floor windows of my apartment, just waiting to see him moving around my apartment or something. But there was nothing. It got to the point where I thought I might be going crazy, that maybe it was backed up sewage or something, and I had just had the dumbest panic attack in the history of panic attacks. But still, the cops show up, and I let them into the building, and then direct them up to where my apartment was, telling them that the door should still be open. By that point, I figured they would go in, find a dead rat in my toilet bowl or whatever it was, and then just leave. What happened next will stay with me for the rest of my life. So if you remember, I am watching my own apartment windows from my car while the cops are on their way to search my place. I think that the next thing I'm going to see is the cops walking around my apartment, probably complaining about this crazy person downstairs who is scared of bad smells. Only the next person I see is him, the man from the bus. He's not wearing his jacket or anything, but his greasy gray hair gave him away from a mile off. He literally ducks behind my apartment curtains, probably after the cops had announced themselves, and he tries to stand as thin and still as possible. I couldn't believe he had done something so dumb. They were pretty thin curtains too, so it wasn't like he was fooling anyone. But the moment one of the cops appeared in my window, I watched the guy pull something out of his jacket. I don't know if it was a knife or something else, but the cop was basically wise to the whole thing and tasered him before he could make a move. But the whole time, I am watching the whole thing unfold, feeling completely and utterly helpless, all while screaming, Look out, he's got something! With no one around to hear me. I stayed in my car for everything that followed, and I actually watched the cops leading the guy out of my apartment building in handcuffs. It was like an actual nightmare knowing that he had been waiting in my apartment for me, all after I thought I was totally rid of the guy. 
The only good news was that he had violated probation and was headed back to prison to finish the latter half of an eight-year sentence for the exact same crime, only committed years before. It was a relief knowing there was no chance of running into him for another four years, but it was still haunting to know how close I had come to whatever it was he was planning for me. In a way, I should be weirdly thankful that he didn't take care of himself, because if I hadn't been able to smell him as soon as I walked in, I might not be telling this story right now. Just over a year ago, in October 2019, some real scary stuff went down, and I thought I was going to lose my life. I live with my mom in California, just outside of Sacramento, and I love her so much because she really works hard to take care of me. I am much better now, but a year ago I really wasn't doing so well, and I was dependent on an oxygen mask for my breathing. It wasn't like a face mask or anything, it was pretty discreet. I wore what's called a nasal cannula, which is like the little clear plastic tube that runs up your nose. It was quite uncomfortable at first, but you get used to it after a while. So I had spent most of my time hooked up by PPAP machine, and it was super important that it stayed switched on at all times, or I might suffocate, but if it ever did switch off or break for any reason, I could just switch over to my battery-powered oxygen tank, and voila tragic death avoided. The system was flawlessly safe, or so I was led to believe, because what that system doesn't take into account is that all of a sudden, PG&E might decide it's going to switch the power off to my house. I wake up in the middle of the night, feeling like I am about to have a full-on anxiety attack, and it only takes me a second before I realize that I can't breathe. I brought a hand to my face and felt that my nasal cannula was still in my nostrils, but when I rolled over in bed, I saw my PPAP machine was dark. Now under any other circumstances, I could just unplug from the machine, walk into the spare bedroom, and plug into the battery-powered oxygen tank. But since I was so tired, and whatever had happened to cut the power had happened when I was asleep, I had lost valuable time to make the transition. So. Picture this. I feel like I am about to pass out. I can't see a thing because it's pitch black, and I have to make it all the way across the hall and into the spare room when I feel like I can't make it three steps in front of me. It was the most scared I have ever been in my life. I had a matter of seconds to get to the battery tank. I am making all these wheezing sounds, and I can just feel myself getting weaker and weaker as I made it out of my bedroom and took my first steps into the hallway. I only make it a few paces before I just feel my knees buckling underneath me. I try to crawl, but I can't. And that's about all I remember. Until the next thing I know, I am sucking air through the canula like a crazy person, coughing and sputtering with my mom's voice in my ear. I must have made a whole bunch of noise on the way out of my bedroom, and thankfully, too, because it woke my mom up. She must have found me lying there, figured out what the deal was, then just dragged me far enough toward the spare bedroom that she could plug in my oxygen tube. I just remember lying there, taking these huge, deep breaths until I felt sort of okay again. But that only lasted a moment or two, until the memory of that fear came rushing back to me, and I just burst into tears. We had to drive to the hospital to get me looked over by a doctor. You can get some nasty health complications if you're deprived of oxygen like that. And it's not just the obvious stuff either. Like it can cause blood clots in your arteries from the strain, and those can be fatal. But yeah, I was checked over, and although I was pretty shaken up, I was otherwise okay. But then the whole thing comes out about the blackouts and that caused a lot of controversy. For those that don't know, here in California, it was discovered that some equipment owned by a bunch of electrical companies was causing forest fires. There was this huge fire where almost 100 people died, 
and the fire department found it was started by a power line that had fallen over. Then, companies that catch a ton of crap from federal government, and as a result, they basically made the decision to just cut power off to a bunch of people's homes during wildfire season. And unfortunately for us, our home was one of them. We got off lucky though, like one guy actually died because he was on home life support or something. The power went off, and boom. Massive organ failure. The power cuts affected other stuff too, like nebulizers, dialysis machines, refrigerators that kept insulin fresh. Power companies said that they had been warning people for months about it, and that they should make preparations. But I don't remember hearing anything about it. But yeah, scariest moment of my life right there. Straight up thought I was going to die. But like so many times before in my life, my mom was there to stop me from slipping away. My kid goes to Cooper Elementary here in Vacaville, California. In early October of last year, I drove them off to school, arriving as usual at around 8 a.m. I gave them a kiss, told them I hoped that they had a good day, and off they went to morning class. Nothing out of the ordinary, just like any other day. Only right as I am about to drive off, I noticed something that immediately got my attention and not in a good way. There's a woman standing outside, and she is not coming or going or anything. She's just standing there. She looked middle-aged, maybe Latina or Asian extraction, and she's just sort of watching all the kids come and go. Now the morning rush is usually just that. Parents pulling up, drop their kids off, then leave as quickly as they arrive to get to their jobs or whatever. But there's this woman really chill, just standing there. Then she gets her phone out and starts like pointing it around, almost like she was taking pictures or a video of the whole scene. I got this bad, bad feeling in my gut, like she didn't look like you'd imagine some old creeper to look. She wasn't wearing a trench coat with a ball cap pulled down over her face. She looked kinda motherly, actually, and if she hadn't have just been standing there or recording with her phone, I think I would have completely passed her by. So instead of driving off to make it to work on time, I just kind of sat in my car, watching her. Better safe than sorry, I told myself. And boy am I glad I stuck around, because things were about to get weird. As I am sat in my car watching her, I notice that suddenly she seems to take a sharp interest in something. She puts her phone away and seems to be staring over towards the other side of the school parking lot. I try to spy whatever's gotten her attention, but the place is so busy with the morning rush that nothing really stood out to me. So again, I just sit there, waiting patiently as she starts to walk across the street and over towards this parked car. I have to turn around in my seat to see what she's doing but I am able to watch clear as day as she walks towards one of the cars and opens the back door before reaching in and pulling out this preschool-aged kid who was sitting in the back seat. She doesn't pull hard or anything, just kind of takes the kid by the hand and leads them out of the car, leaning down to say something to them before she started trying to walk off with them. So I jump out of my car, locking the doors before I start power walking over to her. I say, Excuse me, lady, is this your kid? Where are you taking this kid? She turns around, all calm, smiles at me, and then tells me she's a teacher at the school. I mean, it was actually believable for a moment. She had this lanyard around her neck with what looked like an ID on it. Her answer was so confident, too, and actually called the kid by the name Brian, so for a second I felt like I was going crazy and that I had gotten way inside my own head about this, playing at being some vigilante or something. So I respond, Oh, okay, uh, I'm sorry. She accepts my apology and then goes to walk away from the school again. I don't think I would have done anything else about it until I heard another voice behind me shout, 
Hey, what are you doing? I turn around and see this furious looking guy running towards me and the woman. He runs past me, stops this woman and grabs the kid's arm, pulling him away from her. She then starts giving this guy the same speech she just did to me, telling him she's a teacher and she's taking Brian somewhere, how he's a student of hers, etc. What this guy said next made my stomach drop. Brian? My kid's name is not Brian, lady. I'm calling the cops. The guy shouts and in doing so draws the attention of everyone coming and going in the parking lot. Once he realized he had gotten something of an audience, he just starts going off, saying, This psycho is trying to kidnap my kid. Someone get the cops out here. The mood in the parking lot shifts. Every single parent is basically watching their worst fears played out before them. An unsuspecting person trying to abduct a kid in broad daylight. It was honestly sickening. Firstly, the whole act of trying to snatch the kid, and then the kind of mood shift as all these half-awake parents just turn into what was basically a violent mob. But the middle-aged lady was quick. She moved faster than I had ever have expected her to. Out of the parking lot, back across the street, where she jumped into a car and sped off. Parents are taking pictures of her license plate, screaming about child abusers, seriously wanting to rip her apart there and then. I stuck around to talk to the cops, gave a detailed description, along with the dad of the potential kidnap victim, whose kid was just distraught by that point. There was a PTA meeting called about the incident. It was this whole big drama that rocked the small community we live in. And now, just in case none of you believe me, the woman's name was Eileen Karingal. She was 56 at the time of the incident, and she ended up getting followed and arrested by the cops at her home in the 700 block of Christine Drive. The story was sent around the parents of all the kids attending Cooper Elementary in like a matter of hours, and the relief was palpable. I don't think people who don't have kids can really understand just how terrifying something like that is. We are told there are monsters in the world, but knowing they walk among us, looking just like sweet middle-aged women, when they are in fact complete predators, is just chilling beyond belief. Almost 10 years ago now, I am in college down in Florida when I get a call from my ex-girlfriend who I had only broken up with like six months previously. I didn't recognize the number at first as I had switched cell phone carriers not long prior. I have never been one to answer calls from unknown numbers, but since I was in college, I used to get calls from professors, people over at Financial, people inviting me to D&D &D games in dorms, stuff like that so I kind of nervously answer, just sort of hoping it was going to be about something good. I recognized the voice immediately, and as soon as I do, my heart just sinks. There was a reason I hadn't given her my new number, and I wondered just how she had gotten a hold of it. She said, we need to talk, to which I reply that I'm not sure we really do. It had been like six months, and I thought we were out of each other's lives. She responds with, No, we really, really need to talk. Are you sitting down? Because I have something to tell you. She's pregnant. That was my initial thought, and I won't lie. I did feel myself get weak in the knees. So I sit down on my bed, feeling my heart racing in my chest and my hands getting clammy, getting ready to hear the bad news. We got a patient in the ER from a car accident, and she didn't make it. I'm so sorry, but it was your mom. Now, my ex worked as an emergency room nurse, and getting the news like that absolutely destroyed me. I was just in shock. For some reason, I tried calling my mom's cell, but she didn't pick up. Of course she didn't pick up. So I hung up to call my little brother and give him the news. We cried like babies as I told him everything, how my ex had given me the news ahead of time, 
and how our mom wasn't answering her phone. All of that stuff. He confirmed that she had driven over to Walmart like an hour or so ago and lamented not making the most of this last goodbye with her. Then, in the middle of us having some real heart to heart, I hear him shout, Mom! Out of nowhere. She wasn't dead. She just walked through the front door, super confused as to what was going on. Long story short, my ex had lied, and she did so because she wanted to hurt me. Quote, just like I had hurt her. This is about the point that I need to tell you that I did cheat on her with a girl in college, but was at least man enough to admit it and have her break up with me. I'm not saying I didn't deserve some kind of revenge, but man, not that brutal. I live out here in Las Cruces, New Mexico, right on the edge of the Chihuahuan Desert. About once a month, me and a few buddies of mine drive out to the Chihuahuan Desert National Park to drink Coronas and grill up some meat on a campfire. All but one of us are married with kids now, having put our wilder days behind us. So getting out to the nature park every so often is pretty much the only time we get to hang out and escape the mundanity of family life. Don't get me wrong, I love my wife and kids, and I'm pretty happy in my career, but nothing beats hooking up with the boys for a few hours of beer and big boy talk. So this one time, we are out there sinking brews and talking about the Cardinals with hot dogs and jerky, when I find myself needing to sneak off to go pee. I find myself a collection of little shrubs to serve as an impromptu urinal, then unsheath my pork sword and begin to relieve myself. I should note at this point that I'm wearing khaki shorts and boots, so you can picture how this goes down. Right as I finish up and I'm zipping my fly back up, I feel something tickling the hairs on my left leg. I look down, and there is a scorpion crawling up my leg. Now you should know, I am absolutely terrified of spiders and scorpions, like deathly terrified. Anyone else might have just slapped the thing off their leg like a ninja, but I just freeze up completely, watching as the thing continues to crawl up my leg, using the hairs to get higher and higher, until it's in serious danger of sneaking up the leg of my shorts. I had like one last chance to get that thing off me before it disappeared, and unfortunately for me, I simply could not summon the bravery to do so so I was forced to watch as the evil little thing crawled up my shorts. And this next part is why I no longer wear boxer shorts and made a heavy investment into a bunch of snug-fitting trunks in the aftermath of this nightmarish event. Because the scorpion doesn't stop when it's hidden away under my shorts, and I can feel it slowly but surely crawling up my thigh further and further until it reaches the loose opening in my underwear. Now at this point, my buddies are calling out to me and making all these dumb jokes. I wanted to tell them what was going on. Maybe they would have been able to find a way to rescue me from a fate worse than death. But like I said, I was just frozen in absolute terror as I feel the scorpion crawling into my underwear and dangerously close to my junk. By the time my buddy Jay walks over to actually see if I'm okay, I can actually feel the scorpion crawling over my junk as I feel its sharp little legs digging into the sensitive flesh down there. It takes absolutely all my strength to just turn my head to face them, and immediately they know something is horribly wrong. I am sweating. I'm pale. My hands are shaking, and I can barely talk. But I do manage to get out the words. Scorpion on my junk. Jay says back, What did you say, dude? There's a scorpion on your junk? Like, for real? All I can do in reply is nod. Jay runs back to the guys to tell them what's going on, having known from the look on my face that I was most definitely not kidding around, and immediately they all rush over, which is when I notice that Jay has a big gnarly stick in his hand, that he starts holding like a Louisville slugger as he gets close. 
So I'm just standing there, trying to stay stone still, as the boys argue among themselves about why it would or wouldn't be a good idea to smash me in the junk with a stick, in the hopes of killing the scorpion and saving me from perhaps the worst pain that any man could ever experience. And all the while, I have to just stand there and feel every little movement of that scorpion as it navigates its way across my junk, praying that it doesn't opt to just nestle up inside my underwear as its new, fleshy home. The whole time I'm just thinking like, please keep going, please keep going, please keep going, just willing the little guy to keep moving through my boxers and out the other side, which thankfully, it does. I have never been so convinced of the existence of an ever-loving God than I was in that moment, as I felt the scorpion crawl out the other side of my boxers and down my right thigh. Then, as it slowly emerged from the right side of my shorts, one of my buddies leans in and smacks the little thing off my leg in one swift, liberating flash of movement. I let out a full five minutes of terror and anxiety in the moments that followed, marching back up towards the fire in the cooler, screaming out every single expletive that I had stowed away in my memory banks, before downing like two full Coronas and cursing the fact that we didn't have the foresight to have packed anything stronger. Luckily, it didn't take long for us all to see the funny side, with my buddies making jokes about how a scorpion had gotten closer to my junk than my wife had in years. I have to admit I laughed at that one, and the jokes helped break the tension and calm me down. But seriously, that was legit the scariest experience of my entire life. I cannot even imagine the kind of pain I'd have been in if I had panicked and had that little monster sting my junk. And now, when we go out to the nature park for brews and boy talk, I always, always wear long pants. Back when I was in my early 20s, I met a girl who set my entire world on fire. She was smart, beautiful, and had a passion for art. We're going to burn together, she would say. Not in the literal sense, of course. It's just that the romance we got swept up in was without a doubt the most intense thing I have ever been involved with in my entire life. It was like a wildfire, just burning out of control. Nothing had topped it before, and nothing has topped it since. But let's just say that neither of us was in a particularly good place in our lives, and as passionate as the relationship was, it wasn't exactly healthy for the most part. She was very, very possessive, and I am not going to lie, I thought that was kind of hot at first, but that got really old, really fast, and her behavior started to cause arguments between us. She would explode at the mention of any other girl. I once mentioned something to do with my sister, and she immediately interrupted to accuse me of being unfaithful. Even after I explained that the girl I was talking about was my sister, she stayed mad. It just defied all logic. But I was in love, so I stayed with her. So we're together for 17 and a half months and that time included some of the best and worst moments of my life so far. But in the end, the bad started to outweigh the good, and faced with another Valentine's Day with her, I decided I couldn't do it anymore. I made the decision to break up with her, and as you might imagine, she did not take it very well at all. At first, she was in complete denial, saying there was nothing wrong with our relationship, and she had no idea why I was breaking up with her. Then she got angry, like really angry, started throwing around accusations and threats, none of which I thought she was capable of acting on. Then came the tears and the final acceptance, by far the hardest part for me. She was crazy, but I didn't think she was a bad person, and it sucked to have to hurt her like that. She insisted on staying in touch, maybe staying friends or something. But I had to go no contact. It was the only way that we would really get over each other. I felt like a monster, but I did it anyway. 
About a month goes by, and I'm sitting in my apartment, alone on Valentine's Day. I'm sort of over this girl, but I'm also sort of not, and with it being Valentine's Day, I'm thinking about her a whole lot. So when my phone buzzes and I see it's a text from her, I'm like rushing to see what it says. I had deleted her number, but you know when you always just remember the last four digits of someone's number? Yeah, that. So all this message says is, we were supposed to burn together. And that just kind of broke my heart right there. I thought about calling her, maybe try and patch things up. And in retrospect, maybe that's exactly what I should have done. But in the moment, I just tried to stay strong and stick to the no contact rule. I tried to take my mind off stuff, stayed away from all the romantic movies and Valentine's episodes that the TV networks were trying to force down my throat. But still, I just couldn't shake the lonely feeling I had. So later that night, I'm kinda drunk, just sitting on the couch, when my phone buzzes again. I just know it's her, like I knew it in my gut. And surprise, surprise, it was. I debated just quickly clearing the notification and then ignoring the message, but my curiosity got the better of me, and I found myself reading it. I knew the first line said, we were supposed to burn together, again from the notification, but only when I opened up the whole thread did I see that underneath the first part, it said, but now you're going to burn alone. Again, hit me right in the feels. It was clingy, I know, but at the same time, you can't even deny how poetic that is. Poetry, that's all I thought it was. Just that old metaphor we used to share. But I didn't think she would take it as far as she did. I didn't think she meant literally burn. Because sometime after, I'm on my couch, and I start to smell smoke. I go through the stages of like, thinking I've drunkenly forgot that I'm cooking, then thinking the neighbors are burning food on accident, then thinking someone is making a campfire outside or something. Just pure denial, really, not wanting to believe that the apartment building was actually on fire. Then the fire alarm starts going off. I rush downstairs in no shoes or socks, just a pair of shorts and a tiny shirt, and run out the back of the building to the fire assembly point. And on the way, I see smoke billowing out from under the door of the apartment below me. Minutes later, a fire truck is parked up outside the apartment building, spraying water into the apartment below mine, which had been absolutely scorched. It was one of the most surreal experiences of my life. These firefighters are asking me if I'm okay, if I need one of those foil blankets. It was February, and it was freezing outside, and all that could come out of my mouth is like, I know who did this. One of them tells me to get in touch with the police if the cause of the fire was criminal. So I did, because like I said, I had a really good idea of who set that fire in the first place. Like I wasn't quite sure how she had done it, but having my ex-girlfriend text me, you're going to burn alone, and then all of a sudden there's a house fire? That was no coincidence to me. No coincidence at all. Over the next couple of weeks, I had to go and stay in my mom's place while some renovation work was undertaken at my smoke-damaged apartment. But I did get in touch with the police, who thanked me for the tip and said they would get back in touch if the cause of the fire was found to be arson. Only it wasn't. They called a little while later to say that a fire department investigator had determined that some faulty wiring was to blame for the blaze, and so they wouldn't need any testimony from me. I brought up the text messages my ex had sent me, how her words seemed to precede the fire in a way that was just too opt to be coincidence. But again, they insisted that no arson was to blame. I even called her and texted her saying I knew what she had done and that she wouldn't get away with it. But as you can imagine, she played dumb, like, I don't know what you're talking about. You shouldn't be contacting me. It's something that messes with me to this day, and there are so many unanswered questions that frankly, I am not sure I want to know the answers to. I just know that one moment she's texting me, 
telling me I'm going to burn. And the next, my apartment building is on fire. I am not saying my ex broke into the apartment downstairs and did something to the wiring, but it's even crazier of me to suggest that she willed something like that to happen, or like engineered it or something. I know how paranoid that sounds, so I tend not to put that theory out much, but it had such a profound effect on my mind that I still moved apartments not long after, just to be safe. Because to me, there's still something very frightening about that time in my life. Something I can't quite explain. And now, when I remember that old thing she said, we are going to burn together. It doesn't set me alight anymore. It makes my blood run cold. Brooklyn Farthing was born on August 26, 1994. She grew up in the small town of Berea, Kentucky, with her mother, Shelby Walker, her stepfather, Randall Walker, and her two sisters, Tasha and Paige. When she was much younger, Brooklyn had been a Girl Scout and was a loyal and enthusiastic member of the organization for the majority of her life. She received a great deal of praise during her time in the Girl Scouts. She volunteered to make care kits for those affected by Hurricane Katrina, visited the elderly, and spent a lot of her time helping out her fellow Girl Scouts whenever they found things tough. Brooklyn then blossomed into a spirited and lively teenager with a boundless love of the natural world, and especially for anything four-legged and furry. She also had an aptitude for athletics and was described as a tell-it-like-it-is, straight-talking kind of girl which didn't always prove popular with her peers. Brooklyn also had a huge passion for baking and would spend a lot of her nights baking chocolate chip brownies for the whole family. She was a very family and community oriented person and unlike a lot of girls her age, she actually seemed to enjoy spending time around her mom and dad. Two loving parents who thought it was their duty to help pay for their girls driving lessons and eventual tests. On June 21st, 2013, Brooklyn and Paige took their driving tests. While Brooklyn passed with flying colors, Paige failed spectacularly, something that became a bit of a running joke among the Walker Farthing family for the remainder of the day. That night, the family attended their grandfather's 70th birthday party. As he had been gravely ill in the months preceding his birthday and had only just made something of a miraculous recovery, the occasion was important to everyone in attendance and a great deal of enthusiasm was shown by all. Just weeks ago, they thought the man wouldn't see his next birthday, but now here he was, celebrating as heartily as everyone else. After what was undoubtedly a rather subdued and emotional birthday party, Brooklyn and Paige attended another party on Red Lick Road, along with their cousin. This was a considerably wilder affair, given it was attended by teens in their age group and there was rumors of there being a stash of booze at the party. According to Paige, her sister knew the majority of those in attendance, and was extremely excited to get to a much livelier party after hanging out with her grandparents. After drinking and dancing for a few hours, Paige and the cousin decided to leave sometime between the hours of 7 p.m. and 8 p.m. But Brooklyn, who had pre-packed her overnight bag, made plans to stay with a friend who was also at the party, so they could sleep off their hangovers from the judgmental gaze of Brooklyn's parents. Yet it came time to leave. Brooklyn was disappointed to hear that instead of sticking to their plan of a sleepover, her friend had her heart set on spending the night at her boyfriend's house. Naturally, this made Brooklyn rather angry and an intense argument unfolded as a result of this impromptu change of plans. Other partygoers who witnessed the disagreement claimed that Brooklyn was so annoyed that she ditched the party altogether. She had to catch a ride with two men she had never met before that night. The identities of those men are currently being withheld pending results of a police investigation. But what we do know for certain is that when questioned by police, one of the men said that they drove Brooklyn down to Floyd Branch Road, apparently to look at some horses. After that, the man giving the account was dropped back off at his house, 
and didn't see either Brooklyn or his friend again. This other guy took Brooklyn home with him to a house located in the 100 block of Dillon Court, just off US Highway 421. As the house was actually in foreclosure at the time, there would have been no running water or electricity. At around 4 a.m. on June 22nd, Brooklyn called her sister Paige and asked if their cousin could come pick her up from the address at Dillon Court. But their cousin had been drinking heavily and was in no fit state to be driving. So Paige had to pass on the bad news that her sister didn't have a ride home that night, which obviously put Brooklyn in a very awkward situation. She could either call her mom, waking her up and making her drive all the way out to Dillon Court and possibly having her discover that she had been drinking, or she could contact her ex-boyfriend and get a ride home from him instead. Obviously, to Brooklyn, the first option was completely unthinkable, but her ex was working that night and it would be a couple of hours before he could drive out to pick her up. But it seemed Brooklyn was so terrified of being caught drunk that she chose to simply wait it out in a dark, foreclosed home, shacked up with a total stranger. By the time Brooklyn's ex finished his shift and he was able to get back to his phone, he found he had received several messages from her. He opened up the text thread to see that her longer, more drawn out texts had cut down to just a few words time after time. Her messages said things like, can you hurry, please hurry up, and I'm scared. But on the drive over to Dylan's court, Brooklyn's extremely worried ex-boyfriend received yet another message that simply read, Never mind, I'm okay, going to a party in Rockcastle County. Her ex tried to call multiple times, but she wasn't answering her phone. He then sent her a text asking who she was with, but Brooklyn didn't reply. In fact, she would never reply to anyone's text or calls ever again. Later that day, on June 22nd, Brooklyn had made plans to attend a car show in Somerset, Kentucky, with a few of her friends, but she never showed up and wasn't replying to texts or calls. It wasn't like Brooklyn to miss a car show, so naturally her friends were deeply concerned, and instead called Paige in the hopes that she would know where her sister was. But Paige had no idea that Brooklyn hadn't made it home that night, and when she learned the news, she began to panic. After calling to tell their mom that Brooklyn might be missing, Paige began to frantically call around her friends, trying to learn the names of the two guys who gave Brooklyn a ride. Luckily, she got a hold of one of their numbers and managed to actually speak to the guy whose foreclosed house she had gone back to after looking at horses. He was open about the fact that he had been at the party that night, and he even admitted to giving Brooklyn a ride back to his place. But after that, his story began to get a little weird. He said he had left her alone in a house with no running water or electricity because she had felt uncomfortable sleeping with him, apparently having only recently broken up with her ex. The guy said he had respected her decision, but instead of giving her a ride home, or at least calling her a taxi, he chose to leave his own home to give her space. He said the last he had seen of her, she was sitting on his front porch smoking a cigarette and talking about a party she had heard about in Rockcastle County. Paige was immediately skeptical and planned on giving the man's name and number to the cops, should she have to contact them. But just minutes after she hung up the phone, the man called back to tell her that he was scared. He was scared because, according to him, when he had gotten back to his house after giving Brooklyn some space, he found his front porch was ablaze he called the fire department, who promptly drove over to put the fire out. But when he got inside to survey the damage, he found that all of Brooklyn's belongings had been left behind, but that she was nowhere to be found. Paige and Brooklyn's mom rushed to file a police report, and once it had officially been 24 hours since she was last seen, was formally declared missing. The police drove over to the address at Dillon Court to retrieve the items she had left behind there. They quickly noted that the only things missing from the collection were Paige's cell phone and the clothing she had been wearing. Their next move was to check her cell phone records, finding that in the 24 hours she had been missing, she had been called more than 100 times by a plethora of different numbers, a measure of just how worried people were about her. 
and they were right to be worried. According to a statement by the local fire department, the porch fire they attended to at around 7 a.m. on the 22nd was extremely suspicious and appeared to be a work of arson as opposed to a lit cigarette. On the Sunday after Brooklyn's disappearance, Kentucky State Police began conducting interviews. The owner of the foreclosed house where Brooklyn was last seen was obviously amongst those first questioned, but nothing about that meeting has been publicly released. In the early days of the investigation, police requested that property owners in Estill, Rockcastle, Jackson, and Madison counties check their land for any signs of the missing girl. They were told to pay close attention to freshly turned earth and unusual smells, ditch lines, and remote areas, which proves to be a disturbing insight into the minds of police who almost certainly believe she was already dead. Law enforcement officials and volunteers alike searched more than 16,000 acres of land spread out over three Kentucky counties. For three weeks, large-scale searches were conducted in the Red Lick area and nearby Ousley Fork Lake by police with sniffer dogs who were aided military cadets and volunteers on horseback. A team of highly trained police divers were also called in to help search a few large bodies of water, but still nothing was found. A month into the investigation, a fundraiser was held by Brooklyn's family to help fund a cash reward for whoever could help find their daughter. On top of that, a local body shop began selling $5 car deals with all proceeds going to the reward fund. But still, there was no luck finding her. So in July of 2013, as painful as it was to make the decision, the county sheriff declared that all foot searches for Brooklyn were to be called off. And although they wouldn't come out and say it, the police had all but given up on finding her, dead or alive. The investigation and media coverage of the event shifted dramatically when a number of scandals began to severely hamper the efforts to find Brooklyn. A local woman named Amanda Griffey openly admitted to scamming those who wished to donate money to the search. When a number of concerned neighbors were going door to door, seeking contributions, Amanda joined them but all the money she received was funneled into her own private bank account. Amanda only stole a measly $40, but to the local community, it might as well have been a million. Their outrage knew no bounds, and Amanda was shunned by all that knew her after she was arrested for theft of identity of another and theft by deception. But shockingly, it was not the only case of someone exploiting Brooklyn's disappearance. Another person, this one aptly named Randy Gross was also arrested for scamming co-workers out of money, telling them that he was collecting for the Find Brooklyn Fund, yet simply padding out his own account. Brooklyn's parents tried to court the media's good graces again, throwing a benefit at the Madison County Fairgrounds, which featured a car show, in honor of Brooklyn's passion for them, a silent auction, and live music but the scandal had soured the public's affection for the couple's cause, and never again could they get the kind of national attention they needed to make any real progress. Then, in April of 2015, a man scouring the Kentucky backwoods for mushrooms discovered a set of skeletal remains. The police braced themselves for a DNA sample to come back, which confirmed that it was Brooklyn, but it was not her, and her family was filled with hope again that she might just turn up alive. The Virginia Commonwealth Attorney's Office have confirmed their continued interest in the case and are in constant contact with investigators. They claim that a dedicated team have followed countless tips and examined the case file for things that might have been missing or overlooked during the initial investigation, and they say that all tips continue to be followed up on. But despite their best efforts, the case of Brooklyn's disappearance remains open and active. Perhaps the most terrifying thing is that police seem to believe that someone in the local community has information as to what happened to Brooklyn, but whoever made her vanish might actually still be living among them. But even with a $14,000 reward being offered for information leading to her return, or the capture and conviction of those responsible for her disappearance, police are still no closer to getting any definitive answers. 
No answers, but plenty of theories, most of which revolve around the idea that Brooklyn was kidnapped sometime after 4 a.m. She was not depressed, and according to her family, had no reason to run away or walk out on her life. In their eyes, the only reason she could now be missing is if someone had taken her. Police have talked publicly of their deep suspicion that the final test sent to her ex, the one that mentioned the party in Rockcastle County, was faked and sent by someone else, and that since her belongings were left at the Dillon Courthouse, it must have been the place she was taken from. But whether or not the homeowner has anything to do with it is an entirely different question. He did indeed leave Brooklyn alone, in the dark, in a home with no power or water. But does that mean he called someone in to kidnap her, in an effort to detach himself from the crime? Or did a gang of savage predators get lucky enough to barge their way into a house, with no burglar alarms, with a lone, intoxicated female, trying to sleep in an upstairs bedroom? Only the full result of the police investigation will be able to tell us that. In the years following Brooklyn's disappearance from the Kentucky house party, Tasha feels that she needs to be a voice for her sister, and as such, has taken part in numerous interviews regarding her disappearance. She has taken numerous steps to keep her sister's name in the public eye, in the hopes that someone will see the coverage and come forward with information. Currently, her case is classified as endangered missing, and she has yet to be declared legally dead. But it is only a matter of time before the clocks run out, and we have to assume the worst. That through malice or misfortune, Brooklyn Farthing went to a house party one evening and never came home. Electric Forest is an electronic music festival that normally takes place at the end of June in Rothbury, Michigan. Nestled in the very depths of Sherwood Forest, the festival truly is in the middle of nowhere and incorporates all the natural beauty of the towering woodland trees into the experiences of those who choose to attend. By day, fans can roam around the enchanting scenery, hanging out among the pop-up installations or the hundreds of hammocks that hang between the tree trunks. But once the sun sets, they can watch as the forest is lit up by the many light fixtures. And according to many, that's when the magic really begins. The exhilarating atmosphere combined with jaw-dropping light displays and spontaneous secret parties, all matched with a carefully curated lineup, generates a truly unique experience for one and all. It's this particular music festival that 29-year-old Kevin Graves wished to attend during the summer of 2018. Hailing from Oakland Country, Michigan, Kevin bought tickets for himself and his girlfriend, who was instantly sold on the idea of partying in such a unique and unusual place. Both were fans of electronic dance music, but had found themselves tiring of visiting the same old clubs week in and week out. So Electric Forest provided the perfect way to switch things up a little. But after only a day or two of partying among the trees, the blissful feeling between himself and his girlfriend apparently turned sour, and the pair began to argue intensely. Speculation as to the reasons behind these arguments ranges from the couple having run out of money to overconsumption of alcohol, to Kevin having witnessed his girlfriend flirting with other guys. All of the above is up for debate, but what we do know for certain is that after a particularly vicious confrontation, Kevin walked out of the main festival grounds to return to their campsite, alone. Fellow festival goers have reported seeing a man leaving the site who was very upset, possibly even in tears. It's a rather sad end to a tumultuous relationship, but what makes this incident particularly terrifying is that after these sightings, Kevin was never seen again. His girlfriend returned to the campsite several hours later, expecting to find Kevin sleeping off the effects of the drugs and alcohol he had ingested. But when she unzipped the front flap of the tent and peered inside, she found it completely empty. This wasn't exactly a surprise to her though, 
and she figured either Kevin had gotten lost on his way back, possibly even having found another group of revelers to hang out with to help cheer himself up, or that he had headed back towards the main festival compound to either look for her or party some more. So with that in mind, she simply crawled into her sleeping bag and got some much needed rest. The following morning, Kevin still hadn't returned, but again, his girlfriend wasn't particularly alarmed. It was only when the festival came to an end and she had to find her own way home that she actually began to worry. Kevin hadn't seemed to have returned to his apartment either, and to his girlfriend's knowledge, he was still in Sherwood Forest. It was around then that she broke and contacted his close family regarding his apparent disappearance, who in turn contacted the police to report Kevin missing. Law enforcement set about scouring the area surrounding the festival site using every asset at their disposal, using dogs, aerial units, and dive teams, but not a trace of Kevin could be found anywhere. Then they appealed the public to information regarding Kevin's whereabouts, and many people called the missing person's hotline claiming to have spotted him in the days after the festival. Callers stated that they had seen him around other cities in Michigan, as well as in other surrounding states. In some cases, Kevin was spotted at a motel not far from the festival site, in others, at a diner in the same sort of area. There were also suggestions that Kevin had run off to join some kind of religious cult that was in attendance at the festival, given that the colorfully branded bus was said to be present at the event. After some investigation, the group was found to be the Word of God, a charismatic missionary Christian community founded in the late 60s that is based in Ann Arbor, Michigan, but a spokesman for the Word of God denies ever being at Electric Forest that weekend, and Kevin's family insist that it's pretty much out of the question that he would run off somewhere without at least telling them first. The behavior of Kevin's then-girlfriend have also raised a great deal of suspicion among those that investigated his disappearance. In the immediate aftermath, she posted a few grief-stricken posts on Facebook, the kind you might expect to read if Kevin had been confirmed deceased. Yet no body was ever found, and as far as police knew, he wasn't dead at all, just missing. And then instead of cooperating and staying in touch with Kevin's family, as one might expect her to do, she proceeded to block most of them before refusing to answer any more questions with regards to what happened that weekend or where he might have ran away to. According to her, their relationship was on the rocks at the time, so also apparently posted a Reddit comment after his disappearance that claims he was suffering from mental illness and that he had a history of threatening suicide when they had previously come close to breaking up. There is every chance that she simply wishes to move on from a painful period of her life, away from drug and alcohol use, and away from the pain of knowing that she might have contributed to a tragic and unforeseen event. However, there is also a chance that she is so uncooperative because she knows way more than she is comfortable sharing. Police managed to interview a handful of the festival staff that were working during the same weekend that Kevin went missing. Although most couldn't remember seeing Kevin specifically during their time there, as the event is attended by hundreds, if not thousands, of festival-goers. Some told stories of revelers going missing year in and year out. One even told police a story how one person went missing after partying too hard and was found as far away as Alabama. Yet another admitted that it wasn't exactly a rarity for people to die at the festival due to excessive alcohol or narcotics use often people who mix things that really shouldn't go together. He then told police of a rumor he had heard from a few different attendees of a guy who had actually died sitting up. Others had just assumed he was asleep and continued to drink and dance around an actual dead body, becoming extremely distressed when they realized that he was dead and not just passed out. Other members of staff admitted that sometimes they weren't sure if the location of the festival was a safe choice, and they worried that some might be so messed up that they would wander off among the trees wearing very little clothing, only to be subjected to some stormy weather that night and cause them to pass away as a result of the exposure. There was one member of the festival staff who told the police a story that they were initially convinced was Kevin. 
A man who seemed to be very upset by something was going around the main compound, giving away all of his possessions, including expensive electronic items and large amounts of cash. These are in line with reports from Kevin's family that he had apparently emptied his bank account in the week before the festival was due to start. So what actually happened to Kevin at the festival? Was it the case that he was simply so grief-stricken by the breakup with his girlfriend that he had opted to simply up and vanish from Michigan? Perhaps this grief was something that a religious cult could play upon to induct him into their ranks. Or perhaps such a cult would be able to use the heavy amount of drugs in his system to essentially brainwash him into their way of thinking. Regardless of what happened, we can all agree it's an extremely scary prospect that we could end up basically vanishing from the face of the earth after attending something as seemingly benign as a simple music festival. Perhaps we're never truly safe, no matter where we are or what we are doing. I used to work the night shift at UPS as a security guard. The security shed was at the entrance of the gate to make sure no one could get into the facility. The job wasn't hard. I was mostly checking seals on semi-trucks coming in, and when the shifts changed, I'd check in and out the package handlers working inside the facility. Package handlers would have to walk through a metal detector and scan their ID cards in order to enter. Their ID would make a green light go off when they scanned in and we would let them pass. If they didn't have their ID that day, they had to wait with me and my coworkers while one of us contacted a supervisor or HR to let them in. One night, my coworker and I just finished up checking in and out a shift change. I was about to do one of our hourly parking lot checks when I saw someone approaching the shed. I yelled out, Late today? He responded, Yep. And I walked back in to help my coworker check him in. I don't know why I walked back in. My coworker could have easily checked in one late person by himself, but maybe because I yelled out to him, I felt obligated to finish our conversation. When the late guy walked in, I noticed that I have never seen him before, but new people come in all the time, so it wasn't a big shock. As he scanned his ID, I noticed for the first time ever that the green light showed up red, followed by a loud buzz. Shocked, because I have never seen an ID fail. Then, as he passed through the metal detector, it went off near his hip. He showed us his belt buckle and said, Must be this. Protocol when the metal detector goes off is the person removes what is setting it off and tries again, and if it is a belt buckle, they need to empty all their pockets. Against protocol, my coworker lets him in after he removes only his front pockets, but since his ID failed, we couldn't let him in anyways. So my coworker lets him sit down in the shed with us while I call a supervisor. None of the supervisors answered their phones, probably because a shift had just started and they were just busy organizing workers. A few futile calls later, the late guy said, Hey, I'm gonna be super late, can I just go in? I said that he couldn't because I could get fired. He responded, No one is gonna know. But then I pointed up to a camera in the corner of the shed looking at us. His face almost jolted to look at it. I told him that I would try HR. The night shift HR was a pretty cool guy that would chill with us on our breaks. He told us that a night shift HR worker is pretty much just a human complaint box. People just go to him to complain about other people. When he answered his phone, I asked him if he could come out and check the late guy in. He said he was talking to someone and if I could just tell me his name and ID number. I gave him the name and number on the late guy's card. HR told me he'd get back to me. While we waited, the late guy asked us if we had ever seen something crazy while working. I told him no, but my coworker told him a story about a guy with a hatchet in the parking lot. I got a call from HR and when I heard what he had to say, I almost froze. HR told me that the late guy was actually an ex-employee. He was fired because he was involved in a violent altercation with a supervisor. 
HR told me to ask him to leave and to call the cops if he didn't. I didn't know what to say, so I made up a lie that there was only a new supervisor working tonight and no one could verify if he worked here. He then said, Well, let me go get some co-workers that I know so you can tell that I work here. I again pointed to the camera and said, If it's not a supervisor, I would get in trouble. He then responded back, How will I get paid? At this point, I knew we didn't work here anymore, so I told him that I would inform them that he showed up to work and that they will pay him for a full day without him even having to work. Clearly frustrated and out of excuses, he got up and left. As he left, I noticed something in his back pocket. Something that looks like the shape of a small knife. Definitely not a phone or a wallet. The rest of the night was normal. The next day I came to work, my supervisor was there to greet me. He shook me in my coworker's hand and said, Good job. He informed us that the guy from last night came back in the morning and crashed his car through the gate. I guess he was on something, so when he crashed, he went unconscious for a while until the cops showed up. They searched his vehicle and found weapons and duct tape and a shovel. Pretty much a murder kit. He was arrested, and I never heard anything from it since. I quit a few weeks later. I still can't believe I sat in a room with a would-be murderer for over 20 minutes, and I wonder what would have happened if I had just let my coworker check the late guy in by himself. Okay, back in 2016, the Xbox One S came out, which was basically just an Xbox that was 4K capable. Now, this isn't to be confused with the Xbox Series X and S that just came out last year. This is a couple of years ago, when that Facebook marketplace had just started. I picked up one of the newer editions of the console, so I was looking to get rid of my outdated one. Facebook marketplace seemed like the easiest place to do that, since I didn't have an eBay account at the time. So yeah, long story short, that's how I opened myself up to one of the creepiest experiences of my life. So I post an ad for my vanilla Xbox One, set a reasonable enough price for it at $100, then just sit back and wait for the inquiries to come in. As you can imagine, the internet didn't fail to bring out all the anonymously abusive weirdos who told me $30 would be a much more reasonable price, and could I drop the console off at their house, which in one specific case happens to be in the next state over. Basically no one made any serious inquiries, which figured. It was a four-year-old console at that point. I was going to be pretty lucky if I could manage to sell it. Which is why, when I got a message from a kid's mom, saying their kid was really sick and could I perhaps work in a discount for them. I just thought, sure, why not? The first message from the kid's mom was really long and was basically this big sob story about how their 10 year old had this rare disease and they only had a slim chance of surviving. I forget the name of the disease, but I copy pasted the word into Google and it was actually a legit disease with some pretty grim sounding symptoms too. I probably shouldn't have called it all a sob story, but that's exactly what I thought it was at first. But when I messaged back and forth with the lady, then I realized how something that was a throwaway thing for me might actually make her entire family's life so much happier. I went from weirdly indifferent to being seriously invested in this kid having a Christmas he would never forget. So after a couple of days of talking back and forth with this lady, I decided screw it. I'm just going to give it to her for free. I didn't really need the money, and besides, I could just sit pretty on all the good karma I had earned. It's kind of embarrassing to admit how far down the rabbit hole I was with the whole thing. Like I even went out and bought some bubble wrap and some upmarket cardboard packaging designed for shipping electricals. I wanted to be that kid's Santa that year. It's crazy to admit, but my charitable little scheme really did have me feeling good about myself. Which I suppose is why, when it started to unravel, I just didn't want to believe it. 
When the time came for me to get this lady's mailing address, there were a couple of inconsistencies that grabbed my attention, but that still didn't raise my suspicion straight away. For example, at first, she gave me one address, then she gave me another when I asked her to confirm. I did actually confront her on it, but she said she was living in an apartment complex where people would steal packages. Obviously, neither of us wanted to risk the Xbox being stolen, so she would give me an address for a friend of hers who could safely deliver it to them. Totally believable excuse, right? She was a single mom living in a rough neighborhood, and I was lending her a helping hand. Or maybe I should have seen the red flags right there, but was just feeling way too saintly and smug to do so. The thing that tripped me up was the lady had mentioned her kids started some kind of medical treatment for their illness. She mentioned a particular date that it was starting, and that turned out to be the very same day I was to post the package. So I have the console all boxed up, along with the controllers, the wiring, and a few games that would be suitable for a kid their age. I figure it must have been a stressful time for her, seeing her kid getting poked and prodded by all the kinds of medical professionals was probably weighing on her mind, and I thought mailing the console on that particular day might really cheer her up. I tried to keep the whole thing a surprise, but I have never been very good at keeping my mouth shut. And what can I say? I wanted to bask in the glory of my own generosity a little. So I send the single mom a Facebook message that says, Hey, posting the package today. Just want to make sure I have the right address. She then replies with, OMG, you've just absolutely made my day. You're such a sweetheart. Cue some blushing from myself. And I reply, No problem. Hope it makes it over to you okay. Then she replies, The timing is amazing because Franklin starts his therapy next month. Next month. I go back through the conversation to find the message where she said it was on the 25th of the month, that same day that we were texting. Obviously I'm pretty confused by this, and I still don't have any major suspicions. So I'm like, oh, I thought he was starting his therapy today. She explains, no, it's next month, almost like she never told me the 25th at all. Only when I confront her about it, she says, oh yeah, we had to move some dates around. My bad for not telling you. But my spider senses are actually tingling at that point, so I decide to ask her if there's anything she's not telling me. She obviously replies with no, but I decide it would be better to just talk to her on the phone, so I insist on calling. She answers her phone, so I know she's a real person, and she sounded kind of busy and impatient, so I figured I had just gotten her at a bad time. Everything would have gone off without a hitch if she hadn't made one fatal mistake. Right as I am about to hang up, after apologizing for taking up her time, she says, Freddy will be so happy with the Xbox. Freddy? She had been calling her kid Franklin for a week now, and suddenly it was Freddy? It's not even like she could blame autocorrect. It was a phone call. I called back and just straight up called her bluff. I didn't know it 100% at the time, but I sure acted like I did. I told her that I knew she was scamming me and that I would be reporting her to the police. There was some mild resistance at first, a few weak denials here and there, but I could hear the thin veil of wholesomeness beginning to slip with every accusation. And eventually, she snapped. And when she did, it was so vicious that it actually shut me up for a minute. It was a complete Jekyll and Hyde transformation from this sweet, single mom character she had obviously just invented to the soulless fraud she really was. Even though I had just figured her out, she called me a gullible moron for believing her in the first place, called me sad and pathetic and a bleeding heart for wanting to just give away my stuff to a kid that probably wasn't going to live to enjoy it. In this savage tirade, she told me people like me would always be worthless and pathetic, dumb saps that were nothing but marks. I just tried to keep calm, and told her I would be reporting her to Facebook, 
along with sending a screenshot of her profile and display pictures to the police, all before circulating her profile around some of the more populated Facebook groups I was a member of, to warn them of potential scams. But of course, it wasn't a real profile. Of course, she had like 20 more. At least, that's what she said. But my profile was real. Everything I had told her about myself was true. This psycho knew what I looked like. She knew where I lived. She knew all sorts of things about me. And I knew absolutely nothing about her, other than she was willing to stoop lower than low to get things that she wanted. And on top of that, she wasn't above making some hideously graphic threats of violence against me and my family. And stupidly enough, this was back when I had my sister and my cousins listed in my profile as my immediate family. That is what got to me the most, that I had been dumb enough to serve up some pretty intimate family connections on a silver platter. The scammer told me I was truly stupid if I thought the cops would be able to do anything about her, and on the off chance that she did hear from the police, she would send her boyfriend after my family. Now I don't know how genuine a threat that was, but just the fact that she had access to their profiles made me feel anxious and guilty. If they ended up getting hurt because of something I did or didn't do, I don't think I would have been able to live with myself. Obviously, the whole thing ended when I blocked her and got in touch with my cousins and sister, telling them to make their profiles private. I was honest with them, told them how I had fallen victim to a scammer, and I was worried that their personal information might be compromised. After all, this scammer had just assumed someone else's identity in terms of their profile pictures, possibly even their name too, and the idea of them using any of our pictures to set up a new scam profile made my skin crawl. That whole thing was by far the worst experience I have ever had online, and not only am I really, really careful now when it comes to interacting with internet strangers, but I seriously advise that you all be as well. Back in 2003, I was a struggling college student who had grown up in a very expensive California beach town. Rent was, even back then, ridiculous. I have no idea how anybody can actually go to college in this town anymore. But in order to survive, with both college loans and full-time jobs, my girlfriend and I ended up living in quite a few interesting situations. One time we rented half of a restroom in a trailer park, for example. Because it was only $600 a month, 20 years ago. So when this apparent gem of a situation came up on our radar, we were more than excited. It was a small trailer that had been converted to a house at the back of one of the only farms within walking distance of the downtown area, as well as our school. It's hard to describe this place, but I'll try. There was a gorgeous porch that looked over a yard that contained the only functional bath on the property, a huge aloe vera plant, and beyond a grove of trees was an entire organic garden. Again, within walking distance of the downtown area and school. But it was still very secluded. There was no phone in the house, for example. And back then, we could not get cell reception while in the house. We would have to walk about five minutes down the long driveway. But that wasn't the main reason it was so affordable. The main reason was the unfortunate fact that this property was not just very isolated but at the base of a well-known forest area that was frequented by the homeless and drug-addicted community of the area, with no neighbors anywhere nearby. But it was affordable and gorgeous. So me and my 19-year-old girlfriend moved in. Did I mention her nickname in high school was Pamela because of her resemblance to the Baywatch star Pamela Anderson? She would argue that she is actually way prettier because she has Reese Witherspoon's face. I would argue neither because this girlfriend eventually became my ex-wife, but that is a different story. So we moved in. We were extremely excited to live in such a unique location that was both remote yet extremely close to everything and somehow affordable. Who cared if it was a bit funky? 
We were very used to living in funky houses in this area. Anything not funky would require us selling our internal organs or something. Another bad joke. But rent in this house was, and still is, extremely ridiculous. We had only spent a handful of days at this rental before two of her friends came over to visit, and to go for a walk in the nearby forest area. I should add, they both also looked and dressed very similar to my girlfriend. Looking back, the four of us wandering through an area well known to be the home to a large population of the county's homeless and addicted population was probably a terrible idea, but it was a gorgeous area, and we had no way of knowing what would happen later that night. After dinner, her friends left, and we probably watched a movie and then headed back to the back of the house, to the bedroom area. Now, I should describe that the way this house was set up was that you walk into the house via two double doors that opened into the living room. The bedroom area was just a half-sized wall that separated the bed from the living room, and the kitchen and bathroom was off to the side of this main area. Sometime in the middle of the night, I awoke to the two double doors opening. In a flash of an instant, I knew there was somebody in our house. I was in extremely good physical shape, and within an instant, I knew that the only weapon I had access to was my skateboard. It was at the foot of my bed. Something I can only describe as teenage mutant ninja skills took over me, and I knew that I could roll, grab the board, and strike the metal trucks over whoever was coming at us. So I jumped for my board and started screaming at the top of my lungs. Who is this? Who are you? What do you want? He probably thought I had some actual weapon. I looked straight at this guy, in my living room. He was a very large male, dressed in all black, with a black wool cap. He said, There's been a terrible accident. I needed to use your phone. He's dying outside. Then the guy ran out of the same doors he came in. My girlfriend was obviously in shock at this point. We sat there for what seemed like a very long time, but probably only a couple minutes. Then we went outside with our cell phones to begin the long walk down the dark driveway in order to get into cell reception and call the police. I guess we didn't realize that we could have probably dialed 911 and got reception via the emergency service network, though I don't know if that was even a thing back in 2003. As we walked down the long driveway and the only road in the area, we saw no accident. There were no signs of anyone having been there at all. At the end of the driveway, once we got cell reception, we called the police and we waited there for them to arrive. When they arrived, they took a look around the property and gave us the sad truth. There really wasn't anything they could do. He probably ran off into the woods they apologized, but said the only thing they could do would to be come back if he returned. Yeah, it's not the most comforting message. So, we drove to my parents' house, told them the whole story, and slept in my childhood bedroom that night. The following day, we returned, because all our stuff was there, including the two cats. My girlfriend refused to stay the night, but I decided to stay. I ended up sitting in the living room chair with a baseball bat in my hand the entire night. It was the last night that we even attempted to stay there. I am not exactly sure how many days later I saw the following story on the cover of our local paper, but it was within the following week or two. Apparently, there was a serial predator in our town. He frequented the exact area of our rental. and. The sketch was exactly how I would have described the individual that I saw in my living room that night. Okay, so before this whole lockdown thing happened and my dating life was destroyed, I used to swipe through Tinder and Bumble quite a lot looking for girls to hook up with. So I am bored in my Silver Lake apartment one day when I come across this absolute smoke show of a girl who was listed under the name Lilith. She had these big green eyes, wore pigtails a lot in her profile pictures, and had absolutely no qualms with showing off her body. 
She also had this goth girl vibe going, which is something I really find attractive. I mean, she was definitely not the kind of girl I would bring home to mom, but that's not really what I'm looking for when I'm swiping. So naturally, I swipe right. Boom. We match. I think I actually let out this involuntary, no way, when the old, it's a match text appeared, and kind of cynically told myself, no, no way, she's a bot, this isn't real. But yep, it was real. She was so cute to talk to, at first anyway, because things started to go a little different when we actually met up. She worked at this little coffee shop at the Getty, and asked me if I wanted to pick her up after her shift so she could take me somewhere real special, which turned out to be the Museum of Death on Hollywood Boulevard. I mean, not my ideally romantic place to go on a first date, but like I said, she was a slam piece, and it was basically impossible to say no to her. So it was decided, and after I picked her up, she kept it a mystery for a while, only telling me to drive her to Hollywood Boulevard before revealing where she actually wanted to go. The area around the museum is kinda sketchy, but again, I would have driven through way worse neighborhoods for a date with this girl, so I just pushed all my concerns to the back of my mind. Despite the interior being as dark and dingy as it was, looking like an overcluttered basement, the whole thing was actually kind of interesting at first, but I'd be lying if I said my eyes stayed on the exhibits the entire time when they were pretty much glued to her whenever I wasn't going to get caught looking. It most definitely wasn't particularly creepy either, but the things that Lilith started to say to me as we were walking around the place did, in a big, bad way too. Like I said, the exhibits were interesting, but that's all they were aside from being gross and spooky. There were death masks, body parts preserved in formaldehyde, all the things you might come to expect from a place called the Museum of Death, and then some. But this Lilith chick starts saying how pretty some of this stuff is, looking at it the way any other girl might look at a picture of a puppy or something. She then starts asking me all these weird questions about how I'd like to die. Yeah, how I'd like to die. I tell her I wouldn't like to die at all. I mean, it was legit the creepiest question I think I've ever been asked, and she insists that everyone has a way they would most want to die. I don't want to screw the date up or anything. She seemed crazy, and crazy girls can be real fun if you catch my meaning. So I give her some throwaway response like, whatever way is most pain-free. She starts telling me how that was a boring answer, and how she would like to die of hypothermia because it apparently makes you feel all warm and sleepy towards the end. How some victims of hypothermia have even taken their clothes off before they died, and just laid down in the snow or wherever before their hearts stopped beating. She also then gave this long, in-depth speech about how taking another person's life would be better than sex. How that feeling of pure power must dwarf any feeling that drugs or alcohol have to offer. She then tells me how hot she thought it would be to watch me drown at the bottom of a pool while there's an audience and I'm totally naked. How it would actually turn her on to see my final moments of desperation before my body went limp and floated around the tank. Then something about how the Vikings would make wings out of the skin on a person's back by peeling it off and spreading it out. Calling it beautiful, how it was like art or something. When she's done telling me all that, and I am suitably freaked out, she starts calling me Pet, and how she'd want me chained up at the end of her bed so she could do whatever she wanted with me. Now, any other girl and I would think that was kinky, but after what Lilith had just talked about, I really didn't think what she had in mind for me involved any kind of pleasure whatsoever. When it came to driving her home, she actually told me to stop a few blocks away from her house because she didn't want me to know where exactly it was she lived at, saying you couldn't be too careful these days with all the psychos in the world who use these dating apps. Yeah, she said that to me after she spent like an hour talking about all the ways she'd want to die or how she'd watch me die. As soon as I got home, 
I blocked her number. I have never been scared of anyone like that before, let alone a girl I wanted to hook up with. In 2007, when I myself was seven years old, my single mom began dating a man who lived in a campground, and she, my older brother and I soon moved in with him. While most campgrounds are seasonal and not intended for residential use, this particular campground had a large area up front dedicated to campers and a row of trailers in the background that people lived in full time. Most of the trailers were occupied by elderly folks who wanted a cheap place to live that was close to nature, and there was only one other family there with kids my age. It was lonely during the off seasons when no families came to the camp, but during the summer, numerous families would stay there, giving me the opportunity to make new friends, and in some cases, reunite with the families that would visit on a yearly basis. Summers in the campground were lots of fun for a kid my age. There was a large pool in the center of the campground, a pavilion that would host parties practically every night, and plenty of new people coming in and out as the summer progressed. However, this influx of strangers made my mom weary, and she always stressed to me that not all grown-ups were nice, especially given how many were intoxicated during their vacation. Thankfully, I never really encountered anyone truly malicious in the seven years I lived there. A few oddballs and more drunks than I could count, of course, but most people were either nice or simply kept to themselves. However, one summer, a rumor had begun to spread amongst the kids in the campground. I was told that there was an elderly couple visiting that summer that had been caught a number of times, staring into people's windows, following them at night, and even supposedly intentionally walking in on people as they used the public showers. I didn't take this warning very seriously, since scary stories told between kids were the norm in a place like that, and I personally hadn't encountered any creepy old people. I suppose word of this got to my mom, because she reminded me to always close my blinds at night, just in case. Since she began to take it seriously, so did I, until the nights became unbearably hot, and I began keeping my window and blinds open at night, in order to let cooler air into my room. I had gone days without any strange encounters, so I figured the rumors were simply rumors, and continued to leave my windows open at night. One night, I was in bed playing my DS and watching old Disney Channel sitcoms at around 1 in the morning or so when I started to hear rustling outside. This wasn't particularly unusual since we had outside cats who liked to play in the leaves, and it wasn't uncommon for deer, raccoons, coyotes, and other wild animals to pass through our yard, entering and exiting the woods behind the line of trailers. When you live in the country, the nights can be just as lively as the days due to wildlife. However, the rustling seemed to be much louder than I was accustomed to. Whatever was making the noise wasn't nearly as light of foot as a typical animal. My bed was directly in front of my window, so I would have to turn my body completely around to look outside. And I was simply too tired to do so, even if it meant catching a glimpse of an elusive coyote. After a while, the noises stopped so they completely faded from my mind as I continued to play my game. About 15 minutes later or so, I heard an incredibly strange noise. However, it sounded like a fingernail scratching against the mesh screen of my window. I immediately started to feel anxious. The cats couldn't reach my window, and no wild animal would care to come that close to a bright window. Instinctively, I turned around to see what made the noise. Right outside my window was an elderly man, wide eyes and a big, toothless grin, face practically pressed against my window. His expression wasn't at all what I would have expected. He looked so genuinely happy to see me, as if he had been waiting all that time for me to turn around and notice him. Instead of screaming for my mom or my brother, I froze up, just staring at this face in my window for what felt like minutes but was probably more like seconds before I grabbed the blinds rod and rapidly twisted it, closing my blinds and throwing my blankets over my head. I remember trying to take shallow breaths 
as though I were afraid he would hear me, despite already having seen me. I tried to convince myself it was just a hallucination, or maybe even my own reflection distorted, but I knew that what I saw was real. It was inches away from me, separated only by a thin mesh screen. At some point I must have fallen asleep, because as soon as I woke up, I rushed to tell my mom what had happened. She immediately called the campground's owners, pretty close friends of ours, and they informed us that the old man, along with his wife, had already been kicked out. Apparently, after I closed my blinds and shut him out, the old man went to another trailer with an open window, one belonging to one of my neighbors who was also still awake. She called the campground owners who immediately called the cops, and they evicted him, along with his wife, who was apparently making her rounds, peering into the windows of the campers up front. They had been doing this for over a week, and finally had been caught. To this day, I am not really sure what their motives were. It could have been a source of perverse pleasure to them, or it could have simply been an exciting hobby of theirs, seeing how long they could stare at people before they noticed. Regardless, this event shook me quite a bit, and it was a long time before I was comfortable even having my blinds open whatsoever. I was more than willing to suffocate in the summer heat if it meant not risking being spied on again. I lived in that campground for seven years, and my childhood was certainly interesting due to it. I mean, what kid doesn't want to live in a place that's a 24-7 vacation? But the voyeuristic couple who came to visit in the summer of 2008 definitely changed my perspective. Anybody who has ever camped up in the Adirondack area of upstate New York knows just how breathtaking and beautiful it can be any time of the year. Last year, I stayed with my family in a cabin that rested in the mountains. I had recently split up for my longtime girlfriend, and it seemed like a wonderful place to go to clear my head. At first, my theory was correct. It was therapeutic and beautiful being out in nature and it was nice spending some time with my family. One of the really nice things about this cabin was that it was truly separated from any other residence. The closest cabin, or campsite, was probably at least a mile or more away. This meant we had total and complete privacy. Or so we thought. One late afternoon, probably around 5 p.m., we heard some shuffling coming from the front of the cabin. We were sitting on the back porch and heard some movement that sounded like footsteps. A little on edge, my brother and I got up and got ready, just in case we needed to leap into action. All of a sudden, two middle-aged men walked into the back where we were sitting. I asked in a very abrasive and annoyed voice, Hey, what are you doing? Can I help you with something? The men just looked and laughed and said in a cheery voice, why, hello there, young man. My name is Lewis, and this is Tito. We just really wanted to check the view out at this place. We have heard so many wonderful stories. The man seemed sincere, but something just didn't seem right to me. I still looked at them with an uneasy feeling in my stomach. But my mother, who is a very friendly person, made small talk with the man. Perhaps the most unsettling thing of this entire interaction was the friend, Tito, who was just standing around looking at the house, with seemingly no facial movements or anything. Lewis was charismatic, smiled a lot, and made lots of eye contact, where Tito was almost the opposite. After several minutes of small talk, they vanished back out into the woods. I was not a fan of this at all, and quickly let my family know about it. Where were these guys coming from, I thought. As I stated previously, the closest place was about a mile or so away, and the place belonged to the guy who owned the cabin we were staying in, so Lewis and Tito must have been hiking for a little while to get to our cabin, which is not unlikely up in the Adirondacks, but something was off about that entire interaction. It bothered me all night. Around 11 p.m. my family went to bed, and I sat around a fire with my brother and his fiancée. 
Every little noise I heard caused me to jump. My brother told me not to worry about it, and I was just worrying too much over nothing. I pretended everything was okay, but really, I was still uneasy about our unwelcomed visitors. Shortly after midnight, it was just my brother and I around the fire. We decided to let the last few logs burn out before we went inside. This is when Lewis decided to pay us another visit, but this time, he was not so friendly. My brother and I jumped out of our chairs and were now facing Lewis and Tito, who were coming out of the woods. They looked crazy. Lewis did not have that same charming personality as before. His eyes were bulging from his head, and he flashed his pearly white teeth in an almost sadistic way. Tito, who was almost a statue earlier in the day, stood next to Lewis, also smiling, and slowly approaching me and my brother. Lewis started to slowly approach us and said, This cabin really is lovely. I think we will be staying here now. He reached into his bag as if to pull something out. Tito, who was slightly behind him, was already wielding some sort of bushwhacking sword. Not trying to take any chances as to what Lewis was pulling out of the bag, my brother decided to tackle him. He went down with relative ease. As Tito approached my brother with the sword, I ran over and pushed him, strictly only using adrenaline as my motivator. Both men got up and backed away. Lewis, now standing about ten feet away, kept saying, You have no idea who I am and who you are messing with. I built this house. This is my land. After repeating this a couple of times, Tito finally spoke up as well and said in an almost robotic voice, We shall have our land back. We must wait for the right time. Tito grabbed the shoulder of Lewis, and they both ran into the woods. Remember, this is after midnight in the woods, so it was pitch black, other than a soft orange light from the dying fire. We put the fire out rather quickly and went inside the cabin and made sure all the doors and windows were locked. My brother and I stayed up all night and basically watched the property to make sure they did not return. I have never been so happy to see the sun in my entire life. The next day, we went to see the property owner and told him about the entire night. He said he had never heard the two names before and assured me that no Lewis ever built the house. The owner who we were renting the cabin from told us that he had built the cabin 10 years ago. So who were these two that claimed they had built the cabin? The owner was kind enough to refund us the rest of the nights we were supposed to stay at the cabin. I know this could have ended much worse for us, but all things considered, I am very lucky that I left with no more than some minor psychological damage. Be safe everybody, and always lock your doors. You never know who could be creeping around. For some background, there's an app called Life360 where you can add your friends and family on, and essentially you can all see each other's current and past locations. You can set alerts to be notified when someone comes home, or leaves, arrives at work, etc. It's a really great app and I recommend it to everyone. You can never be too safe nowadays. Two months ago, I was at home, waiting for my boyfriend to get home. I got an alert at around 6 o'clock, letting me know that he had left work. It usually took him around 45 minutes to get home. I got up from the sofa and headed upstairs to run myself a bath. My bath was ready in about 10 minutes, and as I was doing other things, waiting for it to cool, I heard a thud downstairs, and through the closed bathroom door, assumed that it was the front door. I shouted something along the lines of, I'm taking a bath. I heard him walking along our very creaky floorboards and assumed he was in the kitchen grabbing some dinner. It was about five minutes later when I picked up my phone to put on some music and realized I never got an alert on my phone from Life360 saying my boyfriend arrived home. 
So I went into the app to make sure, and I kid you not, my blood ran cold when I saw that my boyfriend stopped at a gas station and was still about half an hour away. I could still hear the floorboards creaking downstairs very lightly, as if someone was trying to tiptoe, but was unable to. I had no idea what to do. I called my boyfriend. He didn't answer, and when I didn't hear his phone ring from downstairs, I freaked out even more. I have horrible anxiety, and I could feel an attack coming on. I left the bathroom and walked into the bedroom as quietly as possible. I shoved my desk chair under the knob as it didn't have a lock. I don't know why, but I didn't think to call the police then. I was so focused on getting out that all my other thoughts and senses just disappeared. I say this lightly now, but this was not the case in the moment. I proceeded to basically mission impossible out of the room. We had a shed under the window large enough for me to safely get on top of it and then jump off of it into the garden. The only issue was that I had to make my way down the garden alley where I would have to walk past the large window and door where he would be able to see me very clearly. I was so scared. I kept taking peeks into the window and couldn't see anyone. I felt more confident to run past and took one last peek and he was there looking right at me, not even a foot away from the window. I can't even begin to explain the sheer fear and horror I felt. Looking him right in the eyes, he had such a cold expression, totally emotionless. I ran, didn't look back. I was terrified. I remember nearly tripping in my slippers and having to shake them off so I could run faster. There was a long road between us and our neighbors where I was running to. I did make it. Their lights were on and I started pounding on their window. I was let in and they called the police for me as I was inconsolable at that point. I kept telling them to please call my boyfriend as he was on his way home. When the police arrived, they found no one there. We didn't have any cameras and neither did my neighbors so we had no way of telling when or how he entered and left. I later found out he came through the window. That was the noise I heard, which I assumed was the door, was actually the window that fell downward and shut loudly, after I assume the man came in. There were also some scratches on the top of the chair that I put under the doorknob, signaling he had tried to push it open, but was unable to. There wasn't much of a case, I couldn't ID him. I don't even know what color hair he had, only that he was tall, slim, and a man. I only looked right at him for a mere second, if that. Nothing was stolen either. We have cameras and a security system now, never making that mistake ever again. My name is Riley, and I am a 26-year-old guy from Milwaukee. This story I'm about to tell is true and took place about three years ago. Here's a bit of background information. It was late summer, probably early September, and a group of my friends and I decided we wanted to go on an urban exploration. This was something we had done often in some of the more run-down areas of Milwaukee, usually its northern side. It was pretty risky stuff because of the area's history of drugs, gang violence, and squatters. However, we were always very careful in these situations and had pretty good luck with never running into any crazy people. You could say we were just fascinated about what was inside the buildings and it gave us a bit of a rush. The night we left, there was a small group of us going, five in total. It was me and my friends, Jamie, Kevin, Vin and Ty. We were all relatively the same age, except Ty, who was 29, and had gone to the same high school in the suburb of Bayside, where we had lived. My friend Jamie was the only girl going, and also happened to be the one who would drive us there, because she had a large SUV that could fit us all. She also happened to be Kevin's girlfriend at the time. Anyway, we drove up to North Milwaukee, 
past some very bad neighborhoods and many run-down buildings. The location we were going to was an old elementary school that had shut down back in the late 90s. We had learned about it through an Urban Explorer Facebook group and managed to get in contact with a guy who had been there twice. He told me that the building was quite large and had three floors as well as a basement floor that was completely destroyed due to flooding and exposure. He said that it still had a stage down there where the little kids would perform in plays and musicals. I also remember him telling me that he found some old costumes the kids used to perform in. But he also warned me that there was a lot of black mold and asbestos. Nonetheless, we parked in a large parking lot behind the school that at one point was a busy plaza, but was virtually empty now and was extremely cracked and had weeds growing all across it. We approached the back fence that separated the school playground and the lot. Most of the playground equipment was broken, rusted, or missing. We all walked together to a small opening in the fence by the swing set that would just allow you to get through if you were careful enough. Kevin stood at 6'5 and weighed about 230 pounds, so he knew he couldn't get through. It didn't matter, because we wanted one person to wait by the car so it wasn't broken into, and keep an eye out for cops or any weirdos who came in after us. However, Jamie sort of chickened out due to the weather and wanted to wait with Kevin, so we let her. Ty, Vin, and I got through the fence relatively easily and made our way across the playground towards the back doors of the school. Along the way I noticed a no trespassing sign a few feet away from the fence, but quickly pushed it out of my mind. There was once a chain on the double doors that kept people from entering the school, but someone had cut it long ago and kicked it off to the side where it laid coiled up and rusted. Now I'm going to talk about the weather that night because I think it adds a lot to the story. It was in the high 80s, but it felt much higher due to the humidity. In the distance, I remember there were large storm clouds, so I knew we had to hurry with the exploration. Vin had brought a camera with him and Ty was recording with his cell phone and had a flashlight app open. We never ended up needing the flashlight because enough light was trickling in through the broken ceiling and busted windows. As we entered, the door opened with almost no noise, but the floor was covered with pieces of broken ceiling, paint chips, trash, and dust. The air smelled very wet and musty. The temperature inside felt much hotter and more humid, but we just wiped our foreheads and held our water bottles in our hands. We looked around the floor, which was the ground floor, for about 15 minutes before we decided to move to the second floor. Ty suggested the basement, but the Facebook guy's description and the condition of the staircase changed all of our minds. Vin led the way, followed by me and Ty at the rear. The stairs were covered in debris, so our steps made very loud crunching noises all the way up the staircase. Keep this in mind. We had gone on these explorations many, many times and had never ran into anyone except a very nice homeless woman and her dog many years ago who told us to stay off drugs. You could say we were overconfident and had our guard down. We reached the second floor which had many more classrooms than the bottom floor. Many of the rooms were completely trashed either due to the weather or vandals who had come in. The desks laid all over the floor either broken or knocked over. Most of the windows were boarded up or broken, and graffiti covered almost every inch of the building that we had seen. However, some rooms were spared, and looked as if the students who once sat in them had just vanished into thin air while nature slowly took the building. Many of the desks still had supplies in them, the coat hooks still had coats on them, and the chalkboard still had writing on it. Ty even found a desk plate with a teacher's name on it. It read, Miss Johnson, after we wiped away the dust. I eventually found a folder in one of the desks that belonged to a kid named Kiana. I gathered that she was a girl who was in fourth grade and even saw a date on one of her old assignments that indicated it was from February of 1999. Many of the rooms that were in better shape had things like this, so we eventually got bored and decided it was time to move on. As we approached the staircase to the third floor, I had a strange feeling in the pit of my stomach. 
The kind of feeling you get when you think someone is about to jump out and scare you any minute. I told Ty and Vin about it, and Ty told me not to be a wimp and to just keep moving, because he was starting to hear thunder in the distance. I noticed that it was starting to get cooler in the building, and it was much easier to breathe as we walked up to the third floor. It was here where we would run into a strange and frightening situation. I noticed that the third floor of the school was different from any other floor. The floor had much more trash on it, trash that appeared to be fairly recent. A lot of the old furniture was put in the back part of the first hallway we had turned into and piled, very high. Then, Ty said something that for whatever reason gave me a cold chill up my spine. He noticed that the floor was not nearly as dusty and had fresher footprints than any we had seen earlier. We walked for a few more minutes, and I could tell that we were very nervous about running into someone. Just before we reached a hallway with a lot of classrooms, I decided to text Kevin to see if there was any strange activity outside. He replied within 10 seconds and said that it looked normal, but that it was going to rain any second. I told him to stay focused and message me if anything odd happened. We looked through many of the old rooms and found nothing but trash, old furniture, and rubble. One of the rooms Vin had walked into had half of its floor caved in. He was lucky that he saw it when he did. A few more minutes went by and I heard Ty say, Dude, check this out. Me and Vin walked over to him and saw that he was holding a bag full of old used syringes. The needles looked very old, and the plastic Ziploc bag holding them was torn and tattered. I told him to drop the bag before he got hepatitis or something. We all sort of chuckled and continued to walk down the hall toward the furniture pile. We noticed that behind this pile was a staircase that was completely filled with old shelves, chairs, and tables. To our right was a large room that was relatively clear, but had mattresses scattered about. There were a lot of cigarette butts laying on the floor, and an old rusted oil drum was in the middle of the room. Vin said that the room used to be a library because of a small plaque he had seen above the doorway. It made sense to me why there were so many shelves and chairs piled up right outside. As we got closer to the far end of the room, we examined the mattresses. There were about five of them, and they were all very dirty and torn up. Some had disgusting looking stains and had horrible body odor smells to them. Vin noticed a small stack of dirty magazines by a bed on the farthest side of the room. We all got a giggle out of it. The room had two large windows parallel to each other, but they were boarded up and allowed almost no light into the room. As we got to the back of the room, we heard the sound of music being played. All of us froze in unison as the door swung open. There was a man at the entrance of the door. The look on his face told us that he was not happy that we were there. He was average height, had a shaved head, and a short scruffy beard. He wore a faded brown shirt and some old white basketball shorts. His shoes were white at some point, but now they had a stained brown look to them. He was a white man. His whole body was covered in a thick layer of dirt. I will never forget his eyes. They were a very pale blue and looked like the eyes of a wolf. However, at the same time, I noticed the man behind him who gave me chills. This man never once stood up and sat on a lawn chair with his left shoulder pointing towards us. He turned his head to look at us. The man had bright pink hair tied in a ponytail and appeared to have no teeth at all. He looked very skinny and his skin looked tight and pale. His eyeballs bulged slightly and gave him an even more frightening appearance. He wore a white t-shirt and black shorts. This man never once said a word to us. The man at the door spoke in a very rough and direct voice. He asked us what we were doing in the building and if we were cops. Ty answered first and told him that we were just documenting the old historical buildings in the area and that we had no intention of bothering anyone. The man appeared to relax more and asked us how long we were wanting to stay. I jumped in and told him that we were just about done and that we had to head out before the weather got bad. The man lit a cigarette 
and asked us if we wanted one, but we all declined. He then offered to give us a tour of the building, but we all quickly and in unison said no to the offer. The man's demeanor changed again as a dark and angry look fell on his face, almost as if we offended him by refusing the tour. He eventually chuckled and said, Okay. He introduced himself as Walter and said the pink-haired man was Ronnie. To our surprise, the man cupped his hands as he hollered out quite loudly for someone named Marty. There was no reply, and the bald man said that he must have gone to go number two somewhere. As we talked for a few more minutes, I took out my cell phone and saw that Kevin had messaged me several times. The messages said that a man had walked into the building about a minute ago and that we needed to get out of there as soon as possible. The man asked us how many of us there were altogether. I lied and told him seven, because at this point I was ready to crap my pants and the feeling in my stomach was coming back. There was something off about these guys. Something told me that they were very dangerous. Vin and Ty obviously felt the same way and had very worried looks on their faces. All the while the radio continued to play, but Walter ordered Marty to turn the radio off and that it was giving him a migraine. As he did it, two things entered my head. He said the pink-haired guy was Ronnie, not Marty, and that as Ronnie or Marty or whoever the heck reached for the radio, I noticed a bungee cord wrapped around his arm and a syringe in it. I don't think Walter noticed any of the things I was picking up on, but before anything could happen, another man entered the room. This guy was by far the weirdest and most unsettling of the group. He was fairly short and had medium-length Bieber-style dark hair. His clothes looked much newer, but far too big for him. He had a blue Milwaukee Brewers t-shirt tucked into his oversized red sweatpants. His face looked sharp and leathery, but he appeared to have some sort of skin condition. His eyes were a beady black color and wide open. Parts of his face were a very bright pink, and he had a large amount of bumps on the lower corner of his bottom lip. He spoke in a more high-pitched rural accent. The other two men remained where they had been, Walter in the doorway and Marty or Ronnie in his chair. The new man said that his name was George, and that he was very interested in Vin's camera. He asked what kind it was, where Vin got it, how much it cost, and why he had it. Vin explained that his hobby was filming videos and that he would often photograph at weddings and other events. This was all true, and the man immediately perked up and smiled, the kind of smile that gives you an uneasy feeling in your gut. The best way to describe it would be how the Grinch smiled in the old animated movie. As creepy as that was, this is when it gets really creepy. He asks Vin if he has ever recorded any little girl's beauty pageants or stuff along that line. Vin told him no and the man genuinely looked disappointed. He went on to say some more creepy stuff about how hot the girls in these pageants were and that he would die to be able to be alone with them. Our faces told the story of how we felt hearing this, but the man seemed oblivious. He asked us all if we had any kids of our own. Ty slipped up and told him that he had two twin girls who were two years old. The man giggled in a very creepy and cringy way. He then asked Ty if he ever left the girls alone by themselves or if he had a babysitter. Ty told him that he and his fiance watched the kids the majority of the time but would occasionally have his aunt babysit them if they could not. George asked Ty if he had any photos of the girls. Ty showed him a few on his phone and the man asked a very strange question. He asked if he would allow his daughter to date a guy like him. By this point, I'm sure Ty wanted to drop this creep, but he also knew that the other two were behind us and could possibly have knives or something else. So instead, he said he would have to get to know him more. The man giggled again and said that he could get to know them when he babysat them. The tone of his voice still gives me chills. It was said in such a slow, seductive type of way that left little doubt as to what this guy was. 
I saw Ty's brow drop and knew that he was getting pretty upset. I took my phone out and texted Kevin to honk his horn a bunch of times. As I did this, the creepy weirdo stepped toward me and asked me who I was messaging. He was close enough for me to smell his bourbon breath. I leaned back slightly and told him we needed to leave soon before the weather got really bad. Walter spoke again and said that we might as well stay since the storm would begin any moment and he didn't want us to get wet. Vin explained that we had two friends waiting in a car for us outside. Just as he said that, we could hear a car horn blaring outside. Both the creep and the bald man showed no reaction to what happened and insisted that we stay and invite our friends in. We all stood there and explained that we had to leave, and eventually they agreed. Nonetheless, George insisted that he walk us out, and so we walked and got to the ground floor. As we crossed the floor, we could hear this creepy man muttering to himself and giggle every now and then. We stepped outside and the weather was much cooler. The air smelled of ozone and there was a static feeling in the air as small droplets of rain hit my face. George walked us over to the area of the fence we had entered. Ty slipped out first, followed quickly by Vin. They both stumbled down the steep hill and were waiting for me to go. As I tried to go through the fence, George pushed it against my chest. I was on edge, but it still caught me off guard. I gasped, and he leaned in real close. The smell of bourbon made me turn my head slightly. I will never forget what he said to me in a very quick burst. I know you know what I am. It doesn't matter because I like it. You're lucky that fine girl was in the car with that fat guy or I would have done whatever I wanted to her. As he said whatever, he said it much slower, seductively, and emphasized like he had earlier and licked his lips slowly at the end of the sentence. His beady eyes widened as he let go of the fence. I quickly slipped through and tumbled down to the concrete. I was totally fine, but I looked up to the creepy psycho. Ty, Vin, Kevin, and Jamie were all there to help me up. They all looked up at the man in shock, and Ty hurled an insult at him. George slowly rose up and looked at Ty through the fence. He put his tongue on the chain-link fence and made a licking motion. He winked, giggled, flashed his Grinch smile, and said his last words to us. Or your girls, and gave a very direct point to Ty. It took everything we had to keep Ty from going after him. But eventually we lost sight of George and we got Ty to calm down. We sat in the car as our adrenaline rushes damped and left us feeling exhausted. We told Kevin and Jamie everything we had seen, heard, and felt. It was in the car that we decided to make this our last urban exploration ever. We all agreed unanimously that this was too close of a call. As I sat in the car, I kept thinking about each of the men we had seen. Who exactly were they? They were obviously addicts of some kind, but something seemed off about each of them. The pink-haired man said nothing and was like a ghost. The bald man said little, but his wolf-like eyes spoke so much, and the creepy man couldn't stop talking. I would later try to find these men on a website that posted jail mugshots. I could never find them, until a few weeks ago Vin sent me a link to a sex offender registry website. My heart nearly stopped. Pictured was the guy who said his name was George. He looked much younger and his hair was shorter, but it was undeniably him. He even had the same creepy smile in the photo. However. His real name was Charles Earl Daly. He was a wanted sex offender from Arkansas who was considered to be a very high-risk offender and possibly armed. Reading about his crimes made me want to vomit and made me angry that it had taken us so long to find something on this guy, but I was amazed that Vin had found something. I eventually told the police about how we ran into this guy, but nothing came of it because the old school was officially torn down several months ago, and I had no idea. 
Life has gone on normally. Our groups of friends still talk, hang out, and reminisce about our exploration days. Nonetheless, the number one thing we always talk about is whatever happened to those men. Where is Charles Earl Daly? Who wasn't fortunate enough to escape from these guys? It still sends a shiver up my spine to think about the danger that we were in. A cold, cold shiver. This happened back when I was 14, but even with my bad memory, I remember this years later. I honestly think that this memory will haunt me for the rest of my life. I would often go walking either alone or with my neighbor, Jim, but this specific night, she didn't go with me. I usually went walking around 9 at night, but was impatient that night, so I left about 15 minutes early. It was summer in Texas, but I grabbed my black hoodie anyway. The reason for this was because I was a pretty small kid, even for my age, and I would walk with a knife in my sleeve in case of a problem. There was security in this area, but they were pretty much useless and weren't fond of the kids anyway, so the black was to avoid them seeing me and to maybe help avoid being noticed by anyone else, too. The area was heavily wooded and the roads had no streetlights. I had lived there my whole life, so with the moonlight, this wasn't really an issue. I could see things as much as I needed to. I walked to the park in the area and sat down on the swing set like I had a million times before. The park was old and wasn't very well taken care of, so the swing set creaked. The wooden picnic tables were half rotted with the paint mostly peeled away, and the metal slide was covered in rust. There was the main road that ran in front of the park and a branch off road that ran along the side of the park with a thin line of trees between the side road and park. After a while, a favorite song of mine came on and I, of course, started singing it, since singing was a big way I let out stress despite my stage fright. I had a tendency to not hold back when singing at this park since there was rarely people near it during the day, let alone at night. My blood ran cold though when I saw the shape of a person, maybe 50 to 100 feet in front of me, on the main road. The main reason for the chill was the fear that this random person heard me sing, but then I got a deeper, bad feeling. Something was just wrong about them. I noticed that the person was walking really fast, like really fast, almost running speed. I figured he might have been running from something, or after something, but when I looked around everywhere that I could possibly see from where I was, I saw nothing else but them. They soon passed by the park not seeming to notice me, and after a few minutes of waiting to make sure they were gone, I continued singing. After a couple more songs, I decided that it was time to go home. I still had that bad feeling, that uneasy pit in my stomach that you get when you're being watched. I even thought I saw something behind the tree line between the side road and the swings, but I brushed that off as an animal or something. Deer were really common, so were dogs and things like that, so it was probably me getting spooked by an animal again. But the feeling was eating away at me, so I cut my usual 30 minute to an hour walk to about 10 minutes. So I got up and started to leave the park, turning onto the main road to go home. As I was leaving, I saw a person walking toward the main road from the road that ran alongside the park. It looked like the same person as before. It was a man. He must have been visiting a friend or something, right? Even if that was the case, I crossed to the opposite side of the street so I wouldn't pass directly by him. He didn't look particularly dangerous or unusual, so sadly, no weird creepy homeless looking man for this story. I just got a bad feeling from him, which is probably what makes him even more terrifying. He got to the intersection before me and stopped. I passed by and glanced at the man, taking in what details I could under the moonlight that came from between the tree branches. He looked normal. He was probably an average height, wearing a pure white ball cap with no logos that casted a shadow over his face. 
and a pure white polo type shirt. There wasn't a speck of dirt on the man. He looked well kept and it made the moonlight almost shine on him like some kind of ghost which just added to my uneasy feeling. He watched me as I passed by and I tried to pretend that I didn't notice. I would occasionally look around as if I was just looking at the woods so I could see the man out of my peripheral vision. I didn't want or need to see the man in detail, partly because I was scared of the possibility of seeing something else too. Just because the man was much larger than me didn't mean that he wasn't probably armed too. Once I was around 15 feet past the intersection, I glanced and my stomach dropped as I saw him turn and start to follow me. Maybe he was just going for an extra long walk or something. He probably isn't following me, right? Then another thought popped in my head and sent my stomach to my feet. I had been there for probably 10 minutes or so singing after he passed. What if he wasn't visiting anyone? What if he was the thing I saw just beyond the tree line? That's kind of obvious now that this was almost definitely the case. But let's be fair. When do 14-year-olds ever think through all the details of a situation completely during the situation? He was probably watching me the whole time. He could have snuck up and done God knows what at any time. I kept doing my glances and noticed that he was getting closer and closer. I gripped my knife tighter ready in case I had to use it. The chance of it going well wasn't the best, but it was a better chance than not trying at all. But I wanted that to be a last ditch option. I tried to make sure it wasn't obvious I was keeping tabs on him. I didn't want him getting anxious and having to decide to speed up or whatever his plan was. I was only halfway home and this was before I had surgery on my ankle, so I was absolutely sure he could catch me before I reached the house if I started running where I was, so that wasn't an option whatsoever. I didn't have many current options, so the one I chose was to bide my time until an opportunity opened up. I kept walking at a rather quick but unpanicked pace, keeping tabs on the man as he inched closer and kept an eye out for opportunities and an opportunity came. I saw headlights. A car was rolling towards me at a careful pace, like normal considering the animals I mentioned earlier. It was Jem's dad. I recognized the shape of the lights and as the car got closer, I became convinced it was him. I was never so relieved to see that tiny white car. I tried signaling him without letting the man know I was, but he just passed by. He must have thought I was just saying hi. I glanced back again. Even though he didn't stop, he did exactly what I needed. He slowed down a bit as he passed. The man backed up a lot and crossed to the other side of the road. The headlights were on him and he couldn't see me, at least for around five or six seconds, maybe a bit longer including readjusting to the dark. I walked faster. I didn't run, that way my steps wouldn't be too loud but I rounded the corner before he would be able to readjust and get sight of me again. Once I could turn and no longer see him, I rushed home and locked the door. I knew better than to leave it unlocked since after all, I lived in the woods. Just because I couldn't see him anymore didn't mean he wasn't nearby and didn't mean he couldn't see me. As stupid as this next part is, it's probably for the best that I did it. I texted Jim. I asked her to meet me outside right now because something happened and I needed to come over. She said okay and we both went outside and as soon as I saw her in the driveway I sprinted to her house. I didn't want to be outside any longer than I had to be. She kept panicking and asking what happened and what was wrong and once I caught my breath I told her everything. Right after I got done explaining her dad walked in the house. He looked at Jem seeming worried then noticed me hiding behind her. He looked relieved and told her, I was about to tell you to ask her to come over here. I asked him if he saw the man following me. He said he did. He didn't really see his face, but that he was trying to make it look like he was on the phone when he wasn't holding anything. But that wasn't even close to the worst part. I think this was the first time I have seen this man scared and I am not sure if I have ever seen fear like this from him since. 
He told us the man wasn't alone. There was a gate at the front of where I lived that needed a card to get in. Apparently, there was another man outside the gate who looked similar to the first, standing by a van. That mean they didn't live there, didn't want security knowing they were there, and wanted to get out quickly and quietly after they did whatever they were there for. Needless to say, I spent the night at Jem's that night, and I have no clue what would have happened had Jem's dad not driven by or if I would have left at my normal time. My wife and I traveled back to her hometown in Brisbane, Australia for the New Year holidays to spend some time relaxing in the sun with the extended family and friends. Unfortunately, it was ruined by an encounter with a creep who insisted, with a very vicious persistence, that I wear the party hat that came out of a bonbon I shared with him. For those who don't know, a bonbon is like a party cracker that two people pull from each end and break open. They contain a small trinket like a whistle, balloon, party hat, etc. I knew hardly anyone at the party except for my wife's immediate family, which totaled four people. There were about 20 people gathered. After dinner dessert was served, and along with it some festively decorated bonbons. I was seated next to a man of about 30. He looked relatively normal, except he hadn't touched a drop of alcohol the whole night and as far as I could tell, he was nursing the same ginger beer I saw him with when I first walked in. Apart from exchanging a friendly nod when I sat next to him, we had not said a word to each other. Then the bonbons came out, and I suddenly found myself being presented with one end of it by him. Other guests were already pulling theirs apart, so I obliged and pulled my end. A small folded square of paper flew out and into my lap. It was a party hat, purple, shaped like a crown, and made from what looked like tissue paper. I laughed and offered it to him. He stared pointedly at me, really cold, hard eyes. Put it on, mate, he said. It sounded more like an order. I instantly felt awkward and didn't know whether to laugh at his reaction or not. I excused myself and told him I'd give it to one of the kids, as it was clearly far too small to fit on my head. He did not like this answer. Hey, come on, it's a party. Just have some fun and put the hat on. He was visibly angry when he said it. My awkwardness peaked to an intolerable level, and I told him I'd go find one of the kids to give it to. I found my wife and asked who the guy was. She said she didn't know him, but knew his name was Jono, and took the hat from me. I saw he wasn't seated at the table anymore but was mingling about the room talking to other guests. But as he was talking to them, he would look over at me and even point me out and say something to the person. They looked confused and a little creeped out themselves, by the way. He was making a gesture like putting a hat on too. Then he would screw up his face when looking at me. A little later, I was having a small talk with my wife's brother-in-law when Jono came out of nowhere and said to him, you see this guy here? He looked disgustedly at me. He wouldn't even put the hat on. It's New Year's Eve and he wouldn't even have any fun. Her brother-in-law looked really confused and sort of just steered the conversation back to ourselves while trying to ignore him. As Jono left our chat, he said to me, coming in close to my ear, You'll wear that hat, even if I have to put it on your dead head myself. Well... When someone says something like that, what do you do? The whole rest of the evening was spent in nervous anticipation of another run-in with Jono. He was still there, of course, watching me from one side of the room or the other. Sometimes he would grin and make a weapon with his finger and go bang, 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 silently from across the room. I did, however, come face to face with him again that night as I went to the toilet. It was occupied and I stood waiting by the door. I heard the toilet flush and then the door opened. It was Jono. He looked me up and down, then put his arm across the door frame. Sorry, only for people who wear party hats. He looked defiant, psychotic, and very dangerous. Then he laughed and removed his arm. 
A few moments after I had entered the toilet, there was a massive bashing sound on the door. The door shook on its hinges. Once, twice, then one final time which knocked the door handle off completely. Then Jono screaming at me from outside in the hall. Wear the hat. It's a party. Wear it. Then there was a weird silence. The only sound was the muffled music coming from the living room. Everyone was silent. It stayed like that for a few minutes, maybe more. Then I exited. Everyone seemed to be acting normally, and what's more, there was no Jono to be found. One guest, I didn't know their name, asked me if I had heard the guy banging his head against the toilet door, and I wasn't going to stick around to see if he was still there. I grabbed my wife and made an excuse to leave, and we got out of there. But it didn't end there. The next day, around 3 a.m., there were three or four sharp knocks on my front door. They definitely weren't from somebody's hand, sounded more like a hammer or something heavy. I opened the door very slowly and found no one there. Then I noticed it. Nailed to my front door with a ten-penny nail through it was the purple party hat that I had pulled from the bonbon. We cut our holiday short and flew home the next day. I work in food service, front of house. So in the early days of the pandemic with restaurants closed, I was taking work wherever I could find it. An old friend clued me into a medical office that needed someone to come in and do a bit of light filing. I was able to go in at night to limit direct contact with people, so I jumped at the opportunity right away. Ironically, the medical office job had been the safest gig I had been offered thus far. I wanted to avoid the bus if I could, due to crowds, so decided to swing for a rideshare app. It's not all that expensive in my area, and I really didn't want to get the virus. I headed in at almost 3 a.m. because it was after the cleaning crew had left. I was kicking myself for being so cautious, though, because I was exhausted. I stumbled onto the block looking for my ride, and to my tired self's great relief, the car spotted me almost immediately and pulled up asking, Uber? While I cluelessly wandered up and down the street searching. The ride was taking a while, but I had only just moved here last year, so I'm not familiar with all of the surrounding areas, and thought nothing of it. I was pretty alert at first, so I was trying to pass the time playing games on my phone and stuff, but the car didn't have a compatible phone charger, and I wasn't sure the building would have one, so I wanted to save my battery to be able to call a ride back. I shut my phone down into airplane mode and eventually drifted off from a combination of tiredness and boredom. I don't often take rideshare, so being alone with a strange driver often put me a bit on edge. But this guy had a pretty boring car and a very standard look about him. He looked a little like my brother even. Young, clean kept, listening to jazz. Nothing that screamed, you need to micromanage this trip. When we arrived, the driver tried to wake me up by calling to me from the front, but I was in too deep of a sleep and couldn't fully distinguish it from my dream. Finally, he awkwardly jimmied my leg to wake me up and kept saying, Ma'am, ma'am, we're here now. I was embarrassed that I had been that out of it, so I just gave a hurried, Uh, thanks, and booked it out of the car and into the building. As I looked around, I began to realize nothing was what I had expected of an office park. I had seen a street view of the building when I first looked up the business, and it had appeared to be a strip mall plaza. The further I went, the more loudly alarm bells were ringing in my gut. The structure was semi-dilapidated, and it was pitch black dark past the entryway. I expected some lights to be off in the nighttime, but not to the whole building. I skittered across the concrete foundation comprising what was left of the lobby area, told myself they must just be renovating, and followed signs for the stairs. After what felt like ages but was likely just a few minutes, all I had passed was construction equipment, a couple locked doors, and some smashed windows. 
I was certain I was not going to find a medical office and figured maybe I had mixed up the address. I took out my phone to double check, but once I got it out of airplane mode, I could barely get a signal. I kept moving around in the building, pacing, looking for a stronger signal. I eventually confirmed in my texts that I had written down the correct address just by scrolling back, which didn't require service. Since I had only been inside for a few minutes at most, I figured I would try to get in touch with the driver, because if I entered the correct address, then it was only fair he should continue my ride to the correct place and save me the added fees of calling a second trip, considering this was all his mix-up. The app was taking forever to load with my slow service, but before I could get to a cloud of reception, I heard a rustling sound in the lower level of the building. I was on the top floor, and the only stairwell I was aware of was the one I had taken up, so it would force me into the middle of the building. There was no way to exit the situation without encountering whoever was downstairs. In an abandoned building in the latest hours of the night, I figured the chances were high that it was a tweaker, and I had no desire to try slipping past a tweaker, especially when it was late enough that they were probably on something, so jumpy and on edge. I tried to get a text out to a group of friends with my address and a request to call 911 to help get me from the property because I didn't feel safe walking in that neighborhood at night and didn't have enough reception to call a new ride, but the message wasn't sending reception was too weak, so I gave up on getting my phone going and started checking for another stairwell, or even a window with a balcony or dumpsters that could be used to exit the second floor as a last resort, in the event whoever was downstairs came upstairs. I scrambled over to a door with a stairs sign on it, but the stairs were completely dilapidated, and it was essentially just a straight drop down to the first floor. At that point, the worst case scenario began to unfold. I heard whoever was downstairs begin making their way up the stairs. I thought fast and figured based on my walk, the floor was basically a giant loop, so I would have to wait for whoever this was to come up the stairs, wait for them to come all the way up, and then sprint the opposite direction of wherever they were going and try to get down the stairs and out of the building in time to make it to the road without encountering them. I was not anticipating being chased or anything, but didn't want to piss off a druggie or have a homeless person who might have been living there feel as though I had trespassed and become hostile towards me, or have any sort of interaction that could possibly occur at that hour in an abandoned industrial park. I held my breath for what felt like five minutes, but was likely closer to just 30 seconds, and the person appeared at the top of the stairs. To my great relief, it was just the Uber driver. I figured he had come back for me, realizing he had left me in the wrong spot, a place that could have worked out to be dangerous. So I came out from the beam I was hidden behind and started to wave him down. But then I processed. There was no way for him to realize this had been the wrong address. My stomach lurched forward and my blood chilled to slush. I made eye contact with him very briefly and he was completely calm and composed, but breathing pretty heavily and blocking the stairwell down. On a normal, rational day, as an outside observer, I could think of a dozen innocent reasons he might have returned. But in that moment, standing across from him, I just knew in my gut that this was someone with ill intent. I can't remember much more from the ensuing few minutes. Operating solely on muscle memory and instinct, I superman dove from the second stairwell's opening and just let myself fall down the drop. Thankfully, I don't think he had seen where I had gone at first, and though I was in too much pain to know it then, plenty was bruised, but nothing was completely broken. I scrambled up and threw myself at anything that seemed like it could be the door. It was too dark to tell. I was disoriented from the fall, and I wasn't in a calm enough mindset to think to use my phone flashlight. Plus, in hindsight, some part of me probably knew it would call too much attention to my location. Just before I was able to reach the door, it flew open with a blinding light beaming straight into my eyes. My first thought, though not totally coherent, was, there's another one of these guys, and I stumbled backwards, trying to find something to hide behind. Before I could, a voice called out, 
All right, this is the police department. Everyone get on your knees with your hands in the air. I didn't believe it was the police at first. I was in such a fight or flight mode and had already committed to flight that I continued looking for ways to get out. But he kept shining the flashlight right at me as I teetered around and he yelled, Hey, I said get on the ground. Right now. Hands out. Hands out where I can see them. He sounded so authoritative that I just automatically did exactly as he asked. He approached me and finally shined the light away from me. It took a second to get my night vision, but once I did, I could see he was really a police officer. I tried to explain what was happening, but first he started asking me all these questions, and that, combined with what had just happened and my fear of the driver coming back, all snowballed into my being unable to perform a single articulate sentence. He was even asking easy questions too, like, can you tell me your name? Do you have any knives, needles, or anything that could poke or cut me? Would you rather talk in here or outside? And my total stunned babbling in response at first led him to believe that I was on something. He directed me out to his car, and once I was safely out of the building, I was able to start getting my bearings just a little. I sat on the edge of the back seat of the squad car, with the door open facing out, while he stood across from me and asked the same questions again. The first thing I could think to ask was, Did my friends call you? What did they tell you? And he explained, No, nobody called him. He was patrolling the area and noticed a car idling outside of the building that is known to be condemned and nobody is supposed to be inside. And he said, when they are, they are not up to no good. He was launching into a speech about how if I had gone to shoot up or meet a John, he had resources he could direct me to and that this was not an ideal place to do either of those things and asking if I had somewhere safe to stay that night. But I was stuck on something else he had said. Finally, it all clicked. The car. I spilled my whole rideshare story in a frantic word vomit. He looked around, and the car wasn't there anymore. The officer guessed the guy had driven off while we were talking inside the building. He asked me all the details I remembered, and I told him. But there weren't many. I had been too tired when the ride started to track much. But the officer realized I could pull up my Uber app and get all the information. There wasn't really enough reception there, even outdoors, so we sped down the road and once I had enough bars, the app roared to life. And I had four missed notifications from Uber. They said, Hello, I've arrived. And I don't see you. Can you confirm the pickup address is correct? And I am flashing my hazards. And finally, unfortunately, your driver had to cancel. At first, I thought the driver was so cunning as to pick me up while sending these fake messages and canceling so the GPS wouldn't track us, knowing I wouldn't notice because I was asleep with my phone off and exonerating himself. But instead, I checked the car details, checked again, and it was definitely not the same driver. The person who had driven me there had not been my Uber. My driver was somewhere else on the street when this guy pulled up to me. The policeman took my statement and said they would keep an eye out for the guy, but the best I could give them to go off of was basically, young looking man with brown hair, sideburns, goatee and four door sedan, wearing a zip up sweatshirt, maybe had a hood, which is basically one out of every four guys in this city. I feel so blessed to have survived this near miss. Suffice it to say, I do not take rideshare services anymore. Quadruple check your license plate and driver name. You just never know. A few years ago, I was working as a healthcare assistant at the hospital and recently having moved out of my dad's home, I had started renting a small detached home in the countryside. I had one neighbor on this street, a man in his late thirties who I will call Jake. He was single and lived alone. My first encounter with Jake was when I was moving in. 
My dad couldn't accompany me on my first day of moving due to his work schedule, so I was unpacking by myself. Jake walked up to me, introduced himself, and offered to help with moving my heavy items. I am very small, so I appreciated the help. My first impressions were that he was very kind, open, and polite. He chatted to me about his job, told me that he liked to play instruments and write in his spare time. We bonded over both loving the band Tool, and we both enjoyed playing the bass. The next day, I brought him some beer as a thank you. He wasn't in, however, so I left it by his front door and included a thank you note for all the previous help the day prior. Over the next few weeks as I settled in, Jake would pop by. We would chat about music, discuss shared hobbies, drink beer, and occasionally even watch movies together. I was new to the area and didn't have many friends yet, so he helped provide some social interaction outside of my job. But as you can already tell, things didn't stay so good. I got home one evening to see a basket full of flowers on my doorstep and an included card which read that it was from Jake and he wanted to speak with me when I had the time. I walked inside with the basket. I didn't even get a chance to put it down before I heard knocking at my door. It was around 11 p.m. and I wasn't expecting anyone. I looked through the window next to the door to see Jake waving at me. I opened the door and that's the first time I can recall where I started to feel uneasy around him. He asked if I saw the basket and if I liked it. He asked to come in, but I said something along the lines of how tired I was and that we should just speak tomorrow. He didn't say anything for a few seconds before he asked if I would want to grab a coffee with him before work tomorrow. I said sure and closed the door. That next morning, we grabbed coffee that was close to the hospital I worked at. He seemed very excited and giddy. Soon after, he asked me to be his girlfriend. I had to decline, as we had only known each other for a few weeks. And well, he was significantly older than me. He suddenly dropped his cheery demeanor, as if he had became someone else in a matter of seconds. He grabbed his things and left, saying only that he had to go to work. I went to work too, and tried not to think too much on it. I had to work overtime that night, and started heading home at around midnight. When I pulled up to my home, I saw Jake sitting on my doorstep. I really, really didn't want to get out of my car, but I did, and walked up to him. He started off politely, asking if I had thought over his proposal. I said no, that I'm sorry, but I'm not interested. Once again, as if a switch had flipped, he went off on me, calling me spoiled and ungrateful. I was scared at that point and asked him to leave. He wouldn't. I managed to get to my car with him following me and showed him through the window that I'm calling the police. He swore at me and left. I didn't call the police that night. I gave him the benefit of the doubt, thinking he was just frustrated. One of my biggest regrets was not calling them. The next morning, I found wildflowers that looked like they were picked from a garden at my front door, as well as a post-it note with the word, sorry, and a sad face drawn on it. At work that day, I was called by the nurse in charge, who took me aside, saying my boyfriend was here to see me, as it's urgent. She also told me to tell my boyfriend that he should not come to see me at work again, especially since I wasn't on break as it's unprofessional. It was Jake. He wanted to ask me if I had gotten his flowers and message. I went off on him, saying things along the lines of how dare he come to my work, getting me in trouble no less, pose as my boyfriend. All of this took place in the canteen. He didn't say anything, didn't apologize, I told him to knock it off, and I left. Things only got worse from there. He would often wait for me when I got home, try to bribe me with gifts, more flowers. He even went as far and got me a new guitar. I accepted nothing, and always left everything where he had put it. I eventually broke down to my dad, who asked if I wanted him to speak to Jake. I said no. 
He offered for me to move back in with him, but I had too much pride and declined. My dad was really worried about me. One day, everything came to a halt when I came home to my front door ajar, though not broken. My front room looked absolutely ransacked. I ran to my car and called the police. Nothing was missing, absolutely nothing, but my front room, kitchen, and bedroom were all rummaged through. I told the police I had an inkling it was Jake, who they ended up questioning, but his friend vouched for him and said they were together that evening, so it couldn't have been Jake. I still don't believe that. I tried to tell the police everything that has been happening with Jake and how I was starting to feel very unsafe. However, I had no proof but the notes he had left me, which weren't threatening. So since there was no threat to life or well-being, they literally could do nothing. My dad helped me clean everything up, and I had my locks changed. Jake actually left me alone for a little while after that. I started looking for a new place to live around that time. Then, one evening, I had come home, ate some food, showered, and went to bed, only to be awoken, I'm not sure when, to somebody standing in my doorway. I didn't move. I remember originally thinking I was having a sleep paralysis episode, but after moving my fingers, I realized I was fully awake, with a dark figure clearly standing in my doorway. My phone was under my pillow, so I rolled over to my side, pretending to still be asleep, and I just waited, with my hand under my pillow on my phone. There was no way I could call the police without alerting the person in my doorway. Eventually, I could hear the footsteps fade, and I called the police, only telling them my address and that someone just broke into my home and that I think they're still here. I got out of bed, grabbed the keys on my nightstand, and got out of the house by going out my window and bolting to my car. I had on a tank top and shorts. I didn't even have shoes on, which made driving horrible. I saw him then when I was pulling out, standing in the kitchen through the window. It was Jake. I had a small essential oil diffuser next to the window that shined enough light to be able to tell who the figure was. I drove as I spoke to the police. I remember just completely detaching from reality. At least, that's what it felt like. I drove to my dad's house. After looking over my house, the police drove to my dad's home where I was. I told them everything about Jake, how he had been following me, coming to my work, waiting for me when I got home, and now I was 100% sure he broke into my home and was planning to do God knows what. I was told that they found my front door locked when they got there and went to knock on Jake's door. He answered and looked as if he had just woken up. They asked him some questions and left him alone. It is so unimaginably hard to prove that you're being stalked in the UK. I managed to get a restraining order on the grounds of harassment, with proof that he had come to my workplace posing as my boyfriend, and a co-worker who could support me in this as she had overheard our conversation, where I had asked him to stop following me. I had also saved some texts that he sent me, where I asked how he got my number and told him to stop contacting me, but he went on to send some vaguely threatening messages along the lines of, I'll be waiting when you come home today, which along with the workplace incident, as well as the fact that I had mentioned Jake to the police when my house was broken into, managed to get me my restraining order. I went back to that house once, with my dad and his friend, to gather all my things. I did not see Jake that time, or ever again for that matter. I had to transfer workplaces back to my original workplace as I moved back in with my dad. I am now moved away and live alone again, trying to put the past behind me, but this definitely messed with me a little. I had to get some therapy and found it difficult to develop friendships, especially romantic relationships. He somewhat ruined that for me. I have not made any new friends since. Never had a boyfriend either. I find it very hard to trust people 
outside of work colleagues and family. I have worked for the United States Forest Service here in Texas for just shy of 10 years now. I love my job, and it's rare for anything particularly creepy or scary to occur. But having worked this job for so long, I have my fair share of stories I can share that might just make the hairs on the back of your neck stand on end. For example, we sometimes get jaguars hunting in the forests here. A particularly scary big cat. And that's because of what they do with their prey once they're caught and subdued. So just picture the scene. You're walking through the trees on some bright sunny day when all of a sudden you start to smell something rotten. You look around, but there's nothing to be seen. Just the picturesque view of the pines and the sound of bird song floating through the green. Then something hits the top of your head, something wet. You place your hand on the top of your head, feeling something cold and slimy dribbling through your hair. You bring your hand down to see what it is, hoping that it's not bird crap, only it's something way worse. It's blood. You look up, and hanging up in a tree just feet above your head is the mutilated, half-eaten corpse of an animal, guts torn out, skin shredded, face half-eaten with hooves or paws missing, with broken pieces of bone protruding from cracked limbs. It seems an utterly bizarre thing to do, but the jaguar has a good reason for doing all this heavy lifting. If a jaguar doesn't bother to hoist its kill into the tree, it risks losing its meal to other more ground-based predators or scavengers. Creepy, yeah. But that kind of natural world stuff is nothing compared to some of the other stuff I've encountered during my time in the Forest Service. So this other time, I am on a routine walk through some of the trails to make sure all the directional signs and information markers for tourists are all in order. There's a large rock protrusion about 100 meters off of this trail, like this big sandstone boulder that juts out of the earth that has kind of a shallow cave carved on one side that has been worn away from thousands of years of wind erosion. As I get close, I see a guy in what I first thought was camouflage hunting gear hanging around the entrance. I call out to him, just some friendly greeting, nothing threatening, and he turns to look at me only he doesn't say a word. He just runs off through the trees. I start getting worried about what he was doing in the cave. Terrified he has left a body or something there, and honestly, I was so thankful that he hadn't. But it seems like he did leave something behind. I mean, I'm not even 100% sure it was him that did this, and I have often considered the possibility that it was him that happened across this little find first. And seeing me, he got the idea in his head that it was me that left this there. He got the idea into his head, saw me, and just freaked. But when I walked into that little cave and shined my flashlight around, I saw something that would completely explain why he was so quick to run away, whatever his motivations for doing so were. There was a little circular patch of dirt, one that looked like it had been raked over to clear some space, and in the middle of it all were a bunch of human teeth. I don't know why they were there. I don't know who left them or why, but I did what I could. I gathered them up into a little plastic bag I had on me that had previously contained my lunch and took them down to the nearest police station, giving a little description of the guy that I had seen run away from the cave. I have the usual wild animal encounters, weird noises during the night but I have never forgotten those teeth. I have no explanation to offer up at all, but it certainly does make for a good little scary story. A few months ago, I, 22, was at the local coin laundromat I went late because I had been studying around 10 p.m. The laundromat is pretty small, closer to the edge of the beach town I live in. 
The town is pretty well known for drifters and people experiencing homelessness. Most people are friendly, and there is a lot of drug use, but I had never really felt scared. Everything was fine until I went to move my laundry to a dryer. I was listening to music on my headphones, but not super loudly. Suddenly, I just got the feeling that someone was watching me. I can't really explain it. I just felt the presence. I turned around and there was a man standing just a few feet away from me. He had pink hair, wearing a full face mask, like a ski mask, a hoodie, gloves and sunglasses, even though it was dark out. The gloves and sunglasses especially immediately made me feel uncomfortable. I thought maybe he was a drifter or high, but I didn't want to be rude. I tried to laugh it off and told him he surprised me. He immediately started talking. A lot of it was disjointed and just didn't make sense. He was talking about coming up from Brazil to bring his brother money to get a classic car. None of it made much sense, but he would ask me questions and wait for me to respond, so I tried to just play along. I still thought he was probably just high or something, but he was standing between me and the only door, and I started getting this gut feeling that he was blocking the door on purpose, not just accidentally as he talked to me. He was getting closer to me as he talked, and the feeling got stronger. Logically, something was off, but mostly, I just had this feeling in the pit of my stomach that I needed to leave and keep him talking until I could. I started to edge to the side, but he stayed in front of me, and the feeling got more intense. I started to grip my keys in attack position just in case. He talked more and then backed off a little. He took off his backpack, which was a child's unicorn backpack, and set it on a nearby dryer. I looked over to the door just for a second, and when I looked back, he was pulling something I couldn't see out of it and holding it to the side, behind him, where I couldn't see it. But I did see what was in his backpack. Duct tape. Instantly, it was just like an alarm went off. There was no more worrying about being rude. No more second-guessing myself that he was just off, but harmless. It was like this cold, numb dread just washed down over me. I almost felt calm, like I knew the next steps. Knew I had to do something. Time seemed to move in slow motion, and he turned back to me, not saying anything anymore, and took a step forward. I gripped my keys as tightly as possible and tried to mentally prepare to fight. I remember being afraid that I would move too slow or be too weak, like in a nightmare. But all of a sudden, the door to the laundromat opened and a woman walked in, barely even looking at us as she went in to get her laundry. It was like a scene in a movie, a moment of intensity just interrupted by something innocuous and suddenly, it's over. He just turned, got his bag, and left. I was so scared, I just stayed there a minute until I could get my laundry and just go home. I didn't report it. I never knew what to say since nothing had actually happened. But when I think about it, I think the scariest thing is that he left as soon as someone walked in. If he was just crazy, it wouldn't have mattered. I think a stranger's laundry timer saved me from something terrible. I don't go to the laundromat anymore. I joined a laundry service. The extra cost is worth it to never have to go back. Something recently happened to me, an event which I cannot seem to get my head around. It has left me perplexed and quite frankly, a little freaked out. I live in a small village in the west of Ireland, not far from the border between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. The village has hustle and bustle with around 2,500 people living in the local area. As you can imagine with such a small populace, the community is fairly tight-knit and a person would know everyone pretty well or at least know them by their face. A man from town, who is now deceased, named Jimmy, used to frequent a pub quite regularly where I used to work, and I often had chit-chat with him on the regular. 
In more recent years, I did some training in the local nursing home where Jimmy was a full-time resident. He was suffering from Alzheimer's and was now under constant supervision. While his memory was virtually gone, he never lost his ability to play cards, so during my training, I often spent time playing cards with him, and it goes without saying, I lost pretty much every game. While this information does seem trivial, it is relevant to what I am about to tell you. As I mentioned before, Jimmy is now deceased and is buried in a local cemetery which is adjoined to the church. In the evening I bring my dogs for walks, and one route I often take is through the church grounds and I cut through the cemetery. There is a large view of the village and the valley in which it is situated from the cemetery. The cemetery is on a gradual slope, and as you'd expect, all the graves are in rows. My dogs, who are both Jack Russell Terriers, and in being so, are very feisty, and nothing ever really spooks them. One evening last week, I decided to cut through the graveyard like I often do, but when we reached the gate of the graveyard, both of the dogs' demeanors changed from that of being happy, with tails wagging and general contentment, to get out for a walk to that of which their heads were down and tails between legs and showing stubbornness to pass through the gate. Thinking nothing of it, I pulled the two dogs through the gate jokingly, scolding them and asking them in the quaint country Irish way, what is wrong with you? We walked up the gradual slope, passing by graves of folks who had passed on along the way. Some of the names I recognized and some were unfamiliar. Nothing strange in that. Normally, when I reached the last grave on the slope, I would be passing by Jimmy's grave. I would normally stop for just a brief moment, and in my head I would say to myself, How are you, Jimmy? Now, I am a quality manager at work, so it's fair to say that I do notice a lot of things, and I know for a fact that Jimmy's grave was definitely the last one on the slope, in the very front row. I at least passed it once a week since he passed away, and I know that it was definitely without a shadow of a doubt located right there. The evening in question, as the dogs and I reached the last grave, my heart nearly went into my mouth. Jimmy's grave was not there. I couldn't understand it. A completely different gravestone stood there of a woman who I also knew from the locale. But how could this be? Jimmy's grave was definitely there. My eyes started darting from grave to grave looking for Jimmy's grave in despair. I eventually found it three or four rows back, but nowhere near the top front row where I had seen it before so many times. Miffed about what had just happened, an uneasy feeling came over me, and the hairs began to stand on the back of my neck. Maybe I too was sensing what the dogs had felt earlier. I noticed the breeze had disappeared and the cemetery was eerily silent, as you could normally hear birdsong from the surrounding trees. I couldn't get out of there fast enough that evening. I have since passed through the cemetery, and still Jimmy's grave is still in the mix with all the others, completely out of place of where I know it used to be. I really cannot understand what happened. It's not as if they moved his plot, or that many people have been buried since he was. Reflecting upon this story, I recalled something that happened to me a few years earlier in that cemetery. Every July on the last Sunday of the month, the local priest holds a ceremony called the Blessing of the Graves. As my grandparents are buried there, I would normally attend such an event, not so much for the religious aspect, but just to catch up with my relatives who would attend. Last year I wasn't feeling well on this Sunday, so I actually missed the ceremony. Feeling a little guilty about this, I decided in my free time to go to the grave to maybe say a quiet prayer for my grandparents. I have been to the grave many times as I often help my mother maintain it by weeding and decorating it with flowers, as well as the annual visit for the blessing of the graves. But this particular day, I could not find the grave and I spent a good 20 minutes looking for it. Blaming myself, I just put it down to my own ignorance as to why I couldn't find it. But now in hindsight, I wonder if instead of my ignorance, was there something a little more sinister and paranormal at play?
Montana has to be one of the most beautiful places in the world, and it's one of the last beautiful places in the United States that still feels truly wild. Unlike my native California, where almost every area of natural beauty is plastered with man-made trails, ranger stations, and tourist traps. But I don't mean to offend anyone. I'm sure your favorite hiking spots in Wisconsin or Washington or wherever are amazing. And maybe it is just a little internal bias talking, having watched too many old cowboy movies with my dad. But to me, Montana truly feels like one of the last untouched wilderness areas in North America. A buddy of mine feels exactly the same way about it. So every year around September, he and I would take a trip up to Bozeman to spend some time away from big city life out here in Frisco. We have been friends forever and pretty much spent all of our high school and college days together. But since we have slammed into our 30s and did all the boring grown-up stuff like get married, have kids, focus on careers, we don't have nearly enough time to spend together. So I honestly relish our year trips out to Montana together where we can catch up on stuff, get some serious drinking in, but most importantly, indulge in a mutual hobby of ours that's verged on an obsession ever since we were teenagers. Hunting. Our stomping ground of choice has always been Glacier National Park, right up on the Canadian border. It's about a five hour drive from Bozeman itself, but we make a point of driving out for a few days. One, to get settled into a campsite. Another few to actually hunt. All before a few days of drinking back in Bozeman to celebrate our successes or commiserate our failures. So last year, we repeated the same old ritual, driving out to the national park with our hunting gear in tow. We found a good place to park the truck, hiked a few hours out into the wilderness, and found a decent little spot to set up camp. Every year, we seem to be a little more exhausted when the day ends. Call it just side effects of getting older, I guess. So last year in particular, we passed out pretty early in our one-man tents with the intention of rising at dawn to begin our day's hunt. 6 a.m. the next morning, the little alarm on my wristwatch starts beeping. It's the closest thing we have to that feeling of Christmas morning when you're a kid. It's just pure excitement, jumping out of bed to see what hunting Santa has left among the trees for us that day. We have a little breakfast, drink a little coffee, then pack up and head out. For those of you that are unfamiliar with hunting or nature in general, there are two times in a day when birds sing the loudest, dawn and dusk. It sounds all pretty to us humans, like this wonderful lyrical bird song, but it's actually just pure war cries. What sounds sweet and cute to us is actually them like, I'm here, and if you come up in my tree, I'm gonna mess you up. So back off, other birds, for real. And it's something that soundtracks every morning hunt every single time we have visited Glacier. But that morning, it was almost silent. We could hear the odd squawk in the distance, but our immediate vicinity was as silent as the grave. And that only means one thing, that a large predator is in the area, something that's on the hunt. I remember the look on my buddy's face when he turned to me and stated that exact thing, how I double checked that I had my can of bear mace on me just in case anything happened. But that area of Montana, right near the Canadian border, is known to have wolf packs roaming around. And I shuddered at the thought of what would happen if we were cornered by one. Two aging city boys would be run down in an instant. We wouldn't stand a chance. We would be torn apart and eaten alive right there on the forest floor. Probably before we could even get a shot off. Trigger discipline is probably the most important aspect of weapon safety but I struggled to keep my finger off the trigger of my Remington once I had racked around into the chamber. The fear was palpable. It felt like something was close, real close, and in woods as dense as the ones we were in. Something could be on top of us in just seconds. Then, after another mile or so of walking through the near silent forest, we saw it in the distance. A grizzly, and it was huge. I had never seen one in the flesh before that day, and I was completely overwhelmed by the size of that thing. I mean, they are monsters, in the very sense of the word. Just a flesh tank, a ball of muscle and sinew. 
perfectly designed to chase down, kill, and shred whatever they take a liking to. We watched it staring back at us, like this dull expression on its face before it sniffed the air a little, catching our scent. We must have looked like frightened little boys, but to the grizzly, we were nothing. This was just another day, and we were just another meal, another kill, business as usual. We just slowly walked on, keeping our eyes on that murder machine the whole time, until it was eventually out of sight. We're not dumb. We knew we couldn't just hang around and carry on our hunt with that thing in the area, especially not since it had our scent. So slowly but surely, we made our way back to camp, with the intention of packing up and moving to a safer area. But God laughs at well-laid plans, and about halfway back, as we're keeping our heads on a swivel, trying to keep an eye out for that thing stalking us through the trees, I heard something heavy, bounding towards us. I couldn't see it right away, and frankly, the idea that something so huge could just creep up on us like that is something that is just pure nightmare fuel to me. But stalk us, it did. And in a moment of pure, stomach-churning horror, it knocked my buddy to the ground, as easy as a grown man might knock over a child. I mean, it just sent him crashing into the dirt. And it was on him in seconds. How I managed to miss that thing with my first shot is something I'll never really understand. I am an experienced hunter, and I am a pretty good marksman. But pure panic took over. Crippling fear just had me turning to jelly. The feeling of expecting to see my best friend in the world torn apart before me is something I am never, ever going to forget. I am not military. I have never had any official training. Nothing like that. So I didn't even think to work the bolt action and chamber another round. I just went for the bear mace, spraying it right in that thing's eyes as it slashed its claws across my buddy's chest and face, tearing up clothing and flesh like with deep, gouging strikes. His screams, though, that's what I kept hearing in the quieter moments during the months following that trip. These blood-curdling screams as he thought he was going to die, and not just die, be eaten alive, watch his own guts being torn from his body, and chewed up right there in front of him. But it worked. Somehow the bear mace just worked. It immediately stopped clawing at my buddy, started like wrinkling its nose and doing these weird like sneezes or coughs. I can't really think of any other way to describe it. But what was obvious is that it was in considerable discomfort as the ingredients in the mace went to work on its nose and eyes. Then, as suddenly as it had appeared, it took off again, crashing through the trees, smacking into the one odd or two as it obviously struggled to see where it was going. Then it was just a case of checking on my buddy. But oh my gosh, he was an absolute mess. The bear's claws had torn off chunks of flesh from his face, shoulders and chest, and blood was everywhere. I mean everywhere. I was frantic too. I kept alternating between trying to tend to his wounds and looking around to make sure the bear wasn't charging us again. Like when I think back to it, I can only see certain frames. It's not like a movie in my head. It's like still pictures. Side effect of the adrenaline, I guess. The blood is leaking off my body as I help him to his feet. He was capable of running, but the attack had stunned him, and he shook violently as I pulled him up and started dragging him back in the direction of our campsite. I knew the bear mace, or bear spray, or whatever you want to call it, had worked. But for how long? I had no idea. And so we ran, as fast as our legs could carry us, through trees and over hillocks, until we saw the bright orange fabric of our one-man tents. Another weird memory I have is of my buddy applying his own gauze bandages, like you think the guy would be in major pain at that point, but he was just running on pure adrenaline. That bear had torn him up real bad, but he couldn't feel a thing. It was just pure survival instinct kicking in. He was a survivor, and he wasn't about to go down easy, and in a twisted kind of way, I was really proud of him. By that point, my one major concern was that he'd lose too much blood on the way back to our truck. I mean, he had already left a blood trail from the scene of the attack, 
so the bear would be able to trace our path really, really easily. So I was stuck in a horrendous catch-22 situation. Leave him with his rifle and risk getting attacked again. Or have him come with me to get help and risk bleeding to death or leading the bear onto our trail. But a primal, angry roar that echoed through the trees kind of made that decision for us. The bear was still in the area. Not even that. It was close. And it was angry. I wrapped like half my buddy's head in gauze, taped a bunch of it to his chest, and we got running again. Almost every step we took, I expected that bear to just appear again. Only this time, if it attacked me, my buddy wouldn't have a rifle to be able to take the thing out. Although that fact that the bear mace had worked was actually a huge comfort, so there was no doubt that it would work a second time. But we got lucky for a second time that day first time when the injuries to my buddy weren't as bad as they could have been, and the second when that bear didn't rally for a second attack. We made it out of the park and down to a place called Ennis pretty quickly, visited a medical clinic, got my buddy all stitched and patched up, then actually headed to a bar to just decompress and unwind from the nightmare we had just lived through. Needless to say, my buddy didn't have to buy a single beer that night. Not as he told the story of getting full-on attacked by a fully grown grizzly. We're not sure if we're going on our year trip this September. All this virus stuff aside. I am not sure either of us is quite ready to get back on that horse. But I look forward to the day when we are. I'm not going to let a horrific encounter like that ruin the one thing that's kept us close for so many years. This is a true story. I'm a female, and when I was in my 20s, I went to a retreat in the beautiful Berkshire Mountains in Massachusetts. It was a weekend of lectures and activities on how to live your best life, basically. Little did I know that by midnight, I would be living my worst nightmare. Upon our arrival, we were given a tour of the campus, which consisted of various buildings for lectures and activities dormitories, a cafeteria, and an arcade. We were warned about ticks and that there had been recent bear sightings. I was so mesmerized with the beauty of the place that I admit, I may not have been paying the utmost attention to the tour guide. It was autumn in New England and the leaves were a multitude of colors. Standing on the edge of the mountain, we were able to see a babbling brook below us. I had never been that high up on a mountain before, and the view was insane. The highlight of the tour was definitely the arcade building, which consisted of various game rooms. There were all kinds of games, from a pool table to classic arcade games. After touring the arcade building, the tour guide warned us to be back in our dorms by 11 p.m. We are very strict about lights out at 11 p.m., no exceptions. You must be in your dorm at 11 p.m., so keep an eye on the time. It seemed odd to me that there was such a strict curfew for a bunch of paying adult customers, but I guess they wanted to make sure we got enough sleep to be well rested for the lectures in the morning. After dinner, I decided I would spend the rest of my first day at the arcade building, since there were no activities planned that evening. I had been eyeing a racing game. It was the type of arcade game that you sit inside and there's a steering wheel and you have to stay on the track. Well, this game was extremely engrossing, and I was enjoying myself to the fullest. So much so, that I could not believe it, when the lights suddenly went out. The game went dark, as well as everything else in the building. Could it possibly be 11pm already? I actually spent 5 hours playing this game? No way. I was scared sitting there in the dark. Is anybody here? I called. Nobody answered. Apparently, everybody had their eyes on the clock, except me. I couldn't blame my fellow guests for leaving me behind, because this was a loud arcade, and I was sitting inside a game where they couldn't see me. Plus, we had just met each other, and they had no idea of the headcount. After calling out several times to no avail, I accepted the fact that I was alone in this pitch-dark building. 
Every single game had turned off as well as every single light, and you could hear a pin drop. Terrified, I decided that the best strategy to avoid getting hurt was to hold my hands out in front of me until I could feel the wall and then slide my hands along until I found the door to the outside. It seemed to take hours to get myself to the wall, never mind to get to the door to the outside. I kept walking into things and getting hurt, but finally my hand turned a doorknob that was heavier than the rest, and I knew I had finally found the door to go outside. I was so thankful that my nightmare was about to end. As I opened the door I realized that to my horror, when they said lights out at 11, they not only meant indoor lights but street lights as well. I was standing outdoors in the pitch darkness on the edge of a mountain in an area that had recent bear sightings. All around me as far as the eye could see was pitch black. I had no idea which was north, south, east or west. I knew I was on the edge of a cliff because the babbling brook from earlier kept getting louder and louder, so instead of walking with my hands out in front of me like I did in the building, I decided to crawl to make sure I was still on land. I would put one hand lightly in front of me to make sure there was still ground, and then the other would follow, and then my legs. I had to crawl like this for hours, fearing that I would fall off the cliff at any moment. As the brook got louder and louder, fearing that a bear would come and attack me at any moment, wondering if I would ever be able to find my dorm. I was crying in the pitch darkness. I was praying like crazy. I honestly thought I was going to die. I was either going to fall off the mountain or a bear was going to find me. Or I was going to tire from this crawling that I had to do, which was exhausting physically and emotionally. About three hours later at three o'clock in the morning, I finally saw a light in a window. It must be a dorm, I figured. I was going to knock on this window at three o'clock in the morning and I did not care. I just couldn't take this anymore. I stood there scared that the people would be mad that I was disturbing them at three o'clock in the morning. But on the other hand, I didn't care because I didn't want to die. A man opened the door and I burst out crying and tried to sob out my story. He took pity on me and gave me a lantern and pointed me in the direction of my dorm. By the time I reached my bed, the sun was coming up and it was almost time to attend the lectures. As you can imagine, all I wanted to do at that point was sleep. I was very thankful to be alive. I am telling you all this as a warning, something I wished I had gotten before my visit. A bit of backstory about me, as this will be important later. I am 18 years old and I have to drive out of state to visit my girlfriend, as we met online. This drive usually takes us around an hour and a half, an hour and 15 minutes on a good clear night. This was one of those nights. I was cruising down the empty freeway the lights of a car on the opposite side flashing occasionally. I was listening to some quiet music, taking in the surroundings and enjoying the cool wind blowing in through the sunroof. Now, I will be honest, I wasn't paying as much attention to the road as I should have. I was tired and sick of sticking to my leather seats, so I pulled over to the right side of the road and got out to scratch my legs. I left my car running I wanted to make sure that I could see in front of me with the headlights, just in case anything came out of the woods. By anything, I mean bobcats and bears, nothing supernatural. It's not that I didn't believe in the supernatural, I just hadn't experienced anything. I was parked on the side of the freeway, standing to the right of my car, staring at the pitch black forest and just listening to the sounds of the night. I really don't know why I did it, but something told me that I should look around, that something was off. That's when I saw it, the billboard. It was one of those roadside signs, the expensive ones that big businesses use to advertise. The backdrop was a faded blue with very pale yellow writing on top of it. 
The text read, Ashland Motel, Exit 72. There was nothing inadvertently wrong with this sign. It was so basic and lacking. But something was off. The billboard couldn't be seen from the road. The trees covered it just the right way, making it impossible unless you were pulled over in this exact spot, looking this exact way. Maybe it's just an old sign nobody took down, I told myself. There is nothing wrong with an old motel sign. The place is probably gone by now. I felt like that wasn't right, but it was a pure gut feeling. I wanted to investigate a little bit further, but my body wouldn't move. My legs felt like lead and jelly at the same time, but I mustered the courage to take a few steps forward. That's when I saw the text at the bottom. Vacancy since 2020. I don't know why, but these words sent such a disgusting feeling into my stomach. This sign was altered recently, so why was it so hidden? What purpose did this sign hold if it wasn't meant to be seen by the public? I felt so sick, I just started vomiting off the side of the road. It was uncontrollable. This sign was absolutely the reason for it. When I was sure that I had emptied out my stomach, plus a little bit more, I ran back to my car and jumped in. I have never locked a car door so fast. I am not a religious man, but I prayed that my car would start and I could just drive 90 miles an hour home, as far away from the Ashland Motel as possible. My 1999 Toyota turned over and the fear in my stomach began building again. I stopped turning the key and waited for a second, hoping a brake would help the car start. I looked around and for a split second, I saw him. He was tall, featureless, shaded by the night. His silhouette was pure blackness. It seemed to consume the moonlight. So it was obvious this wasn't just a tree or plant or animal. This was something otherworldly. I retched the key in the ignition again and after desperate pleas to whatever god was out there, it sputtered and started. I slammed my foot on the gas, tires squealing, and I got away from the Ashland Motel sign. This was two weeks ago. The Ashland Motel sign had haunted my mind every day. I told two of my friends about this experience. I didn't want them to think I was crazy, so I left the bit about the tall man out. They, of course, wanted to find the motel. I begged them not to, that it wasn't meant to be found and we should just leave it like that. They told me that they were going, with or without me. Me, being the overthinker and constant anxiety-ridden boy I am, I couldn't think to let them go without me, just in case something happened and I wasn't there to help. We left after dinner time around 5 p.m. The sun was setting, which made me even more nervous. I put the Ashland Motel into Google Maps. Nothing. I looked it up on Google. Nothing. I searched Facebook for a while looking for an address and only found one post talking about the Ashland Motel. The post read, The Ashland Motel, five stars, safe rooms and lively staff. This honestly sounded like someone who was trying to make you think something while meaning something else. My friends gave me a slap on the back and told me that I was overthinking, again. I laughed nervously and agreed, although nothing about this was funny. We ended up putting Exit 72 in the GPS and it began taking us there. I made my friend Ethan drive. I didn't want to have to sit behind the wheel if that man came back. It took us about 35 minutes to get to Exit 72 and we got off right away. Immediately I had a bad feeling. The motel wasn't in sight at all, and I was sure that it wouldn't be, especially because of the placement of that sign. I didn't mention this though, I didn't want to find the motel. Sadly, Ethan remembered my comment about the sign being invisible from the street, 
and decided to just start pulling down blind driveways and gravel roads. We searched for a while until Will, my other friend in the back seat, told Ethan to stop the car. He had seen something in the trees, a small building hidden in the woods. We reversed slowly until we saw it, the rectangular building hidden by the forest, a sign reading, Ashland Motel. My stomach felt sick instantly after seeing this. The words were in the same pale yellow text, somehow looking more faded than the sign on the freeway. There didn't seem to be a road leading to the motel, meaning that we would have to park the car and walk through the woods to get to it. I begged my friends not to go. We had seen the motel. We could leave. It exists. I warned them about the bobcats and the bears, about ticks and bear traps. Nothing seemed to shake their drive to investigate. I knew that I had to go. If the man appeared, I knew that they wouldn't be able to shake off the fear the same way that I would be able to. We all grabbed a torch from the backseat of Ethan's car and began our trek into the woods. The motel was set back about 100 yards and there was no path leading to it. We had to shine our flashlights at the ground to make sure we didn't fall into a large hole or step on a venomous snake. With each footfall, a branch would snap and leaves would rustle under us. Finally, we made it to the clearing and I wanted to run back as soon as we arrived. The building was a pale yellow with a brown roof that obviously hasn't been cleaned in a long time, if ever. We stood at what seemed to be the front of the motel, but there were no signs or roads to guide us. The best way I can describe it, the motel seemed to have dropped from the sky, removing all the trees under it and just sitting there for years. The grass was overgrown. There were vines growing over the lattice, moss on the doors. There were around 10 rooms. Each of the doors were separated by a window and a small empty pot. I was heavily analyzing the motel, speculating the reason for its placement, when I had the same feeling I did at the sign. My stomach lurched and I placed my elbows on my knees. Ethan tapped my shoulder. I didn't move. He tapped me again harder, but he wouldn't say anything. I looked up at him and the color had drained out of his face. He was staring at the forest behind the motel, as if he were mystified by that spot. Will was staring back at the car. Color drained from his face too. Only then did I realize why they were staring with so much fear. The sounds of branches cracking and leaves crunching were surrounding us, like a hundred people were running in a circle around the motel woods. I whirred around, trying to catch a glimpse of what was making the noise, but it was beyond fast, if it was one thing. I couldn't catch my breath. I began to hyperventilate and sweat aggressively. I saw Will begin to cry silently, and Ethan began to apologize for killing us. I had to get it together. I knew I did. That's when the urge hit me again. I felt so drawn to it. I couldn't stop my head from turning to face the motel. I began to sob when I saw them. Pale faces, all of them staring at us from the windows of the motel. They were illuminated by something otherworldly as the rest of the area was pitch black. All the faces had a disgustingly large smile, too large to be human, stretching from ear to ear, each showing too many teeth, all of them perfectly white. The eyes are the reason I am telling this now. They had hollow eyes set into their heads too far back. I realized that I wasn't looking at the eyes, but the lack of them. All of the holes were filled with the same darkness that outlined the man at the motel sign that night. I repressed the need to vomit, but my sobs did not stop. They were deep and uncontrollable. I knew I had to run, 
even if the thing running around the motel would stop us. I just knew that it was better to deal with that thing than whatever was in the motel. Those faces would do something worse than kill us. I knew it. I grabbed my friend's arms and started running. My vision was blurring. The footsteps and crunching got louder and louder. I drowned them out. I could feel myself choking on my own mucus and tears. I screamed to hurry up and we sprinted deeper into the woods. It felt like we were running through the woods for hours as the footsteps echoed around us. Screams flooded my ears. They were louder than any noise I ever heard before. I knew it was coming from the motel. The faces were so angry and hungry and horrible. The screams were so loud, I thought I was going to die. As I dragged my friends through the final stretch of the woods, the screams suddenly stopped. The lack of noise was deafening, but I knew we were still being chased by the forest thing. I saw the car. The stupid Ford Focus was the best sight I had ever seen. We had finally made it, and the footsteps stopped. As soon as we made it to the car, I began to vomit profusely. It felt like I was bleeding from my stomach, and it was too dark for me to check. I couldn't tell if the liquid running down my face was tears, mucus, or blood, and honestly, I didn't care. Ethan was vomiting aggressively as well, sobbing between hurls. Will was on the ground in the fetal position, sobbing. I turned around to look back at the Ashland Motel, and there it was, the Shadow Man, the one who was at the sign, the one who was staring at me. He was illuminated with the same sinister light that cast upon the windows in the motel, but he still was as dark as ever. He had no features, he was taller than me, and he felt sinister. I could tell that he was smiling at us, trying to lure us back in. I grabbed my friends and threw them into the backseat of the car. I didn't want them to see him. I knew they would never forget his darkness. We drove home in silence and eventually arrived. I got my car from Ethan's house and headed back to my house. No matter what I do, the screams still play in my head and I can feel the smile on his face. That's why I'm telling this. Does anybody know anything about this motel? The Ashland Motel. Is it possible to forget all of this? Will he follow me? I don't want to keep seeing this place. Can someone please help? Now, to start this off, I am a 22-year-old dude with lots of energy. So much so that I usually take midnight walks around my house to get me ready for bed, and I cannot sleep before 2 a.m. My parents recently told me that they were going on vacation and that they needed a house sitter. Being the cheap parents they are, they asked me to watch their cabin in the forest 30 miles to the nearest town and 3 miles from the nearest neighbor cabin in the middle of nowhere, all alone, with a lakefront view. Who could say no? I told them goodbye and wished them luck in their trip, and I arrived at the cabin the next day. The first day went well. I fished, swam, and ate good food. But the second day is when the nightmare started. The time was about one o'clock in the morning, and I couldn't sleep. I put on my boots and headed out into the cool night air for a little walk. I walked around the house a couple of times and stood by the edge of the thick forest. Just when I was about to head back to go back to bed, I heard footsteps in the trees. Now I am used to deer being everywhere around my house, but the footsteps sounded way heavier than a normal deer. Being the curious guy I am, I threw a rock in the thick brush to see if it would run off. Silence. At first, then I heard something I wish I didn't. Laughing. 
not from a normal person, but from someone who sounded insane. Then the same rock I threw was thrown right back at me. I never ran so fast in my life. I ran to my truck. When I started the ignition and the headlights came on, I could see a bald man still laughing, standing in the same spot I was just standing. I sped until I reached the end of the long driveway. I then called the sheriff and had to wait for about an hour. When they got there, they thought that I was just joking, but when they checked where I told them to, they found rope, a knife, and a faint bloody trail leading to another cabin far away into the trees. Inside was just a bunch of scribbles like a child does, and a rag covered in blood. The police looked all around and even checked our cabin, but this person was never found, to my knowledge. The next day, my parents canceled their trip. I still wonder whose blood was in that cabin, and what would have happened if I didn't find the man in the woods. This is something that happens constantly to me, and I am actually at work typing this out, because it just happened again. Three months ago, I started working at a packing warehouse. I'm the youngest one here, being only 19, and there's barely any other females here. The women's bathroom literally has only one stall, and since the virus, it is supposed to be one person in the bathroom at a time. This wasn't a problem for a while, until one of my coworkers, we'll call her Jane, started following me into the bathroom. At first I didn't care, as sometimes she would come in while I was in there, and I would see her feet by the door. I just assumed she was waiting to go. Then I started to notice she would only go as soon as I went in. I gave her the benefit of the doubt for a few weeks. Up until recently, when I would see her standing right in front of the stall while I was in there, I could see her through the cracks and she would just stand there, still, with a blank expression. I thought she was just a creep. Other people started to notice when she would literally just leave the bathroom and I would go in after her, and she would just go right back in. She only did this with me, and when I left, she would leave without using the bathroom. All around the factory I see her staring at me. This weirds me out so much, but she hasn't really done anything else. I mean, we have never even spoke to each other. Until about five minutes ago, she came in again while I was in the stall. She walked closer to the stall door and started to tap it. She kept whispering, I want to come in with you. I'm freaked out, so I yelled at her, no. She started to raise her voice, still saying she wanted to come in. I screamed at her to leave. I was just scared for my life, thinking that she would just slide under the bottom. She just laughed and said she'll see me tonight. I'm getting off super late tonight, and I live alone. I don't know what to do. The nightmare I am about to share is one I had from age 6 to age 9. However, I didn't find out it was more than a nightmare until two weeks ago. I hope you enjoy. When I was 6, my mother and I moved into an older home. It was in good shape for the most part. It was a one-story home with a sunroom, nice backyard, attic, and unfortunately, a basement. It had two bedrooms, so after my baby sister was born, we ended up sharing a room. It wasn't long after we moved into the house that I started having a messed up nightmare. It was the same one over and over again. I was laying in my bed when a man would come into my room and grab me by my leg. He would then start dragging me off my bed and onto the floor. When he got to the top of the basement staircase, he would stop for a moment then continued dragging me down the stairs. 
I would scream in my dream. But he never stopped. The basement was all white. White walls, white tile flooring. There was a dentist chair, an old vintage one. He would pick me up and slam me down into it. As he would start applying the restraints to my wrists, ankles, and my forehead, I got a good look at him. He was dressed in all white. White long lab coat with one of those round silver things on his forehead. The only thing not white was his dark brown dress shoes. He was an older man, white facial hair. There was a long white table with jars and jars all lined up, with teeth in them, and the gums were still attached. He had an empty jar and his tools all laid out. He then grabbed a knife and started cutting into my gums. There was blood everywhere and I was screaming. It would always end right before it felt like I was going to die. I never watched scary movies as a child, so my mother couldn't figure out why I was having this dream. I would wake up with tears running down my face, wondering why I am having this nightmare. When I was nine, we moved because my mother got married. I haven't had that dream since. Fast forward to two weeks ago. My husband and I were talking about the homes we grew up in. That got me thinking about that house, so I looked it up. Luckily, I was able to pull up the house's history online. I loved reading about it. It was amazing. Until I seen that a man who was very close with the family not only helped get electricity into the home, but also used to rent out the basement for a while. He was a man of science and had a career at a local university as a professor. Very well respected. He even shared my husband's last name, but was not related. I looked him up to show my husband, but once I saw his face, I screamed and covered my mouth. My husband asked me what was wrong, and I told him about the dream, and then said, that's the man who would cut out my teeth. This was a few years ago, and I don't expect many to believe me considering it was also Friday the 13th. It was my best friend's birthday the night before, and he had just turned 21. Mind you, we were all around that age at the time. I am now a newly 26-year-old male, and what happened later that night still sends shivers down my spine. We had a compact but close friend group back then, and had planned to visit our local pub to celebrate his birthday. The night went on, and as we shared our experiences, talked, and ultimately had fun, which was the most important thing, we arrived at the pub around 8.30 p.m. and got kicked out at 12 a.m. due to closing reasons. After that, we chatted for a bit more outside the pub before walking home as we were all pretty drunk. The night was silent and dark, but thankfully not stormy. My house was on a slight hill in what I assumed a safe neighborhood before this happened. Let me quickly say that I was living with my aunt at the time. I was walking down the street when I noticed someone dressed in black, head to toe, in my peripheral vision. They had their hood over their head, so it was next to impossible to capture their identity in the dim streetlights, but they seemed to be in their mid-30s to 40s with a more muscular build. They were on the adjacent street from mine and coming towards the intersection I was walking through. I didn't think much of it as I thought he was out walking home or out somewhere. So I continued to walk and was almost home by this time. It was around 1.30 a.m. when I turned around to see the same guy I saw before following me. I was a little alarmed, especially since I had been drinking a couple hours before and my paranoia senses were elevated. Needless to say, I have always been paranoid walking anywhere late at night. I started to pick up the pace to get some distance from him, and to my surprise, he did as well. That's when I knew I was in a fight or flight response situation. Instead of trying to act all tough and risk getting myself jumped, or possibly worse, 
I decided to sprint down the street since my house was on the corner of it. Of course, he was right behind me. I ran up my driveway, slamming the gate behind me before abruptly opening the back door and almost shaking the whole house trying to lock it. What I didn't notice is that the motion sensor light we had connected to our garage didn't turn on when I came into range of it. I found this to be odd since we always kept on top of its battery life and the light was extremely sensitive to motion. The next morning, when I felt it was safe enough to exit the house, I checked the motion sensor light and was shocked to see that it had been intentionally covered and turned towards the garage so that it couldn't be activated. I felt a severe pain in my chest when I realized that the man had more sinister intentions planned for me. I went back inside and checked with my family members, and none of them had touched the light after I left for the pub. What happened Friday, October 13th, would be the first and last time I have ever seen that person. What confuses me still today is how he knew I lived at that house. I used to be in the Boy Scouts and spent many summers working on a camp staff as the pool director. Another staff member named Chris and I arrived two weeks before the camp opening for the summer to clean the pool, check equipment, and get all of the canoes and rowboats out of the storage and cleaned up. The rest of the camp staff would not arrive until the next week. It should be noted that before working on staff, I had camped here for about 10 years and never had one single problem. This is a 600 plus acre camp that we both knew like the back of our hands. When you first enter the camp, you drive up a long road about two miles long and drive into a large gravel parking lot. At the front of the lot, off to the right, is a large lodge with a gravel road that goes in two directions, straight ahead or to the right. By going straight, you can drive either to the dining hall or continue past and continue down the road past many different campsites in four different cabins on the three mile drive down. Ultimately, this road leads you to the back winter entrance to the camp at the lake, where there are additional cabins and a parking lot. There are lots of trails throughout this area that led to all of the different campsites and cabins. About three quarters of the way down this road, there is an amphitheater surrounded by large cliffs with caves. Many of the trails crisscross through the cliffs and back to the top of the camp. The dining hall was located about 100 yards from the lodge. At the edge of the parking area, about 75 yards downhill from the dining hall, is a large swimming pool where the showers and changing rooms are located. About another 100 yards down the hill is a large pine forest where the staff campsite was located. The staff area had several small ponds around it and several large cabins with a road leading back to the camp's top. After working outside the entire day, Chris and I get cleaned up and meet his mom and dad in the nearest town for dinner. Dinner was great, and we returned to the campsite around 9.30 p.m. As we walked down the road to the staff area, we decided that instead of sleeping in the cabin, we would sleep in the staff tents that we had already set up because it was warm outside. All of a sudden, we heard a truck turn down the gravel road. At first, we thought it might have been the ranger coming to say hi, as he knew we were there, but it did not sound like his truck at all. Luckily, the cabin we were standing in front of was back off the road, so we could not be seen. We hurried behind the cabin to the back entrance, unlocked the door, entered, and locked the door. Thankfully, we never had the lights on, however, the windows were open. As we snuck over to the window, we saw three trucks parked with four guys standing in front of them. None of them was anyone that was on the camp staff or that we had ever seen before. We thought at first that maybe they had a legitimate reason to be there. All of a sudden, we heard one of the men say, Where'd they go? I saw them come down here. At the moment, I knew they were looking for us. The cabin was empty, so we knew that they would see us if they came to the doors or windows. Luckily, there was a storage room across from the bathroom at the opposite end of the cabin. 
that had a door in the floor with a ladder that led underneath the cabin, as it is about six feet off the ground. If they tried to get in, we at least had an exit. We heard the people at the front and back entrance knocking on windows, telling us to come out. We quietly crept down the ladder and moved slowly to the opposite end of the cabin, and we were able to slide out the end where a piece of the lattice was missing around the edge of the cabin. Once out, we had to quickly decide if we run up the road to our cars, which was about a half a mile away, and risk them catching up to us in their trucks, or turn and run down one of the many trails in that area. At least we had the advantage of knowing the place if they decided to run after us. We snuck out from under the cabin and began walking towards one of the trails that was about 50 yards from the cabin. About halfway there, someone screamed, They're over there! We began running down one of the trails that we knew led to the middle of the camp, where there were many campsites, cabins, and areas we could hide. We could see flashlights running behind us and on the trails next to us. We quickly jumped onto another trail that led up to the amphitheater, where there was a hidden trail that led to the top. We knew we would be safe there, because we would be able to see anyone that was walking up the trail. We finally made it to the amphitheater, and to the top of the cliffs where we stayed for, what seemed like, forever, but was only a few hours. We kept seeing flashlights off in the distance. Finally, the flashlights were moving towards the lake, opposite where we were. We took the back trail which took us around the far back side of the camp and to the top, where the lodge and dining hall were located. It took about 45 minutes to reach the top. We then slowly walked back to the staff camp so we could get our keys. The staff area was about 200 yards from the parking lot where my car was parked, which is a different lot next to the archery range, which had a separate exit. We ran to the car and drove out of there as fast as we could. We drove to the camp ranger's house, which was at the very edge of camp by the main road, and told him what happened. He called the local sheriff. When they arrived about 40 minutes later, they searched throughout the camp and never found anyone. We never did find out who it was. We also never had any trouble the rest of the summer. I worked there the next two summers without issues. When I was about 16 or 17 years old, I was walking home from a party being held at my friend's house. The streets were dark and eerily empty as I strolled down the road that led to my home. The beeping of the watch I wore then notified me of the passing of the hour, and I glanced at it to confirm the time. 3 a.m. I didn't normally go to parties or come home so late. In fact, I can count the times I came home after midnight in high school with one hand, but I was a good kid, and my parents knew my friends well. All I had to do was let them know who I would be with, what time I would be back, and give them a call before I left my friends' houses, and I pretty much had no curfew. As I wasn't really accustomed to coming home so late, I wasn't used to the empty streets. They were normally bustling with people playing and living their lives. The emptiness gave the walk a creepy vibe. I was about two short blocks from the bridge that led to my house when I saw a hooded figure step off the bridge, headed in my direction. One thing you should know about that bridge is that it was a hot spot for mugging and other violent crime. I was always told never to walk on that bridge at night and to go around the long way. I did mention I was a teenager at the time, however, so of course, I didn't listen. Seeing the hooded figure made me wish I had, however, as even from afar, he gave off a threatening vibe. I decided that I was a tough guy, and if the guy started with me, I would finish it. I continued toward him. Big mistake. As I drew closer, the strangest thing I had ever witnessed happened. From either behind or out of that hooded figure, Another hooded figure came forth and fell in line with the first. Then, out of the second, a third emerged, and from the third, a fourth. 
I couldn't believe what I had witnessed. It was almost as if the first guy multiplied into four people. Either that, or they were walking in such a perfect sink that you could not see one behind the other. There were four hooded figures, all dressed the same, with the same height and weight, walking toward me in a perfect cadence. I have seen my share of creepy stuff before that day, but nothing like that. Every instinct in my body was shouting for me to flee, and I decided at that moment that I wasn't as tough as I thought. I began to cross the street to take the long way around, and they also began to cross. It was clear that they were matching my movement. I picked up my pace and got to the corner before they did, almost at a jog. At one point, I was close enough to get a look at them, but all four of their faces were obscured by their hoods. I couldn't even see their chins or noses. It was just darkness, almost as if they had no faces. I was just about to start sprinting in abject terror when suddenly I found my backbone and decided I would not run from whatever they were. I took a deep breath and summoning all my courage, I turned around to face them. They were gone. I looked around for them but they were nowhere in sight. They had completely disappeared. There was no place they really could have gone, however. They weren't close enough to any buildings to have gotten into. In fact, they were right behind me. I didn't spend too long searching for the creepy hooded figures, however, and ten minutes later, I was home. As soon as I entered my house, my mother comes from out of her bedroom and approaches me and asked, Are you okay? And thought maybe she didn't remember me calling her before leaving my friend's house. Uh, I'm fine, Mom. We spoke an hour ago. I told you I'd be home at this time. You did, she confirmed. But after I spoke to you, I fell asleep. Then suddenly I was awoken by an angel that told me, Your son is in danger. Come with me. My mother was and still is a Christian, as am I, so hearing her speak about angels wasn't uncommon. But her saying she went somewhere with one wasn't your average dinner conversation in my house. The angel led my spirit into a room where there were a bunch of other teenagers that were chanting around a table, and they had a picture of you on the table, and their words sounded foreign. It felt like they were trying to send something after you, my mom explained. I swallowed hard. What happened next? I asked her hesitantly. The angel prompted me to step forward onto their table, so I did, and suddenly, I was wearing this beautiful white gown, and the kids that were chanting could see me, and they all fled, in terror. I think I disrupted whatever they were trying to do. Mom, when did this happen? I asked, although I already knew. Just now, like maybe 10 or 15 minutes ago, she responded. I couldn't believe it. That was about the same time those guys appeared. Was there any connection between my mom's vision and the four hooded figures? I don't know, but all I do know is that I don't ever want to meet those hooded guys again. Before I begin, I'd like to state that I am a paranoid schizophrenic. This will come into play later. This happened recently, on July 6th at around 8 p.m., just starting to get dark when I happened to notice a man walking around my housing complex. I saw this on my security system, with about six cameras in total. He is wearing a black hoodie with the hood up and a pair of ratty blue jeans, and he had a wild-looking beard. I see him walking around and think nothing of it until around 30 minutes later, I see the man walk around near my house and notice him walking a bit too close to my car for comfort. He then just walks away and I don't see him for another hour when I get an alert on my monitor with all of my security cameras that says there is a proximity alarm. I have each camera set to a different proximity alert and the two garage door cameras were set to around 15 feet away from the camera. 
At this point, it's dark outside, and the cameras switch into infrared mode, where I can get a better look at this guy. He looked crazed, and had a small grin on his face. It didn't look too obvious, but it was definitely noticeable. I kid you not, what he does next is just downright terrifying. He looks up, and then begins to stare into the camera with his wild-looking face, and just sits there for a good five minutes. He then tries the rear left door and fails to open it, then tries the driver's side to no avail. The crazed man begins to then knock on the windows of the driver's side door and starts pounding it after a short period of time. This guy was getting more visibly agitated and angry with each second he couldn't get into my vehicle. By this point, I am already on the phone with the police and they say they'll be at my place soon. I get off the phone with the operator and just continue to watch what this guy is doing. He's still trying to get into my vehicle, then stops and just stares into my car with no regard to anything else. After 10 minutes, two police cruisers come onto my street with their lights on and their weapons drawn at the man. He looks at them and starts walking toward them slowly. By doing that, the guy got tased. I assume the guy had a weapon of some sort, because why else would four officers have their weapons drawn? Then, I hear a loud scream come from outside. Once the officers got the guy in cuffs, he turned his head back toward the main garage door camera and stares into it with the most deranged and insane look on his face. I give the police a statement and a USB drive with all of the footage of which has transpired, and I am still waiting to hear back from the police. I am not allowed to show any footage from these events, as there is still an active investigation going on. I lived in the same house from when I was born until I was 10 years old. It was a pretty typical suburban home. It was not particularly old and was finished with all of the cheap outfitting that are typically used to cut down on costs in mass-produced homes. It was unremarkable. It was a little box made of ticky-tacky in an area full of little boxes that all looked the same, so to speak. It had a finished basement that was filled with toys. It was what should be a child's paradise. There were two rooms there. One was what we considered the main room, which was the room that you first walked into when coming down the stairs, and had a TV, computer, and a pull-out couch that was great for sleepovers. The other was what we considered the back room. It was smaller, with many toy-filled bins. It was essentially a playroom for me and my siblings. It had a whiteboard on the only wall that wasn't nearly entirely taken up by sliding doors, to small storage and utility rooms. I would spend hours down there, often alone, while my mom went about her business upstairs. I spent a lot of time, particularly in the back room, playing with dolls or whatever little girls do, until an uneasy feeling would force me back upstairs to the safety of my mother's side. This would happen just about every time I played down there. I would play until I got too scared, and then I would flee upstairs. I didn't put much thought into my uneasy feeling because it had happened in that room my entire life, and four-year-olds tend to not think too much about those things. Looking back at it, I understand the fear and uneasiness I felt in that room. I felt like I was being watched. The feeling was strongest when I was alone in that back room, but I would still feel it when I was in the main room or with people. A prime example of this is the sleepovers I would have when I was a bit older, about seven years old. I always had sleepovers in the main room because it had the pull-out couch and a TV. The pull-out couch was situated as far away from the doorway to the back room as possible, but still had a clear line of sight to it. I would always take the spot furthest away from the back room's doorway in an attempt to get away from the uneasiness that room caused, especially at night. I felt like I was being watched on those late nights, and I would look up to the doorway and expect to see a woman standing there. Even though I never actually saw her with my eyes, it was like I saw her with my mind, because even now, I have a distinct mental image of her. She was tall, frail, and gaunt. She was an older woman, probably about 60 or 70, 
with a messy frizz of gray hair that went down to her shoulders. Her cheekbones were very pronounced like she had not eaten in months, or like her flesh was starting to decay off her bones. The thing that stood out to me the most was her eyes. They were dark and sunken, vacant with a thousand yard stare. I did not know it at the time, but after working at an assisted living facility and seeing dying people, I realized that she looked like she was dying, or perhaps already dead. She frightened me, but not as much as the other presence. The thought of the other presence still sends ice cold terror through my veins, nearly 10 years later. I never saw him, not even mentally, but I felt the darkness he emitted. I think I could never picture what he looked like because he did not look like anything, like he was inhuman and could shift into any form he pleased. He felt dark and powerful, like pure evil. I felt his presence strongest in the back room, especially when I felt like I was being watched. The dark, malicious energy was suffocating. There, I took special care to not look too closely at the slats of the doors that led to the storage rooms, because I was afraid I would see his dark, faceless eyes staring back at me. I learned to not look too closely at the darkness. There were times when I avoided that room entirely, like late at night when everything felt amplified. There were also month-long periods where I could not go into that room alone. I don't exactly know why there were periods when I felt like I could and couldn't be there. Maybe I had exhausted my courage and needed time to build it back up again. Maybe there were certain periods where the presences were just stronger. These periods would frustrate my parents to no end, because they dismissed my fears as childish nonsense. They had never spent a night in that basement the way I had with my sleepovers. They have never felt the gaunt woman's eyes on them as they slept. They had never felt the dark, malevolent energy that radiated from the back of the room in the middle of the night. Eventually, after moving out of that house, I began to think it was just childish nonsense too. I never actually saw anything unusual, so it was probably just my overactive childhood imagination. Right? Well, that was what I thought, until I brought it up to my sister years after moving out of there. My sister is six years older than me, so she was 16 when we moved out of that house. She was old enough to be over that sort of childishness. I had mentioned it to her to joke about how dumb I was as a kid and how my imagination must have gone into overdrive. I stopped in my tracks when she told me deadly serious, no, that house was haunted. It wasn't just you. She and my brother, who was 14 when we moved, were fully convinced the place was haunted. Without me saying anything about the basement, she said that her and my brother thought the basement in particular was haunted. I took things a little more seriously after that conversation, but I wasn't entirely convinced. We were siblings after all, and had talked to each other about the uneasiness in the basement when we lived there. We likely colored each other's perceptions and freaked each other out. At least, that's what I thought, until I brought this up to a childhood friend. This friend and I were pretty close in elementary school, but fell out of touch in middle and high school. We now go to the same college and have gotten more in touch because of it. One day, when I was with her, I realized that she had been in the basement countless times while we played and had sleepovers. She should also be relatively unbiased because I never told her about the haunting at the time, because I didn't want to scare my friends off. I mentioned my conversation with my sister to her, and she was unsurprised. She told me that she had thought the house, and the basement in particular, was haunted. She hadn't told me at the time, because she didn't want to freak me out. She went on to say that the back room was where it was the worst. I did not tell her that my siblings and I thought that the basement was the most haunted part of the house, much less anything about the back room. Needless to say, I took things more seriously after that. What really freaks me out is my nightmares. To this day, whenever I have paranormal nightmares, it is always in that basement or the hallway leading up to the basement door. I have had dreams where I went down the stairs at my current house, only for it to shift to the bottom of the stairs at my old house. When I walked down the hallway by the stairs and past the basement door, 
There was the woman, floating ominously. In another nightmare that I had, I turned into a grotesque and mangled monster, and I was inexplicably drawn down that hallway towards the basement. It was like I knew that was where monsters belonged. These nightmares freak me out because dreams are often used by your brain to sort through information and trauma. When I had these dreams, I had just about forgotten about that basement, and I have only recently pieced all of this together. It is entirely possible that I had an experience that scared me to the point of trauma in that basement, but I can't remember it because it is blocked from my memory. In that case, my brain may still be trying to work through it through my dreams. If that is true, I hope that memory never comes to the surface, because some things are best left unknown. I never want to experience anything similar to that basement ever again, because sometimes childhood fears are more than just childish nonsense. Once I got off work one night, I went straight to bed, and that was around 5 o'clock in the evening. I guess you can say I'm not really a night owl, because my job schedule varies throughout the week. Either I'm working at night, or I'm working in the morning. This day, I had to work in the morning, so I stayed up the night earlier. I woke up around 9 p.m. I got up to talk to the family, watched some TV, then started getting tired again. This was around 1 a.m. and I decided to go back to bed and I actually felt the weight of sleeping this time. Once I got my bed ready, I put YouTube on for a little background noise and just started to drift off. Then all of a sudden, everything was quiet. Then I dreamed about waking up in a building, a building I have dreamt of before, but not for a long time. I was laying on a sleeping bag in a decrepit room with no furniture. I wasn't scared, but confused. The door leading outside suddenly swings open with someone walking in, then slamming it shut. Then I was automatically pushed out of the dream as I was jolted awake. I was laying there thinking maybe I was just experiencing sleep apnea and tried to get up, but I couldn't. I couldn't move my arms my legs. It's like I left my body for the next minute of what I'm about to tell you. I have had experiences with sleep paralysis before, but not to this extent. Once I knew my body went numb, I started to panic, started to breathe heavily. It was unbearably longer than it should have been. For me, it would last around 30 seconds at most and I haven't even experienced the large weight on my chest yet. That's what I was actually waiting for, and I guess my body was trying to prepare for it, because the dread was like a sharp knife point, and it just kept jabbing me each passing second. Then I stopped breathing because what happened next made my heart stop, and my blood cold. In close proximity of my ear, I heard someone say, Hey. It sounded like a woman whispering in my ear. I was so disturbed I tried to call out for help, but I knew that couldn't work because I couldn't even breathe out a syllable. I tried to break free of this invisible bind, but I gave up and knew I had to rough through it. The next thing I know, something sits on my chest, but it wasn't the normal weight I would experience in these episodes. It was something lighter that felt less aggressive. It felt like fingertips caressing across my chest in a sensual way, laying down on my right peck. It was followed by a leg wrapping itself on the front of my thighs. The next thing I know, the left side of my body was being weighed upon like someone would be cuddling up next to me. Just for the record, I don't have a girlfriend and I doubt anyone in my house would start sneaking into my room at night. I was frightened and confused. I still couldn't move. Then the woman's voice came back. What are you doing? It said in a very quiet, sincere tone. I didn't know what was happening, but I knew I had to respond. 
so as calmly as I could, I said, I'm trying to sleep. That's when I noticed my face can move, and my hands can move, but I refused to open my eyes, because I didn't care for what there was to see. The next thing I knew, the weight on my left side started to diminish, and my body can move again. So I shot up, looked around the room. No one was there. My senses started to come back, and the sound of my computer comes back to me, like it was never turned off. I didn't bother going back to sleep. I guess this was a wake-up call. I need a better sleep schedule. Probably need to change a few things from now on. But my mind is still stuck on it. Was it a spirit? Was it part of the dream I was having? If it was a spirit, maybe it was just lonely and it just needed a body to lay with. Maybe it was a dream, but I don't dream that often, especially if the touch I felt is real. I don't know what to think. I guess I'll just chalk it up to a hallucination and get on with my life. Okay, so bear with me as I kind of suck at telling stories without some rambling. I changed the names for anonymity's sake. I'll give you a little background and then dive into the story. My husband, we'll call Michael, and I are in our 30s. We have two toddlers. The couple I will talk about I'll call Liz, and her husband we will call Klinger. Now let's dive into the story. I was scrolling through Facebook when I noticed a post on one of our local Talk of the Town groups. Liz posted saying she isn't from the area and wanted to know where everyone hangs out, and she said she wants to make friends. Me, being my outgoing self, I decided to comment saying, I'll be your friend. I know, I know, it was a very stupid idea on my part, and I let my overly trusting and friendly personality get the best of me. Liz and I started Facebook messaging and quickly realized we had a lot in common. Klinger and I have mutual Facebook friends, so that made me more inclined to meet up. I arranged for the four of us to get dinner and hang out. We had a good time and shared the same sense of humor. It turned into Liz and I hanging out weekly and Klinger inviting Mike to play pool every week. Mike was working a very demanding job that made it hard for him to have the time to hang out, and when he did have the time, he was too tired. Well, this made Klinger turn a bit crazy. Klinger asked if Mike could go to pool night, and he said no because of work. Klinger completely freaked out. He started texting Mike, saying that he was being a quote-unquote part-time friend, and that he couldn't deal with having a friend that didn't give enough effort. He said that Mike was leading him on as a friend. Naturally, Mike and I thought, what the heck? What is wrong with this guy? Mike started saying that Klinger was overreacting and that he has obligations like work and family time. He said that he doesn't have to be Klinger's friend and to chill out. Mike ignored all messages from Klinger, and we went about our days. Liz and I still hung out regularly, just us girls, and figured that Mike and Klinger didn't have to hang out with us. I thought, okay, problem solved. Wrong. Klinger started messaging me saying that he doesn't understand why Mike wouldn't want to hang out with him, and that he wasn't being nice. I tried explaining that he's got a lot going on and to chill out. This just angered him more and he lashed out by saying that Mike didn't give enough me time and that everyone deserves that. He insisted that Mike take time for himself and have a guy's night weekly. I told Klinger that him and Mike don't have to be friends and it's not a big deal. You would think I would have cut Liz and Klinger out of my life right then, but I thought I could be friends with only Liz. I then started to notice that Liz was becoming too clingy and would get mad if I said I felt like just hanging out at home instead of with her. She made me feel guilty for wanting to have time alone, so my idiot self fell for it and thought that it would be wrong of me to leave her to be lonely, as she didn't have any other friends in the area. This in turn made me spend more money than we could afford as she always wanted to get drinks or food. Mike and I started arguing because Liz would twist things I said to her. Then Klinger would spit them out to Mike. 
I thought about ending our friendship, but wanted to give her the benefit of the doubt. This all changed when I got a text from Liz asking if Mike and I would want to come over and do Molly with them. I am not into that stuff, except for smoking occasionally, so I definitely wasn't about to go over to their place to do Molly. I said that we couldn't, and I'm not into it anyway, plus we didn't have a sitter. Liz had the audacity to say that I should bring our kids over with us, and their kids could play with them. I told her absolutely not, and she got mad that I said it was a bad idea. Meanwhile, Klinger is non-stop texting Mike saying that he's a piece of crap alcoholic and that he doesn't give me enough time. Mike and I were totally taken aback as this came out of nowhere, and I never complained about my sex life to Liz or Klinger. In fact, I told Liz that I was content with it. I did mention Mike drinking a lot at the time, but didn't go into further detail, and it wasn't some big secret. Klinger then lectured Mike about him needing to quit drinking, and that he's a piece of crap father just like his dad. My husband has his share of issues, sure, but he's not a piece of crap dad, and he has dramatically improved since this occurred. Klinger then said that our kids are annoying and ugly. He told Mike that our son shouldn't have a pacifier, and how we are intentionally screwing up his teeth. Keep in mind that they were around 16, 17 months and three years old with standard tantrums. Mike said that he was done with the conversation and that there was no reason for him to disrespect our family, which obviously included a few choice words. Mike said that he doesn't care what his sexual preference is, but it seems like Klinger seems to be looking for a boyfriend, not a friend. Klinger lost it and threatened Mike and said that he would break him in half. Mike blocked him on everything. Then I texted Liz saying that our friendship was over due to her psycho husband. After we blocked them, we didn't hear from them again, but I was nervous for a good month that Klinger would show up at our house and try to do something. It didn't help knowing that Klinger regularly went on the dark web and hearing all the horror stories surrounding that. Also at the time, they lived about 10 minutes away. Thankfully, I knew beforehand that they would be moving to a city about 40 minutes away in the near future, so I knew it would be unlikely that I would run into them. So long story short, I learned the hard way that when it comes to friends, it's quality, not the quantity of friendships. We have a couple of good friends now and are more than happy with that. I was 12 years old. It was the summer between grade 6 and grade 7. My family had rented this really awesome cottage by the ocean in Prince Edward Island. Big cottage with a jacuzzi, a field of fresh barley growing in the backyard, which, if you walked to the end of the field, there was a little wooden path that took you into a kilometer's worth of our own private beach. It was easily one of the nicest cottages I ever stayed at. Prince Edward Island is a beautiful province too, by the way. Definitely go if you have the chance. I remember asking about sharks in the water to my parents, and they just laughed and told me to worry more about jellyfish, because the water is too cold for sharks, but there are a few jellies that can get you in the shallows if you aren't careful. They aren't aggressive though. The beach we had was really cool. So many types of crabs and jellyfish that are actually fun to play with, all just sprawled out for kilometers of beautiful red sand decorated with tide pools. When you finally walk all the way out to the ocean in low tide, you could continue walking for miles through the surf. Unfortunately, I found this out soon enough. It was a normal day at the beach with my family, filming videos and exploring. My brother and I ditched our parents and decided to go for a swim. The water in this beach was about as warm as the Atlantic water gets. I swear, in the more shallow water, it felt just like a public swimming pool on a very hot day. I was wrestling my brother for a bit. I slapped him in the back, performing what we called a five-star. He got upset and started throwing me around the water. He then threw a jellyfish at me, stinging me in my chest, and threatened to pee on me where I then threw the jellyfish back at him, and a jellyfish fight erupted. 
My parents had reconvened to our location on the shore and motioned to my brother and I that they had brought lunches. Later, my brother said to me while making an L on his forehead and making a face. My parents called me over, but I wanted to keep swimming. This water was barely up to my waist, so I kept walking further out to get to where it became deeper. I kept walking out until the water was just up to my nipples and started doing a front crawl. I did a couple backflips underwater and bobbed up and down a bit. I then decided I was cold and turned to head back to the shore. What I thought were seabirds turned out to be my family hooting and hollering for me to come back. They looked like tiny little specks off in the distance. I could barely make out that my dad was waving his arms in the air. This instantly freaked me out because I had no idea I traveled that far in such a short amount of time. Being a 12-year-old child, I had no idea anything about undertoes or riptides. I just knew I had to get back to shore like my life depended on it. Because it did. The resistance of the undertow was fierce. Having gone surfing since this incident, I now know if you are caught in a riptide, to remain calm and swim parallel to the shore until you get out of the riptide. That simple. I did not know this at the time. Full panic ensued. Thank my lucky stars, in my panic, I ended up splashing myself out of the current. This was because I was a bad swimmer. If it kept taking me further, I would have definitely drowned, and the water was becoming deeper. The undertow at my feet was still very strong, although manageable enough to slowly move through, creating lots of resistance and making me work extra hard. Almost drowning is quite the workout. I knew I was slowly but surely making my way back to shore. My parents saw that I was heading back, so they continued to eat lunch. I was becoming exhausted, just trying to march and swim my way back into shore. I was still very far away when something forced me to stop doing everything I was doing and listen to the sound of my pounding heartbeat. Something slippery and soft brushed up against my leg. I looked around, tried to make out the ocean floor below the waist-deep water I was standing in, still fighting the waves. There was no seaweed below me. Uh, must have been a jellyfish or some sort of fish. I tried to reassure myself as I began moving forward again. As I am thinking this and trying to make out what's underneath the waves, I thought I saw a shadow in the water. A wave obstructed whatever it was, and before I could even think about anything, I felt the force of that same slippery sensation slide across my entire body. Something was in the water with me, and it was gigantic. Soft but gigantic and terrifying at the same time. I could barely breathe, I was so shook. In some fit of hysterical panic, I started trying to swim away as fast and explosively as I could. First, front crawl, but switched to a backstroke to see behind me before I pretty much had an asthma attack and was forced to stop. I could barely breathe properly and was shaking with fear. I remembered in school that sharks have a sort of ESP and can sense fear. They respond to panicking humans like they are wounded prey. I kept scanning all around me. I could barely see anything through the waves until the sun poked out. Inside a particularly big wave was a giant, black, 10-12 to 12 foot long sea monster. It swam diagonally in my direction so fast it was like it almost vanished into thin air. I was still far from the shore. I decided to slowly walk one foot at a time, planting my feet and fighting the undertow. I was still in waist-deep water. I remembered on Shark Week that sharks can swim at 40 kilometers and most shark attacks occur in waist-deep water. I thought a wave looked like a shark fin and I immediately shifted position to face my demise. Then I noticed, in this level of fear, almost every wave looks like a shark fin. As I looked around frantically, the sun went behind another cloud, removing the glare. 
and I swear, about ten feet away from me was a dark shadow twice my size. I froze as it disappeared out of sight again. I did a 360 and couldn't see it anywhere. The same level of fear took over me where I decided to stop taking my time and start backstroking as fast as I could, like some sort of water strider insect. I had seen jaws at this point in my life, and every time my legs would kick together, a little V of wake would form on the water surface, looking almost exactly like the shark nose as it is surfacing the water and attacking people. Periodically, I would abandon swimming altogether and start screaming and kicking my legs viciously in front of me in the hopes that I get its nose. I wasn't even sure if it was around me anymore in hindsight, but at that very moment, that shark was going to bite my balls off any second. My heel brushed something again and again. I was scraping bottom. The water level was now down to my knees. I stood up and sprinted as fast as I could to shore. I kissed the sand as I got out of the water. My parents began scolding me about going out that far, telling me about riptides, etc. Great, now they tell me, I thought. I was shivering, shaking, utterly exhausted, and so emotionally and mentally rattled, I just disassociated and said nothing as they gave me crap. I did not tell my parents or my brother about any of this. My brother could be a huge jerk, and I almost knew for a fact that none of them would really believe me. I could hear them already. There's no sharks in these waters. <laughs> it must have been seaweed. My brother making chicken gestures at me. I saved myself the trouble. I just said nothing, ate my lunch, drank some juice, and decided to go back to the cottage after. Sharks rarely attack humans. If they did, people wouldn't go swimming. Beaches in Florida would be a bloodbath of slaughtered surfers. It's even more rare to find big sharks in Prince Edward Island. That isn't a lie. My parents reassured me repeatedly on the road trip down and after getting to the cottage that you will never find a shark in the Maritimes because the water is just too cold. Any sharks you see will be super small and restricted to the gulf and very shallow bays. As we were driving to another beach days later, the radio DJ gave a shout out to the largest white shark ever recorded. It was a female just over six meters long, caught in the Gulf of St. Lawrence off the coast of Prince Edward Island. I decided to stay dry and catch some sun that day. I had never ever babysat for anyone before, so admittedly, I was pretty nervous. But if I had known what kind of night I had in store for me, I would have turned the job down in a second. It was made all the worse by the fact that my parents pretty much assured me that it would be an easy 50 bucks and that the night would be over before I knew it. I had a bad feeling about the whole thing from the start, but my dad actually managed to talk me out of that headspace. Now, I wish I had just trusted my gut and stayed well away. So I wander over to the house around 7 in the evening, introducing myself to the parents and the kid, before they go over a few ground rules. At first, it seemed like my dad was right, that I was just being silly, and that, if I played my cards right, I could turn this into a regular earner to fund my weekend shopping habits. The parents were lovely, and so was the kid, so I got pretty chill pretty quickly and ended up sort of enjoying myself, entertaining the kid after they left with the help of Disney+, Plus, which I'd be lying if I said I wasn't a huge fan of. Anyway, everything is going well until it comes time to put the kid to bed. Then things started getting a little awkward. The kid straight up refuses, and our new happy little friendship starts to quickly deteriorate. I felt super mean having to lay down the law with the kid, and he went from crying and wailing to shouting and screaming at me that like, I wasn't his mom. He hated me, and I didn't belong there. Stuff like that. 
it actually kind of hurt, and I started to realize that maybe I wasn't ready for that kind of responsibility yet. To be a parent or a guardian, you need to be tough enough to be able to kind of like, be the bad guy, if that makes any sense. And if there are any of you out there that are looking to get into babysitting, thinking it'll be an easy few bucks, please reconsider. I have done way, way easier things for money before and since. Things that don't make you feel crappy for having to shout at a kid. But after a while, the whole temper tantrum seems to have tired the kid out. And even though he still seems upset with me, he went up to his room, got into his pajamas, and climbed into bed to go to sleep. He asked me to read him a story, and since he had actually done as he was told, I obliged. And when his eyes finally closed, and his breathing slowed, I snuck out of the room and downstairs to leave him to get some rest. So about an hour or so later, I was sitting on the couch texting a friend of mine, telling them how babysitting was way harder than I thought it was going to be. I am working through the leftover chicken pot pie that my mom had given me to take over there, catching up on some episodes of The Mandalorian, when the family house phone starts to ring. Thinking it was the parents looking to check up on me, I pick up, greeting the caller in the cheeriest voice I could manage. Only, no one on the other end responds. I say hello a few more times, assume it's a butt dial or a bad line and hang up, heading back to finish off my pie. No sooner that I sat down again, the phone rings again. I was kind of expecting it, I suppose. Maybe the parents had gone through a tunnel or something. I don't know. But either way, I get up again, head over to the phone, and pick up. Only this time, when I do, I can hear breathing on the other end of the phone. I give another cheery hello, but there's just the same breathing coming from the other end. When the person finally speaks, it's this super deep voice, obviously a guy, telling me to check on the sleeping kid. I thought it might have been the kid's dad, but there was also something really weird and distorted about the voice, too. I respond, like, Okay, I'll go check. And the line goes dead immediately. The kid is fine, sleeping like a rock, so as much as I'm kinda creeped out by the weird voice, I figure it must have been the dad. Maybe the parents had argued, I don't know. I tried not to think so much about it. But then, pretty much as soon as I'm back downstairs, the phone rings again. No caller ID, no nothing. So I answer, unable to prevent this fear from entering my voice. Big mistake. Whoever is calling senses this and starts to like, giggle down the phone line in that same weirdly distorted voice. What they said next made my blood turn to ice. Gonna snatch him up, gonna snatch up the kitty when you're not looking. Gonna get him. I went silent, just totally silent out of fear. And that's when I heard a creak in the floorboards above me. Someone was moving around in the rooms upstairs. I pretty much dropped the phone and bolt upstairs into the kid's room to find that he's still asleep. Or rather that he very much appears to be asleep, but that same deep, slow breathing isn't there. The more I look, the more like he seems like he's almost hiding his breath or something. Not only that, but his arm is at this weird angle that makes it look like he's holding onto something under his pillow. Something he's trying to hide. In a fury, I pull the pillow up slightly and then realize what's been happening. Whoever thought it was a good idea to buy an eight-year-old kid a phone is straight up crazy. But under that pillow wasn't just a phone, there was a voice disorder under there too. I grab both and run out of the room, back downstairs where the kid starts throwing another temper tantrum. I felt so dumb, completely played by the kid, made to feel terrified and vulnerable. How could someone be so young yet so malicious and mean-spirited. The parents arrived home shortly afterward, and I didn't mention a word of what happened until they had paid me in full. Then I read them the riot act, 
I was never going to babysit for them again, and they were completely irresponsible. Letting their kid have things like a phone, let alone an actual voice disorder. Turns out, the creepy little gadget was their older college-aged kids, and the little guy was fascinated with it and wouldn't give it back. But I didn't care. I wasn't about to put myself out there like that ever again. I have been working for an independent hotel for just over four years now. We're the number one rated hotel in our city, and proud of it. I mostly work in housekeeping, but I've done some time at the front desk as well. I love my job, and have always said that my bosses are great. Now, being a housekeeper, I have seen some things. I have seen a room where someone snuck in their dog, kitten, and chicken. We don't allow pets. I once had a room that I was cleaning as a stayover that had tripods set up around the bed, professional camera equipment cases, an adult-sized pacifier, on-site, and XL-sized children's diapers. The two people that were in that room were in their early 20s. I even had a room once that we had to call the cops on for a raid because we found drugs. They found a lot of drugs and weapons in that room. Today is the first time I have ever actually felt scared to be in a guest's room. As I'm working on a room that's already been vacated, a man in the next room over catches me at my supply cart. He is set to be staying for several days and tells me, You can go ahead and clean my room now. I'm going down for breakfast. Excellent. I love getting my stayovers done early on. It makes things easier for the people working laundry the sooner we get the dirty laundry down to them. So, I pop over into his room, opening it up and propping the door open with a stopper, like we always do. The first thing I notice is that he has around 20 prescription bottles lined up on one of the two beds, along with insulin and needles. I'm nosy, I'll admit it, and I wanted to see what he was on. Oddly, it was only two different types of medication for all 20 bottles. About two-thirds were a diabetes medication, and the rest were a cholesterol medication. That's a little weird that he has so many bottles of the same meds, but whatever. I go to make the bed and see that some of the bedding has been stained, and I sigh, knowing now that I'll have to change all the bedding instead of just being able to turn down the sheets and blanket. So, I leave the room, closing it behind me to get the linens I need, and then head right back to the room. I prop the door open again and head to set the clean linens on the desk chair. When I see out of the corner of my eye, two notes sitting on the TV armoire. It wouldn't mean anything except I caught the word kill scrawled on it. I dropped the linens and took a closer look. What I read on the first note made my blood run cold. You don't have to forgive her. You just can't kill her. You are here to take money and alcohol away from you. Get over having to kill her and you can safely leave. My heart was pounding. My eyes went to the second note, which had just looked like a to-do list at first glance, but in the end made my stomach churn. Spray and wash. Apply for Medicare. Insubordination. The soul is healed by being with children. Bank card follow-up. Inheritance. Savings. Kawai Pop 10,500. Map Montana. There will be a day of reckoning. Did you tell mom what I said? How did Bev get my address? It was too much. I quickly snapped pictures of them on my phone so I could show my boss why I would not clean his room. I left the room quickly, closing it up behind me. As the door closes, I turn, and I see the man just ten feet away from me, coming back to his room. My heart is in my throat, but I manage a smile and tell him, I need more supplies. I'll be back to your room in a bit. I take off straight for the elevator, 
having noticed our maintenance man waiting for the slow transport. In a hushed tone, I tell him what I found, and he sees I am shaken. Not a normal state for me. He rides down with me, and I go straight to my boss and tell her that for the first time in all these years, I am not comfortable being in a guest room. I show her the pictures, and her face is still and pale. She goes to the front desk and asks our general manager for a minute of her time, and brings her into the office to show her. She agreed this was not a safe situation, and took our maintenance man with her to go inform the man that he had one hour to get his belongings and leave the hotel, and he was not welcome back. I spent a few minutes in the laundry room, trying to calm down. Then my boss went back up with me to the floor, until the man was officially out of the hotel. This happened in late October of last year in Ottawa, Ontario. I was visiting my old city to see my parents, which is always a strenuous endeavor. So I generally try to be in their house as little as possible when I'm over. To kill some boredom one night, I decided to go for a jog around the neighborhood I grew up in, around 10.30 p.m. I was really pushing myself as I quit drinking and was desperately trying to burn off the excess belly fat from being drunk and lazy during lockdown. I ran basically a huge circuit around the neighborhood, taking me through three parks. The third park I had to run through has no street lights. It has one right in the middle, but Ottawa has a thing where random lights shut off and this alternates across the city's power grid to save money and electricity. Nine times out of ten, it isn't shining. Now, this park is extremely dark, especially on a quiet October night with clear skies and dry ground. The road leading into it is well illuminated. This is a quaint, quiet, peaceful suburb. There has been some sketchy stuff that has happened in this little suburb, though. For example, just a six-minute walk from my parents' house was one of the biggest drug busts our city has ever seen. Some gang with automatic illegal weapons, the whole shebang. There were also a couple of stabbings in other areas, but very spaced apart and generally resolved by the law immediately. All in all, it's a very quaint, safe, and clean place to raise a family. If I ever have kids or retire, Kanata would be an ample place to do it. I have never once felt unsafe, especially in the neighborhood my parents lived in, as it's full of some very nice houses. Through the darkness I entered the park and passed through the first part of it, which is a play structure meant for little kids, pretty much just a wooden mini house that's next to a bouncy spring. This leads to a bigger part of the park with a basketball court, jungle gym, and a much larger play structure with a big green triceratops made of plastic in the sandbox. All this eventually leads to a path that runs behind my old elementary school. At the end of this path is my street. I almost finished my run, running through the dark spooky park as I have passed through hundreds of times before. Now, I got into the habit of falling asleep to creepy stories and have been watching a lot of horror movies lately. As I'm breaking into the blackness from the adjacent street, leading into the park. I am on the fence about taking a break and walking, but I remember I was trying to push myself. I carry on as I think, jokingly to myself. Gee, I sure hope nothing spooky happens. But as I am rounding the corner to the other half of the park, I heard a distant scraping sound. I noticed a light from somebody's cell phone shining in the sandbox. As I ran closer, I heard this scraping getting louder. I got even closer, and I noticed through the moonlight that it is a man holding one of those hard rakes with the sharp tines, grooming the sandbox. Now, some internal intuition told me that I know this is super weird. Why is there some guy grooming the sandbox at almost 11 p.m. with a flashlight? As I approach further, however, 
I notice it isn't just a man holding a sharp rake. It's a man wearing an all-black sweatsuit with the hood up and a white hospital mask. He is standing underneath the play structure, using the tines of the rake to push a pink horse with wheels on it back and forth, and so on and so forth. He heard the stride of my footsteps approaching, and his head jerked upright in my direction. He quickly moved out from underneath the play structure and shined the light on me, right into my eyes. This is really weird. I thought to myself as I flashed him an utterly exhausted, awkward wave. I have asthma, and my quads and lungs are giving out. I try super hard to up the pace, because I am fairly creeped out at this point. In a flash, he kills his light, and I cannot see a single thing anymore. My heart jumps into my throat, and I am very tuckered out at this point, ready to collapse. I heard a soft shuffling in the sand as I passed him, followed by rapid footsteps in between my strides getting closer and louder. Instantaneously it clicks that this guy is charging me with a rake. It's crazy what fear and adrenaline can do, because I went from zero to a hundred real quick, sprinting faster than I would be able to normally. My whole body is burning, especially my lungs as I cleared the park onto the well-lit path. I was moving so fast and panting so loud, I couldn't even tell if he was following me or not. I didn't look back. I cleared the end of the path and saw some guy getting out of his car. With him as my witness, I turned around, panting myself to death and wheezing. He was gone. I walked back to my street and went into my house, hacking up disgusting amounts of phlegm absolutely drenched in sweat. I avoided telling my parents this story at first, just to avoid their reaction, but everyone else in my life knew pretty quick. I don't care for police, so calling them wasn't even something that crossed my mind. Later, when I reconnected with an old friend, one who never left Ottawa, she informed me that my old elementary school converts to a homeless shelter at night. They set up cots in the gymnasium and kicked them out at 6 a.m. Her reaction was to rationalize that it was probably a mentally ill, homeless person who was bored and couldn't sleep. But what if he had a different intention? Was he waiting for a jogger to pass by? Was he trying to scare people just for the fun of it? Or was he really in a violent mood? I guess I will never know. I work in the garden area of a home improvement store. I don't work the cash registers and my manager doesn't even let me water the flowers, so a lot of the time I have nothing to do. This results in me taking extremely long bathroom breaks where I just scroll on my phone. I know it sounds bad, but it's better than standing around trying to look busy. Today was the same as any other with me wasting time in the bathroom. Nothing of interest happened until my work phone buzzed at the same time as the stall next to mine. A few seconds later, I see that the guy in the next stall had his hand stretched to the ground with his palm facing up. I at first thought he had run out of toilet paper and was asking for mine. He just stayed silent for a while, so I ignored him after that. Then he started moving that hand uncomfortably close to my leg so I immediately scooted away and prepared to leave. Once the man noticed that, he hurriedly got out of his stall before I could leave. Another few seconds of silence. I took a peek out from the gap of the stall door to see what he was doing, and just like a scene from a horror movie, our eyes connected. He was barely an inch away from my door, trying to peek inside. My blood ran cold. If you're wondering why I didn't immediately open the door and cuss the guy out, I really hate confrontation. I avoid it whenever possible, and I do my best to not draw attention to myself. I stood sideways by the door so he wouldn't be able to see me. That's when the whispering started. 
I don't know what the first thing he said was, but it sounded like moaning. The next part was a bit more audible. He said something along the lines of wanting to see more of my unflushed toilet paper. I was thoroughly disgusted. This guy was a complete creep, and I was alone in the bathroom with him. My heart was beating faster by the second. I knew I had to stay there until another person came into the bathroom. No way was I going to confront him alone. Probably a minute later, someone finally arrives, and I take this as my chance to wash my hands and get out of there. Thankfully, the presence of the other person made the man quit his creepy behavior. As I was about to leave, he blocked my path for a quick second before stepping aside. The weird thing was, I don't even think he works at the store, because he wasn't wearing any vest. My store is extremely lenient about uniform, but most workers at least wear a vest or something connected to the store. He just looked like a regular customer. I am certain I heard two phone dings echo in that bathroom. The phones have a signature ring to them, so it couldn't have been a coincidence. Either way, he only started creeping on me once the phone ring made it clear that I was an employee. The situation really creeped me out, and I have been totally unfocused on my work since then. I kept prowling the garden area, looking for any man wearing a similar outfit to the creeper. I have an incredibly hard time distinguishing faces, so I probably wouldn't even recognize him if I did see him again. I hate telling this story, not only because of how traumatic it was for me, but because it does show my age. My therapist tells me I should learn to look for the positives in things, so the only way I really know how is by making light humor. This was the early 90s, and I was about 16 going on 17, working as a regular babysitter in my neighborhood. My parents had decided that the only way I was going to actually get a car would be if I was the one that saved up for the down payment. So every afternoon after school, I would tutor kids or watch babies, whatever I could do to earn a few extra bucks. There was one couple, the Moors, that always paid exceptionally well, and on Valentine's Day, they had a special request for me to watch both their six-year-old and their ten-year-old so that they could go enjoy a romantic evening together. We'll be back by eight, they said, and gave me about fifty dollars just for ordering pizza, renting movies, whatever the kids wanted to do. I asked them both what they wanted, and they both chimed in with a request to go to the local video rental store. I knew that the Blockbuster wasn't very far, but I insisted that I didn't want to do that until I got confirmation from their mom, this being the age before cell phones that required I had to look up the phone number in an actual phone book and call the restaurant where they were dining. Those two boys were so eager to hear a yes from their mom I thought they might explode from excitement. It took about 15 minutes for me to finally get in touch with their mom, who seemed a little frazzled that the only reason I was calling was so we could go to Blockbuster. Yeah, that's fine, just don't spend all their money, and nothing rated R, she responded. When I told them, both of the boys squealed and ran to get their jackets. We left the house before it got dark and made it to the rental store in less than 10 minutes. Not surprisingly, it was pretty empty save for the cashier and maybe one or two other customers. Go and pick out whatever you want, I told them as I grabbed some candy bars and popcorn. The oldest came back first with a VHS of some Disney sequel and asked if this was okay. I told him yes and then asked where his brother was, only for him to be surprised that I did not know. Both of us went down the aisles looking for him and for a split second, I got scared, thinking he had decided to play some terrible prank and run off. Finally though, I saw him standing near the edge of an aisle talking to a tall lanky man wearing a trench coat. As soon as I saw this guy, I got a weird vibe and grabbed the younger boy's hand. Sorry, I hope he wasn't bothering you, I nervously told the stranger. He smelled funny, as if he hadn't taken a bath in a while and he had this weird, crazy look in his eyes that told me he was trouble. 
I just had a feeling and I desperately wanted to be wrong about it. So I yanked the kid away and berated him as we made toward the cashier. What were you telling him anyway? I asked. Just that we was renting some movies and that we was home alone, the kid said innocently. I don't know why that didn't make alarm bells go off in my brain right away, but I guess I was too busy paying for the movies and dragging them out of the store. When we were walking back toward their house, it finally registered what he had told me. Did that man ask you if you were alone? I asked. My heart was starting to beat a little faster, but I didn't want the kids to think I was worried. Out of the corner of my eye, I thought I saw someone following us. Yeah, he seemed friendly, asked a lot of questions about me. The younger boy responded. I picked up the pace and told them we needed to hurry back to their house. I was positive now that we were being followed. I remember I looked back several times to see where the man was, but every time it felt like he was just barely out of sight. He was a master of stealth, it seemed. Once inside their house, I slammed the door shut and was upset at the kid for being so ignorant. Don't you ever talk to strangers. That man could have done you some serious harm. I remember thinking I should punish them both by having them go to bed early, but I had no idea how right I would be about my warning of this stranger. I glanced out the windows to see if I could spot him, and after calming down, I went ahead and let them pick a movie. I was also trying to convince myself that my paranoia had just been my imagination. Less than 10 minutes later, as we were watching the Angels in the Outfield movie, I heard a knock at the door that made me realize maybe I hadn't been cautious enough. I went to the front and peeked through the blinds, curious to see that no one was outside. My heart was pounding now as I thought I saw the man in the trench coat standing over near the bushes. I immediately told the boys to pull the blinds closed and then turn off the lights. Next, I started to hear this stranger banging on the windows with what sounded like a stick. Was he trying to frighten us? I remember wondering. If so, he was doing a stellar job because I was terrified. Turn off the TV for now. Let's get to the bedroom, I said. I remembered that the Moors had a house phone up in their master suite, so I was calmly trying to herd the kids there as this wacko kept rattling against the outside of the house. The kids were getting scared now, especially the youngest, and he was crying. Be quiet, don't be scared, I told him as we ran up to the bedroom. I told them both to be quiet as I reached for the phone, only to find that the line was disconnected. This is the moment when a real sense of panic and dread was starting to overwhelm me. It was just past 6.30, meaning that their parents would not be home for at least another 45 minutes. And now, with the phone lines down, I was positive that this stranger was going to try to break in and do us harm. Still, I insisted that they needed to remain quiet and calm. I got the older one to assist me in moving furniture to the front of the door as a blockade just in case this guy broke in. It's a good thing I did, because about 20 minutes later, I heard the shattering of glass and realized that was precisely what he had decided to do. I told them both not to make a sound as I tried to listen to where the stranger was. The only thing about this whole experience I will never forget is that the stranger started to whistle for us like he was looking for a dog. It was a loud, sharp, insistent whistle, and he kept saying, Here, boy. Here, boy. Come here, boy. I swear I have never been more scared in my life, and I ordered the boys to hide under the bed as footsteps came up the stairs. I was pretty sure we were about to die. It happened just like a horror movie, too. He was standing outside the door, because I could see the silhouette of his shadow peeking under the master bedroom door. Then the blockade of furniture started to rattle as I heard him fiddle with it. He shook it violently for a while, but to no success, and then for another long, indescribably quiet moment, I thought maybe he had given up. The kids were trying their best to not squeal or scream or even cry, but it was so hard to be perfectly still. At any second, I knew he was going to be back. 
Then, he slammed his body against the door, and it came slightly ajar. I remember jumping and holding the boys closer as he did it again, and then again, until at last he could squeeze in past the wedge furniture. All I could see was his shoes, leather boots that looked coated in mud. He walked slowly over to the bed and sat down, perhaps puzzling over where we were. He started whistling again, and I had to cover the younger boy's mouth as he let a leash fall over the edge of the bed. Did he know we were here? What sort of weird fetish was this supposed to be? He walked around the room, moving to the closet first and checking for us there. Then we heard the sound of the garage door downstairs. I had never been so happy. Immediately, the stranger ran down and I heard shouts of alarm as Mr. Moore likely saw him escape. A few seconds later, Mrs. Moore was in the bedroom, frantically searching for us and calling out her children's names. I crawled out first and helped her youngest get out as she grabbed him and hugged him as tight as possible. Downstairs, Mr. Moore was trying the landline again to contact the police, but it didn't work. Honestly, I thought the crazy guy was going to come back and do us more harm, so I didn't even want to step outside the house until my own parents came to pick me up. Mr. Moore told me that I was very brave and paid me extra for helping keep his kids safe. My parents also told me I had acted swiftly and decisively and it could have turned out a lot worse, but I didn't feel very proud. I had trouble sleeping for a week after. Any sound of a dog bark or a whistle would trigger the memory and make me want to curl up into a ball and hide. I can honestly only share it now after all these years, thanks to a bit of therapy. Sometimes I do think about what could have happened still though, had the parents not shown up early. Would he have harmed us or killed us? The cops never did catch whoever the guy was, so I guess we will never know. Except I know that I at least stopped babysitting for the upper class after that. I grew up on a farm just outside of Limerick in Ireland, which as you can imagine, made for quite an eventful upbringing. It also meant my back garden was bloody massive, so I had plenty of space to run around outside, playing make-believe with my two sisters. And without a shadow of a doubt, our favorite toy was the little Wendy house that Dad had built for us at the end of the garden. I don't know if they have those in the rest of the world, but basically a Wendy house is like a little miniature playhouse for kids. And I say little, but Dad had built us a massive one with like a little hallway and a kitchen and a little ladder going upstairs to a little loft. It was absolutely adorable. Me and my sisters just loved it. So much so that one summer's night, when it was warm enough, we asked mom and dad if we could sleep out in the Wendy house one night. They were understandably reluctant to give us permission at first, but we pestered them and pestered them until they finally relented. We could have a sleepover in the Wendy house, but we have to be on our best behavior, not fight, and promise not to go walking around in the dark. It was a deal. You can understand our parents' reservations, too, because the end of the garden, I mentioned, was probably about a hundred meters away from the actual house, near this old shuck that backed out onto some woodland. Not the ideal place to leave your kids alone overnight. So that's how three girls under 10 years old ended up in a dimly lit wooden playhouse in the middle of nowhere, in the middle of the night. And for some reason, my older sister Kathleen decides it would be a good idea to tell ghost stories. Kathleen has always been a bit strange. She has always had a fascination with ghosts and ghoulies and witches and whatnot, ever since she was young. And since she had gotten her hands on a book of Irish ghost stories, she thought she might regurgitate one of the stories she had read to us. She started telling us about a ghost that actually originated in Ireland, that unlike a Dracula or Frankenstein, which come from the other countries. As nine-year-old her put it, we actually had banshees in Ireland, since that's where they originated from. Our minds are absolutely blown. Ghosts lived in graveyards, old houses, and other haunted places that you had to go to, to see one. 
But here's Kathleen telling us about a ghost that actually comes to you to tell you that someone's going to die in your family. And the way it lets you know this is by screaming in the middle of the night, like a ghostly, ear-piercing wail. Kathleen goes on to tell us that these Banshee are women who have died in terrible, painful ways, hence the screaming, and that they look like shriveled old women with red eyes who carry bowls of blood. We were just about trembling in our pajamas by the time Kathleen finished describing the nightmarish appearance of the Banshee by torchlight. But somehow, when Dad came out to interrupt and tell us it was bedtime, we managed to get comfy and drift off to an uneasy sleep. The next thing I know, I am wide awake in total darkness and everything is deathly quiet. Then I hear something that was so frightening that at first, I think I just froze up in complete terror. It was a shrill, ear-piercing shriek, almost gravely too, as if it had come from the throat of an old lady. When I finally found the courage to move, I shot up from my makeshift bed, shaking my sisters awake and telling them to listen. We just sat there in the darkness for a moment, all three of us terrified, until we heard the screech again. Hearing it for a second time, had me just about out of my mind with fear. But my little sister took it even worse. It's a banshee. I remember her crying. We have to tell mom and dad. Then my big sister, bless her, decided that even though she's terrified, she's going to run to mom and dad so they can rescue us from the banshee. Say what you like about Kathleen, but she believed her own hype. She thought there was a banshee out there just as much as us. I mean, what else could have been making those ungodly noises out there? We are frantically looking for our torches, but in our panic, we can't find them. And when the Banshee screams for a third time, Kathleen decides she can't afford to wait any longer. She gets up and in complete darkness, climbs down the little ladder, opens the Wendy house door, and runs off to fetch us rescue. While Kathleen was gone, me and my little sister managed to find one of the torches. So, we flick it on and point it down at the Wendy house door from the loft. I don't know what logic of that was, but that's what we did, and we cuddled together, cried, and waited for the Banshee to get us. After a minute or so, we hear rustling outside the Wendy house. Something was moving outside. We are so scared of the thing hearing us that we've got our hands over our mouths, but we still can't stop crying and we still don't turn the torch off. Suddenly the door opens, and what stepped inside made me and my little sister scream in pure horror. Blood was pouring down the mouth and chin of my big sister, and now she's back in the light. Now she too can see that she's bleeding. She smears a bit of blood on her fingers, looks at it, then promptly collapses. We are absolutely inconsolable at this point, me and my little sister are begging, screaming, crying for our parents to come and save us. To us, Kathleen just ran out to get help, and the Banshee had got her before she could make it. We are trapped. The Banshee's getting closer. We are doomed. Then there's more footsteps outside the Wendy house. Heavier footsteps now. Banshee footsteps. The door swings open again, only this time, the face that appears is our dad, wanting to know, What is going on in here? We're screaming, Dad, there's a banshee, be careful, it got Kathleen, behind you, Dad. He's obviously skeptical at first, but when he sees Kathleen's face, it's his turn to be terrified. He turns ashen, grabs Kathleen's little body up in his arms, and then rushes back to the house with her. So keep in mind that even at this, the point of parental intervention, Dad has not taken the time to tell us that there definitely isn't a banshee. And if anything, his reaction at Kathleen's face confirmed that not only is there definitely a banshee outside, but he's completely abandoned us. Seriously, just try and imagine being seven years old and that being your truth. We didn't calm down for hours. Mom and Dad say we were still up crying at one o'clock in the morning with the whole incident going on at about 10. Even when we knew everything was okay, we just cried because it had been so traumatic. 
obviously there was no Banshee, and we didn't find this out until years later for obvious reasons, but what we had heard was the sound of two foxes mating. As me and my sisters now know all too well, when they do that, the lady fox screeches at the top of her lungs, producing what is a rather unsettling and otherworldly sound. Kathleen, being the brave big sister she was, had run out to protect us, but maybe if she was as nimble as she was courageous, she wouldn't have run directly into that tree in her blind panic, almost knocking herself out in the process. The best she could do then was retrace her poor, befuzzled steps back to the Wendy house and pass out at the sight of her own blood. It's a story we tell every Christmas now, especially when there's a new boyfriend or husband making an appearance, and it always gets a giggle from those that hear it. But I think if you put a weapon to my head and asked me for the scariest moment of my life, I would say the Banshee when I was seven years old. I am deadly serious, scarier than childbirth, scarier than finding the lump in my breast, scarier than confronting my first husband about his drinking, because I believed something I didn't understand was coming to get me, something mythical, something supernatural, something that even dad was scared of. Needless to say, there were no more sleepovers in the Wendy house that summer, and the whole thing collapsed a few years later. But me and my sisters will always have that story to make us laugh, even though at the time, we were scared for our lives. This happened to me when I was 21, after I tried to take my own life. I woke up in the hospital in the middle of the night to a nurse saying he needed to replace my IV. He jabs me two or three times, but doesn't hit a vein. So I ask if he can get someone else to try. He says no and keeps going. As he is doing this, he is pushing and wiggling the needles around under my skin, saying he is trying to get the vein. By the seventh or eighth needle, it registers that he is intentionally trying to hurt me. I ask him, why are you doing this? He just says back, it's your own fault that you're here. I was too weak to fight back and it was in the middle of the night. There was no one else around I could call out to. I have no idea how many times he ended up puncturing me in the end. The next day, a different nurse was taking out my IV. She was horrified because she said it was the biggest needle she had ever seen using on a living patient. Not sure why you would use needles on a dead patient, but that's what she said. A lot of people shrug this off when I tell them about it, but it was so terrifying being alone, helpless, and knowing that the person who was supposed to care for you hated you and wanted to cause you pain. The following story occurred in 2008, during summertime. A month had passed since school ended, and I was excited to be home. I have a huge family. At this particular time, there were about nine people in the household. My mother and father, my four sisters and two brothers, and myself. I am the youngest. The night was beginning to approach, and my mother decided to put on the movie Scream for all of us to watch. Unfortunately, my father had to work. Normally, we watch our films in the living room area, but instead, my mother decided to watch the movie in her room. She had a huge bed to accommodate us all anyway. After getting food and snacks, we turn off the lights and begin watching the film. About 20 minutes later, I spot my mother whispering something into my oldest sister's ear. It was dark in the room, and I couldn't quite hear the conversation. I figured she was telling her to grab something from the kitchen because my sister rolled her eyes and proceeded to go downstairs. I placed my attention back onto the movie. Keep in mind that my oldest sister was 20 at the time. Moments later, I began to hear an unfamiliar voice come from below the room. Everyone in the room was fixated on the film, but even through the volume of the TV, 
I could hear something. If you walk right through my mother's bedroom door, straight ahead is the staircase on the left. I could see a glimmer of light shining on the banister that leads downstairs. It went away quickly as I heard the front door close. No one seemed to notice. Shortly after, my sister returns back upstairs with some sort of bag in her hand. She kept it tucked behind her back and handed it to my mother and sat down on the bed. At that point, I was confused, but I pretended that I did not see what occurred. After the movie ended, my mother announces that it's bedtime. My siblings and I grunt and groan in irritation and proceed to go to our rooms. Before I leave, my mother asks me to throw away all of the empty bags of popcorn. Now, I did not mind doing this, but I had a fear of going downstairs by myself, especially at night. Despite my hesitation, I collect the trash and begin making my way to the kitchen. The only source of light we leave on downstairs is the cooktop light in the kitchen above the stove. As I exit the living room and enter the dining room, I pause and discover something. In the kitchen, I saw a shadow reflecting onto the fridge. It appeared to be a man with a slightly pointy nose and a wide brim hat. He resembled the monster from Jeepers Creepers a little bit. The shadow stood there silently as I watched in awe. I was shocked. I could not tell if it was an appliance or a kitchen item, but deep down inside, I felt as though that was not the case. My entire body was paralyzed in fear. Suddenly, the shadow disappears, and I hear footsteps run out of the back door through the pantry. I scream until everyone comes downstairs. My mother consoles me and asks me what happened. I explained to her the situation, and at that moment, I believe she realized what occurred. Earlier that night, my mother gave my oldest sister money to give to a drug dealer in exchange for weed. When I described what I thought the man looked like, she confirmed that it was him. My mother has known the dealer for many years, so she was surprised to discover that he snuck back into the house to steal from us. Shelves and drawers were open and some items were on the ground, and apparently the front door was unlocked. My mother asked us to promise her to never tell our father about what happened that night. I have kept that promise to this day. This happened a few years ago when I was about 15 years old. It was a pretty common occurrence at the time for my family and the families of my two best friends to go out for dinner. During one such time, my best friends and I decided that it would be more adult and cool for us to sit away from the rest of our families and to just eat and chat at a separate table. We were a couple of young teens having a fun time. That's when one of my friends, Jenny, whispered, that the guy sitting at the table next to us seemed to be staring at me. I slightly turned my head and realized that he did seem to be looking my way, but I brushed it off. I mean, we were at a restaurant. People looking around seemed normal and innocent enough. As the time progressed, my other friend Gabby also noticed the man staring at me, and we began to get a little more concerned. He had seemed to have finished his food a long time ago, but just continued to sit there watching us, especially me. The man seemed to be in his 30s, and his expression was starting to creep the three of us out, but we decided not to do anything in case it was just us overthinking. Eventually the man did pay and leave, and we felt relieved. But as soon as I took my first bite of food, Jenny motioned to me frantically. We were sitting by a window, and as it turned out, the man had left the restaurant, but he hadn't fully left the premises. He was standing outside the window, staring at me. At this point, we realized this wasn't normal behavior, but we also didn't want to alert our families and cause a scene. So we kept eating, but also kept our attention on the window. By the time we were all done with dinner and our bill had been paid, the man was still outside. We were worried he would try something, so we stayed close to our dads on the way out. 
He followed us as we walked to our cars from a distance, but eventually changed direction and left. The whole ordeal was super creepy to us, but we let it go because it was over, or so we thought. Three months later, the three of us decided to visit the busy downtown area of our city for fun. We were standing on a street corner trying to figure out where to go next, when I felt Gabby tapping my shoulder. At first, I didn't respond, but when she continued, I looked up, and I felt like my heart stopped. It was the same guy from the restaurant. The restaurant had been nowhere near where we were currently standing, yet somehow, by sheer coincidence, we had ran into him again in a city of huge population. The guy made eye contact with me, and I could tell he recognized us. We immediately walked away as fast as we could, and he started to follow, but after a few minutes, eventually, we did lose him. We tried to then continue on with our plans, and did end up having a good time, all things considered. However, just when we had decided to head back home, we ran into the guy and one of his friends again. This time we were really freaked out. He spotted us again, and this time, him and his friend followed us. Gabby said maybe he won't come after us if we go into a makeup store. We tried that, but nope. They walked right inside after us. At this point, Jenny was ready to call the police, but we decided to try and lose them one last time by ducking into a toy store. We stayed in the store for a while and kept an eye out outside. They walked back and forth for a few minutes looking for us, but eventually they left the area and we decided now was the time to make our move and leave. This time we lost them for good, but the whole ordeal was beyond stressful. The three of us never told anyone else what happened. I still don't know what he wanted from me or what would have happened if he had caught up to us, but I am glad I haven't seen the guy since. All these years later, my friends and I think back to this incident and still think about how crazy the odds were to meet the same creep more than once in two completely different random places. For a few years there, Omegle and chat roulette were like the best things ever. I know it sounds dumb, but the idea of coming face to face with random internet people absolutely terrified me at first. I wasn't the most confident of people when I was younger, and believe it or not, using stuff like Omegle actually helped me come out of my shell a little and learn how to talk to people. And naturally, like anyone who has spent a lot of time on Omegle, I have a lot of stories detailing some of the weirder encounters I have had on there. I mean, I have had some pretty amazing ones. I met one of my longtime gaming buddies on Omegle, and you would be surprised at the number of girls. But I have also had my share of gross, sad, irritating, and downright scary encounters. And what I'm about to tell you is by far the most disturbing, and it's not some creepypasta either. Every word of it is the truth. So I had just gotten home from this crappy part-time job I was working in 2012, and at the time, my routine was like, get home, sneak one of my stepdad's beers from the garage, and see how palpable the mental illness was on Omegle that afternoon. I was actually having a good run at one point. I had a guy singing that Call Me Maybe song, another dude who did a magic trick, a handful of pretty girls, and I think one guy was on something. So all in all, I was in a pretty good mood by the time I hit end and knew for what turned out to be the final time that night. Because when I do, I just see this guy sitting at a desk, staring blankly into the webcam. Immediately this hits me as unusual, because most people are looking at their screens to see who you are and not straight up staring into the camera. I said something like, hey what's up, or something, but the dude didn't reply so I figured there was just something wrong with his audio. Now I should add that it was usually around that time that I would just end a chat and start a new one if the person on the other end seemed too weird or like they wouldn't be much fun. 
I would just skip them entirely. So as you can imagine, coupled with all the other weird stuff you're likely to see during an Omegle session, I ended up doing a lot of skipping, but something about this guy really got my attention. Like at first when I saw him, he looked like he might be in his early to mid-teens, dark hair and eyes, kind of a baby face with scrawny shoulders. But the more I looked, the older he seemed to be. The guy had crow's feet, deep bags under his eyes, pretty sure he had flecks of gray at his temples too. Like if he was as young as I thought he was, then he must have had the most brutal paper route in history. So for some reason, at a time I would normally just ghost, I said something like, uh, are you okay? Can you hear me? He nods. He could hear me. And it hit me that this might be another case of someone browsing Omegle when they're high. It must sound a little mean or whatever, but I figured I would mess with him just a little. Maybe see if I could guess what he was on. I start talking real slow to him, trying to make him think that time is slowing down or something. But he barely reacts. And it's then that I realize he hasn't once looked at his phone screen or monitor. The whole time, he was literally just staring at the little lens on his webcam. I break from the play acting and just ask him straight up, What are you on, man? He shakes his head, so I ask him if he means he isn't on anything at all, and to that, he nods. Now I'm torn between laughing, because of what could have been a blatant lie, and kind of freaking out, because if he wasn't lying, and that was him sober, that made for one really creepy guy. Then, out of nowhere, this guy reaches up towards his mouth like he's about to take out some gum or something. At first, I think he's going to show me some weird root he's been chewing on that made him look all sleepy. I mean, if there is such a thing. I know people can get some pretty weird South American plants and stuff from shady websites, but then it becomes obvious that he has a hold of his tooth. His front tooth, I think, like in the grip of his thumb and forefinger, and then he starts to pull. I'm like, dude, what are you doing? All calm at first. And then he starts like really getting a grip on his tooth, pulling and twisting. And I'm like, dude, stop. What are you doing? This all escalates until I hear a deep cracking sound coming from the guy's mic. He twists the tooth free from his gum as blood starts pouring out of his mouth, then holds it up to the camera like he's all proud of himself. I am full on squealing at the computer at this point stuck between wanting to cover my eyes and turn it off at the stack and not being able to look away because what is this guy even doing? I asked this guy in like a hundred different ways. Why did you do that? Was it rotten? Can't you go to the dentist? What are you doing? He doesn't say a word. He just spends a few more seconds smiling this gape tooth grin, mopping at the blood on his chin and holding up the tooth in front of the webcam. Then he disappears, and I'm left on the new chat screen, just shell-shocked. Nothing has ever topped that for me, in terms of pure creepiness. I have so many unanswered questions about that guy, and each time I think I get close to figuring it out, it just opens me up to a hundred other questions. I mean, he would have been on something to be able to pull his own tooth out like that. I don't think anyone could stand the sheer agony of it sober. And it's also the whole idea that it wasn't his first time doing it. Like as crazy as it sounds, he seemed to just know what he was doing. That he had to twist it and wrench it. He knew exactly how to grip it. And then the sense of pride at the end. It all just gave me this distinct feeling that he had done that kind of thing before. I didn't see anything else that ever made me react so strongly. And after that, all the random stuff you would see didn't faze me at all. Like as long as there was no tooth pulling, it was just water off a duck's back. So I guess I have something to thank Mr. Tooth Puller for. Although saying that, it's not something I want to see ever again. When this particular experience occurred, it was July of 1982, and I had just turned 13. As part of my birthday celebration, my parents took me and several of my friends to see 
Conan the Barbarian at the new walk-in theater in Liberty. This was quite a change from watching a movie from the bed of a truck at the drive-in. Instead of fighting mosquitoes big enough to completely exsanguinate us and trying to be still enough so the big aluminum speaker didn't fall off the side rail of the truck bed, we were able to sit, in air conditioning no less, and enjoy our popcorn and sodas without welts and blood spatters. For several weeks after that, we all made swords out of anything we could find and beat, slashed, hacked and stabbed the crap out of anything we thought was worthy of being a foe. Mostly, this resulted in a bunch of decapitated weeds and flowers, and a few slaughtered spiders. One of my friends got his father's machete, and we spent a happy afternoon seeing which of us could chop a sapling tree down in a single hack. We almost had a fist fight over who got to use it to kill a little snake we found. It disappeared before we had a chance. Conan was the hero of the day for that summer, right up until we saw First Blood just after Halloween. One day, we decided that we needed to build our own Temple of Set, which was Fulsa Doom's cavernous fortress from the Conan movie. We didn't have a Princess Valeria to rescue, but we thought it would be cool to at least have a cave to stealthily invade. We had visions of tunnels and caverns and underground rooms filled with treasure to steal. After much arguing and discussion, we finally decided that the best location for our imaginary massacre would be at the bottom of one of the steep banks of the river by a sandbar. The following weekend, we all went to the riverbank with our various instruments of destruction. We had a regular shovel, two sharpshooter shovels, a hatchet, and a pickaxe. The area that we chose was at a bend in the river that was about a 10-minute walk from the road. The level of the river was low, and it left a great expanse of sandy shoreline in the bend where the sediments had built up into a sandbar that was high and dry when the river level was low. Over the years, the river had cut into the earth, leaving high banks at this particular bend that were maybe 12 or 15 feet above us. It was already undercut to an extent, and we had to clean out the trash and beer cans from previous visitors before we could start working. We spent the following week digging into the side of the bank. We dug a hole about 10 feet deep and then began making our cavern. It was more work than we anticipated, so it was a lot slower than we wanted. We usually worked in 10 or 15 minute bursts, and then we would work on a squared off berm with the dirt we had excavated to hide the entrance. Before we finally got bored with the whole idea of multiple tunnels and caverns, we had dug a tunnel about three feet in diameter and 10 feet deep into the bank of the river. At the end of the tunnel, we had dug out an area that was more of a small room than it was a cave. We made the floor as level as we could in an area that was about 10 feet on each side. The top of the ceiling was probably 8 feet from the floor. We finally stopped at that height because we ran into roots from the trees on the top of the bank and we were tired of trying to expand it because we kept getting dirt and grit into our eyes and mouths. We thought the end result was awesome. We dug little alcoves into the walls and put candles in them to provide lighting. It went from our own version of the Temple of Set to a little clubhouse. It was really cool inside there when the weather was hot outside. It was even better when the candles lit up the area in a horror movie type of light. And you looked up. You could see the roots hanging down. We were all pretty proud of our accomplishment. We built the berm at the tunnel entrance up to about six feet high and made the outside look like it followed the natural slope of the sandbar. The end result was that if you were to walk along the shoreline and weren't actually looking for it, you would more than likely have walked past it without even noticing. This became our home away from home and provided us with hour upon hour of fun and entertainment. We even camped out there a few times that summer. One weekend, we found that our little hidey hole had been used by someone else. When we crawled into our cave, we found several beer cans and a blanket and a pair of socks. Evidently, some of the older teens in the area were using it too. We spent that day discussing booby traps and other means of discouraging the invaders from using our cave, but we finally decided that if we did anything to protect our cave, it would probably result in someone destroying it. 
Over the next few weeks, we found more beer cans, cigarette butts, a crushed pack of camels that was empty, a styrofoam cooler without the lid, a frisbee, and a keychain with three or four keys on it. We put the styrofoam cooler upside down in the middle of the cave and left the keys sitting on it. The next time we returned, the keys had been replaced with a Budweiser that we all took turns sampling and a new box of candles. We had a lot of adventures in the cave that summer. We were Conan in the temple, we were Rambo in the mines, and it was the Castle of the Crystal from The Dark Crystal. Then one day we all met at the cave to find that part of the ceiling had collapsed. An area about the size of a big tractor tire had fallen, leaving even more roots showing. We got an old galvanized tub that was about the size of a turkey pan and tied a piece of clothesline we had liberated to each handle, one leading inside the cave and one to the outside. Me and Jerry would pull the tub out and empty it after Terry and Bobby filled it inside the cave. After it was empty, they would pull it back inside and fill it again. We were about halfway finished when we heard the laughter. At first, we thought it was whoever was using our cave when we weren't. We were a little excited to see who it was, but then we heard the voices that went with the laughter. It was Bubba Hain and his brother, Henry, and a couple of their friends. They were the bullies of our area. They were notorious for being the local toughs. They all walked around with their elbows cocked back and their chests puffed out. They all smoked and talked with language that would have caused me to get beaten half to death and my mouth washed out with dish detergent if I had ever been caught using it myself. Bubba was 19 or 20 and had been in jail several times. He was mean and quick to fight, and it didn't matter if you were half his size. He terrified all of us younger kids. We debated crawling into the cave and keeping quiet until they passed us by, but if they knew about the cave, then we'd only be caught without anywhere to run so we took off running in the opposite direction of the voices. We climbed up the bank around the bend and circled back to watch from the top of the bank, where we were safe and able to run if necessary. As we watched from our elevated vantage point, they came around the bend. Bubba and Henry were pulling a small aluminum boat through the water with a rope tied to the loop in the front. The boat had an ice chest and several flathead catfish laying in it among empty beer cans, and they were talking about finding more fish. Evidently, they were planning to have a big fish fry. Walking along in the front of them were Gerald and Ricky, also known for being less than friendly. They were both walking in the water about chest deep along the far side of the riverbank. They were all wearing cut-off shorts and drinking beer. Ricky would stop occasionally and feel the wall of the bank under the water. As we watched, he disappeared under the sandy water for several seconds and then surfaced again and said, Nothing. And they continued walking. They were talking about which girls would be at the event and who they hoped would come and who they'd like to hook up with. They were noodling for fish. Noodling is one of those activities that can be both exciting and dangerous. The way it works is you look for where a catfish or natural erosion has made a hole in the bottom of the riverbed, usually on one side or the other, as the current isn't as strong there. The person doing the noodling will stick his hand into the hole and feel around for a fish. If a catfish is there, it will think the hand is a smaller fish, and therefore food, and try to eat it. When the catfish has your hand in its mouth, you grab it by the lower jaw or through the gills and pull it out. Obviously, any catfish with a mouth big enough to engulf your hand is a good-sized fish, ranging in size from 20 to 60 pounds on average. The problem with doing this is that occasionally, you can get a fish that is actually too big to easily extract and doesn't want to let its lunch get away. It is then a fight to retrieve your hand and get your head back above the water before you drown. While they don't actually have teeth, catfish have millions of tiny little spikes on their lips that can scratch you up pretty good. 
Another danger is that you encounter something other than a catfish, like a snapping turtle. If this happens, it is entirely possible to lose a finger. I am not too proud to admit that I am too chicken to go noodling. As we watched, Ricky went under the water again. After what seemed like two or three minutes, his hand suddenly shot up from the water and waved back and forth. Gerald immediately went under to help him, and they came back up a minute later, sputtering and gasping for air. They had caught a big one, about four feet long. Henry and Bubba pulled the boat over to them, and they all wrestled the fish into the boat with the others. They congratulated each other and toasted their fortune with a fresh beer. After a few swigs, they continued on their way. Eventually, they were out of sight, heading toward the more populated areas of the bottom where they lived. We didn't think they would be coming back, so we jumped back down and continued our work. Bobby realized that they had walked right by our cave and didn't even notice. That was just fine with the rest of us. About five minutes after we had started working on the fallen dirt again, we heard screams and shouts from the direction where Bubba and his friends had gone. They were sounds of fright. We forgot about getting pounded on and ran around the sandbar to the direction of the screams. When we saw Bubba and his friends, they were on the opposite side of the river than before, and the boat was floating downstream toward us. Terry caught the line as it passed, but he wasn't strong enough to stop it, so Jerry and I grabbed on too while Bobby waded into the water and pushed it from behind. We all figured that our helping gesture would make us immune from any bullying for at least a little while. As we walked the boat back to them, Gerald was actually getting sick in the sand, and Ricky was retching. Bubba and Henry were both white as a bedsheet and were walking back and forth, hugging their arms in tight against their chests, as if they were freezing. They saw us coming to them and immediately went into the tough guy mode with their chest puffed out and elbows cocked. For a minute, I thought we had made a mistake in thinking they'd appreciate our assistance. Henry was the first to realize what we were doing and shouted an enthusiastic thanks and jogged in our direction. He helped drag the boat up to Bubba and the others. We were all apprehensive and ready to take off running but no one seemed interested in being a bully. I looked to see who got hurt, but everyone seemed to have all their fingers and toes, and there wasn't any blood anywhere. So I asked what happened. Bubba glanced out across the river to the other side, about 60 feet away, but didn't say anything. Henry finally said that they thought they saw a dead body. Gerald turned around wiping his mouth with the back of his hand and spit. They ain't no thinking to it. I had my hand around its damn ankle, he said. I reached into that hole and felt what I thought was a tail and pulled on it and came up with a damn sock and shoe. We all looked at the opposite bank of the river, searching intently for any signs of blood and gore, but couldn't see anything. When we asked where it was, Ricky told us that it was about five feet down at the bottom of the big catfish hole. We, we gotta call the police, Gerald stammered. He kept wiping his hand on his pants. He stooped and gathered a handful of sand and washed his hands with it. Bubba told him to call the police if he wanted, but that he didn't want any part of it. Then he looked at us and told us to forget he was there. He told us not to mention his name at all. Then he and Henry turned around and began walking upstream toward where everyone lived. Gerald and Ricky looked back and forth at each other. Nobody knew what to do. Finally, Ricky told Gerald to wait and he'd go call the sheriff and ran off. We all stood there for a minute, half afraid to talk. We knew about Bubba and acted accordingly, but Gerald wasn't as well known to us. We all know who he was and had heard stories, but none of us had ever had any direct contact with him before this. Finally, Terry asked him how it happened and who had screamed. Gerald looked at him with big, bulging eyes, still wiping his hands up and down his pants. I don't think he realized what he was doing. He stared for a minute like he was waiting to see if we were going to make fun of him, 
but we were all half scared of him and wouldn't have dared to poke fun at him anyway. After a minute, he told us, they were going to have a big fish fry later. They had been out noodling to get more fish, so they'd be sure to have enough. They were planning to get just one more before they stopped. He looked at us and held his hands at shoulder level, palms facing inward, and shook them vigorously. Just one more, he said, shaking his hands so hard that water sprinkled on us from his wet hair. He told us that he had been walking along, feeling for holes in the riverbed with his feet, when he found the hole. He had gone under and felt around with his hand, when he felt what he thought was a tail. He said that he grabbed it really hard, ready for the fish to try and swim away, when he felt something oozing between his fingers. He told us that he braced his feet and pulled, and it just came up. As he told the story, he mimed all of his actions. He told us that just as it was getting close enough to the surface of the water for him to see how big it was, that he noticed it was white instead of the dark gray color. Then he saw the sock and shoe. That was when Ricky saw it and yelled. Ricky's sudden yell startled Gerald, who thought the leg was alive. They both ran to the boat and told Bubba and Henry what they had seen. Bubba didn't believe him, so he and Henry waded over to the hole and found the body. In their rush to get away from it, they lost the boat. After a minute, we came around the bend, bringing the boat with us. Ricky came back in a few minutes and announced that the sheriff was on his way. They hurriedly removed the ice chest and empty cans from the boat and Ricky took everything away. After another few minutes, he came walking back with two uniformed men. The sheriff listened as the story was told again. He took everyone's name and address and phone number. He went back to his car while the deputy was asking Gerald and Ricky more questions. Was the body a male or female? Was the body white or black? Was it an adult or a child? Are you sure it was human and not animal? After what seemed like 10 hours to us kids, but was probably less than an hour, the sheriff appeared again. He was walking with four other men who were all wearing wetsuits and had scuba gear. Two of the men started taking a bunch of photos and plotted the area on a map and took more photos from the bank above the hole and from where we were standing and from the opposite bank on our side of the river. As the two men took the photos, the other two went underwater and confirmed that it was indeed a human body. Two of the men went back to wherever they had parked and returned with a table and another camera. As they returned, the sheriff told us that we should probably leave the area and stared at us until we took the hint and left. We ran back toward our cave and climbed the bank again, this time circling the opposite direction and sneaking to the edge of the bank, overlooking the scene of the excitement. The scuba divers used this second camera to take more photos underwater. They couldn't have been very good photos because the water was only neck deep and they completely disappeared in the murky water. After they finished taking photos, they brought the table out to the edge of the water. The table was actually a large float that two of the men held in place while the other two went underwater again. I don't know exactly what I was expecting to see, but this thing they brought up out of the river actually gave me bad dreams for a few weeks afterwards. It was evidently a man. His face was swollen, and his eyes and ears were gone. His belly was huge. He was wearing blue shorts and only had one sock and shoe. The thing that got me the most was his color. Gerald had said he was white, but he was actually a dull gray color with darker gray and green mottled spots, and he looked slimy. Two of his fingers were just bone. His mouth was open, and as they rolled him over onto the float, a bunch of nasty water flowed out. As I watched them walk the float back over to our side of the river, I noticed more and more details. The skin covering his elbows and knees was gone. The part that I thought was sock was actually skin. 
Evidently, when Gerald grabbed the leg and pulled on it, he had separated the skin and it just slid down the ankle. The part that I remembered most, the part that made me have bad dreams, was his head. No eyes, no ears, his mouth opened and full of who knows what. His facial skin was swollen to an almost comical size, but the skin around the tip of his chin was gone, showing bone. From watching television and reading books, I had expected the body to be locked stiff with rigor mortis, but it wasn't. His arms and legs actually flopped around as though the bones had turned to rubber. The last thing I remember about the man's body was the sight I saw as they carried him off toward the houses. The bottom of the foot without a shoe wasn't wrinkled, and it was snow white. This was the first time I had ever seen an actual dead person. Of course I had seen countless dead people on television and in the movies, but never in real life. I don't know if that was the reason for the bad dreams, or if it was because of the condition of the body. It was probably a combination of the two. I never knew who he was or how he died. I asked my mother a few days later, and after yelling at me for being down at the river, she said that she had only heard about the police finding a body. We went to the little cave a week or so later to see if there was anything new left in it, but it had completely collapsed, leaving a huge divot on the top. One of the trees on top was still standing, but at a drunken angle. It had rained, and that was evidently enough to collapse the cave in on itself. None of us cared, though. The gruesome discovery had killed the magic of the place for us. The following summer, that whole side of the bank was gone, including the tree. I ended up getting invited to this pretty wild house party back when I was a teenager. Definitely the craziest party I had ever been to. It was good while it lasted, but the reason it sticks out in my memory is far from a good one, as I'll get to explaining. So like I said, this house party was off the wall. There were kegs in all the downstairs rooms. People were taking off their clothes and dancing in the backyard. Some dudes upstairs tore down a bedroom wall with a sledgehammer. It was insane. Now with a party that intense, it's not entirely unusual for the bathroom to be full of puke with random people, like passed out all around the party. And the dude I really noticed was lying on the couch in the TV room downstairs. I figure he must have really overdone it because the whole time I'm there, he's completely passed out like to the point where he just sort of became part of the furniture in there, like he has claimed the couch to himself. In the end, people just let him be, and the party continued. People dancing around him, walked around him, drank around him, all night, too. At the end of the night, I was way too drunk to call an Uber, so I figure I'll just pass out in an upstairs bedroom and make my way home in the morning. So I have a crappy, hungover sleep, wake up, gather my stuff, and head downstairs. On the way out, I have to pass the dude who was wiped out on the couch the previous night. It didn't look like he had moved all night, and that just didn't sit right with me. So on the way out, I try to wake him. Have you ever touched someone, only to realize they're dead? They really do go cold, and they really do go stiff. And I promise you, it's one of the most mind-breakingly awful things you will ever experience in your life. I immediately yelp when I feel how cold the dude's skin was, which then has a few other sleepy people filling into the TV room to see what the deal is, which was basically me begging people to call 911 because there's a dead guy on the couch. It really messed people up, mainly because, like I said, we were dancing and drinking and partying around this dude's possibly dead body all night. And there he was, lying in the exact same position he had passed out in. There was no telling at what point he had actually slipped away. No telling just how long we had been partying around an actual corpse. 
I heard it was an overdose, but never really got that confirmed by anyone. Like I barely knew anyone at the party, just that they were good people, and it was a real shame how one of them went out. I am extra careful around drugs and alcohol now, too, and I tell my kids that if they want to get into drinking or smoking or whatever they want to do, that they do it safely. I know I can't stop them from misbehaving, especially what age they're at, and it's not even the substances I'm worried about them touching. I just never want any of my kids to have to know what it feels like. Touching flesh that's gone cold, looking at someone's face, and knowing they're no longer with us. I don't want them to know what death feels like. When I was about nine years old, my family used to live in a remote area on the outskirts of town. Considering the location of the suburb, that area was surrounded by warehouses and such. At the time, my family did not have a phone in the house and neither did our neighbors. There were no cell phones back then, or they were a luxury and not everyone could afford one. This took place in the end of the 90s. So, if I needed to call my mom whilst she was at work, I had to either go to my dad's work or a company next to his, which was closer, to make a phone call. My dad's work was a relatively short walk from our house, probably 30 minutes or less. My dad was working at a huge unloading dock for metallurgical natural resources shipments. In order to get to my dad's work, I had to walk past another adjacent company, just like the one where my dad was working. I will call it Docks 2. My dad's work, as well as Docks 2, had a sort of watchtower. It is just a cabin mounted at the top of a tall platform, and you need to go up a decent amount of stairs to get to the top. There was always a guard inside overseeing the whole yard from the top, during the day and night, to make sure no one is in danger, and no break-ins. The phones were located only on site watchtowers at the time. Docks 2 were much closer to our house, about a 10 minute walk. One day, as I have done many times before, I went to Docks 2 to make a call. I climbed the stairs, knocked on the door, and was welcomed in by a guard I used to see quite often, and knew well. However, that day he wasn't alone. The new guy, who was 28 at the time, was there. Apparently, he was a new employee hired to work shifts. He was this very tanned man, always wearing military-style outfits. I was just an average-looking child looking exactly my age. My hair was very blonde, which made my cheeks always appear rosy red and give me even more of a childish appearance. When the new guy saw me that day, he would not take his eyes off me. As soon as I was about to finish my call with my mom, the new guy went outside to smoke. When I came out, he smiled at me and asked me what my name is and whether I came there often to make calls. I don't remember what I said, but I felt very shy because he was staring deeply into my eyes. I will call him the creep. Fast forward a few days and I came to that tower again to make a call. And there he was again, but that time he was alone. I spoke to my mom, and as I was about to leave, he asked me if I want any tea, to which I refused. He then proceeded to ask how my school was going, and things like that. He offered to help me with my homework, however I told him I have got it all sorted. Harmless, but strange. On a side note, I just want to say that what gave me shivers when I was near him is whenever he looked at me, he looked drunk which was very unsettling. Mind you, he wasn't actually drunk, but his eyes would get so hazy and his face flush red. Sometime later, I saw him again. That time, I was walking to my dad's work with my friend, and he was doing some digging in docks too. When he saw me through the metal fence that was separating us, he just leaned against his shovel and stared at me. He didn't say hi or anything. After those encounters, 
For quite some time, I took alternative routes to see my dad, or play with puppies at my dad's work, or make calls to my mom, because he really creeped me out. However, one day I had to call my mom urgently. My dad's work phone didn't work, so I had to go to Doc's 2 Tower, hoping I wouldn't see him. The creep was there, and oh boy was he so happy I came. He was complaining how I don't come anymore to see him. As I was making a call, he grabbed another chair and sat right next to me, very close. It took a while for my mom to get on the phone because she was busy with something and someone went to get her whilst I was on the line. It felt like hours waiting and the creep was just seated next to me, looking at me and smiling. When my mom finally got to the phone, he got up and went to make me tea and brought some biscuits. When I was done talking, he insisted I have some tea with him, which I didn't, and he just kept on trying to strike a conversation, but this time the tone of conversation was different. He asked me how old exactly I was, and I told him 12. I have no idea why I lied. He told me his age, and although I knew he was much older, I felt really weirded out that he wanted to talk to me so badly or had any interest in me. My alarms did go off every time I was around him, but I guess I didn't feel overly in danger. He then proceeded to tell me that I was beautiful and asked me whether I had a boyfriend. He asked me if I have already dated boys and what type of boys I liked. I was so uncomfortable and so eager to leave at that point, but he would just keep dragging me into these weird conversations. I could tell he was drinking that day. When I began moving towards the door, he followed me. Eventually we both were outside, however, in order to get down from the tower, you need to walk this narrow path towards the stairs. He stood blocking it so I couldn't leave. He got very close to me, and I was freaking out. The only escape tactic I could come up with as a child was to pretend that I'm seeing someone from the top of the tower. So I began waving my hand at the road down at the bottom and towards houses in the distance, pretending I see someone I know and saying, Oh look, that's my uncle, he's waving. The creep looked in that direction, but either didn't care or could tell that I was lying. I kept on telling him that the uncle who waved back is a very big, angry man, and if I don't come down this instance and go home, we both are going to be in trouble. The creep didn't budge. He got even closer and eventually pressed me against the railing. He kept on asking me his weird questions whilst I was terrified to move because I didn't want to move my body against his, if that makes any sense. So I just froze. He asked me if I would go on a date with him and that he is looking for a girlfriend. And at that particular moment, someone was coming up the stairs to the tower, so he let me go, but asked me to come back. I have not told anyone about this encounter at that stage because I was afraid that my parents would get angry. I also felt very embarrassed and thought that people would judge me for what's happened. Sometime later I was home and it was around 9 p.m. I know what time it was because it was my bedtime. Suddenly, a car pulled into our driveway. I came to see who it was through the front room window, and I could see it was the creep, but this time with other guys, blasting music in his car and shouting my name. I have no idea how he knew where I lived. He must have followed me one day. My dad was outraged. He asked me who these people were but before I could even answer, he rushed outside. Apparently, the creep wanted me to go out with him and his friends. My dad obviously refused, saying that I am a child and too young to hang out with them or go out at this time of night, and that if he sees any one of them ever again, he will beat the living heck out of them. So, they drove away. I was so upset with my dad that he called me a child in front of them. I think because we lived so far away from everything, I was really keen to make friends, as there were no kids around as such. For a while after that, I had not seen the creep again, or heard of him. 
A significant time later, I was walking to my dad's work again, and I have completely forgotten about this creep. He was working in docks too with his friends. Maybe those that came with him that night in the car. Or maybe these were just his co-workers. I got scared when I saw him, and even though he shouted hi to me, I pretended to not hear it. He said something to his friends, and I remember so clearly how one of his friends exclaimed loudly, Her? I guess he told them about me, or his interest in me, but no one expected me to be a child. I looked at the guy that exclaimed. He was staring at me in utter disbelief. He must have been 20 to 25 or so, I think. And the creep was saying something to him. His friend screamed at him. Have you lost your mind? Clearly, the creep didn't see me as a child like everyone else did. Fast forward again, maybe half a year later. One day I was home alone in the evening, waiting for my parents to come back from work. We lived in a very safe community, so sometimes I'd be home by myself for a little bit after school until my parents got home. I was playing a game whereby I was a singer. I had this stage created in the living room, and I was performing in front of the chairs, pretending chairs were my live audience. It was pitch black outside. At some point during my performance, I see someone staring at me through the living room window. That person must have been crouching down, as only the top of their face could be seen from the bottom. As soon as that person realized I saw them, they ran. I was so embarrassed that someone saw me performing, scared and shocked at the same time, that I was glued to the floor. I don't know if that was him. Our dog didn't react at all, maybe because the music was playing very loud. I was scared to go outside the house and check, but I peered through the window, and no one was there. That person had to climb over a wooden fence to get to our living room window. I told my parents about it. I have also asked my friend whether it was him who came around, but he said it wasn't. I don't know if my friend felt shy to admit he was watching me, or whether it was the creep. In closing, one day I went to Docks 2 with my dad, as my dad needed something from there for work. I saw the old guard that I knew well, and asked about the creep, and was told that he doesn't work there anymore. I don't know whatever became of him. Hi everyone, so my name is Lena. I am Malay and I spent a summer in the United States as a part of a summer school program at Virginia Tech University. There were lots of extracurricular activities too. I mean, what else were we going to do with our spare time? So I got to know a lot of my classmates rather well while doing all sorts of cool things with them. One of the most amazing things I got to do while I was there was go hiking up in the Appalachian Mountains. I managed to get some pictures of the most stunning views I have ever seen in my life, and walking those hills will remain one of the most memorable times of my entire life. But I'll never forget my time in the Appalachians for another reason too, because it included one of the most hair-raisingly terrifying experiences of my life. One which left me shaking from the amount of adrenaline running through me. So at one point, we were taking a break from hiking, eating some snacks, and taking sips from bottles of water that didn't manage to stay very cold for very long. I am chatting with my best friends on the trip, Sol and Gabby, when we hear some rustling in the foliage next to us. The next thing I hear is our guide whispering, Don't move. No one move a muscle. They had been confident to the point of cockiness on the trail up until that point. A real outdoorsy manly man type but hearing the fear in their voice made my blood turn to ice, which was no small feat on such a hot day. I did as I was told. I didn't move. I just sort of shifted my eyes in the direction of the rustling, and when I saw what came out of the bushes, I couldn't even scream I was so scared. It was like I had been turned into a stone statue. 
albeit one that trembled uncontrollably with fear. It was a bear, a black bear, and it was walking right towards me. I suppose it had been attracted to the smell of our snacks. From what I understand, black bears don't have the best eyesight, but they do have an incredible sense of smell. And even though we weren't cooking any food, it must have been close enough in the area to be able to pick up the scent. I stayed as still as I could as it walked up to me, but when it stood up on its hind legs, I swear my heart nearly stopped beating altogether. I had no idea they could do that, like I kind of knew black bears were smaller than grizzlies or polar bears, and that they were considerably less aggressive too, but oh my gosh, that thing wasn't small when it stood up like that. I swear, it was so tall. I was trembling and holding back whimpers of fear as it started to sniff me, knowing that if I made one wrong move, if I didn't keep my cool and stay perfectly still, it might just maul me to death right there and then. It was the most terrifying moment of my life so far. It sort of lost interest in me after a few moments, moving on to my friend Soul, who just dropped the sandwich he was eating immediately. The bear sniffed at it, but ignored it, then did the same thing to her, standing on its hind legs and sniffing at her face and neck. Then suddenly, out of nowhere, it just lost interest in us and wandered off into the woods again. We all breathed a heavy sigh of relief as it left us, thankful that it wasn't hungry or ballsy enough to have attacked us. Never in all my years have I ever had such an up-close and personal encounter with such a powerful, wild beast. It left an indelible mark on me, giving me profound respect for nature, even more so than I had beforehand. I am just so thankful that it wasn't a grizzly or something out in the Pacific Northwest, because if it was, I probably wouldn't be telling this story. I live in a place called Beddington, here in Maine. It's least populated part of the state, which probably makes it one of the least populated areas in the country. And with a population of just over 50 people, we're the very definition of a one stoplight kind of town. We all live pretty spaced out too. Nearest neighbor on my right side is about a mile away. Nearest neighbor on my left side is more like three miles away. The sense of community is real strong but out here you really are alone, in most senses of the word. And that kind of isolation is made all the more obvious whenever there's a power cut. It's only happened like twice the entire time I've been living out here, and one time it was only for about an hour. But the second time, it must have been a serious fault down at whatever power station feeds us juice, because the power was out all night. And I don't just remember that night because I couldn't watch the Pats play ball, it's burned into my memory for other reasons too. So like I said, second ever power cut, but thanks to the experience I gained the first time around, I fare a little better that time. I have candles stored away. I have dynamo flashlights. I even got a battery powered hot plate that would be good for a few uses, even if it did burn through the batteries. So instead of panicking and bumping into stuff in the dark, that time I just make myself comfortable pick up a good book, and sit down to write it out on the couch. Now it's at this point that I should bring up my dog, Teddy. Teddy got his name because my grown-up daughter thought he looks like a teddy bear, which he kinda does. And given his considerably superior senses, the power cuts never seemed to bother Teddy none. Teddy never bumped into furniture, or got spooked at every little noise or shadow. Teddy just stayed curled up by the log fire and warmed his bones. As I curl up myself, Teddy gives me this look at one point as if to say, See, now you get it, old man. Just relax and take a load off. The power will come back on when it's good and ready to. But Teddy didn't stay relaxed for long, and neither did I. A couple of hours go by, and I am so engrossed by the book I was reading that when Teddy started to bark, it almost scared me out of my wits. See, Teddy never barked at anything. Even when he saw squirrels or raccoons, he would just sort of look at me like, 
What are you going to do about them three critters there, old man? Nothing fazed him, ever, so to even hear him yapping like that in the first place was pretty unusual. Then that got me wondering what could possibly freak him out enough to make him bark. I'm like, what is it, boy? What are you smelling? But Teddy just gets up, walks over towards the door to the hallway, and starts growling all low in between barks. And as I'm sitting there watching him, I get this real bad feeling in the pit of my stomach. That was the first time I had ever seen him acting like that, downright aggressive and territorial. Now as much as I respect the Second Amendment, I don't really believe in keeping a weapon in the house. I hate them, always have. Long story short, I lost a relative in an accident when I was a kid. Now just being around them makes me sweat. But what I do have on hand for home defense is an old recurve bow that I used for hunting. Not exactly ideal to stop a burglar, but it was better than nothing. I must have looked like an old, worn-out Comanche warrior creeping through my living room with a bow and arrow with only firelight to see where I was going. But I sure didn't feel like one. I had just turned 55. I was a grown man, but something about all that darkness and being so isolated made me feel like a scared kid. Best case scenario, Teddy had picked up the smell of a bear or a lynx on the wind, one that was still way off in the distance. Worst case would be something considerably worse. When I take a peek out front of the house through the window of my office, Teddy follows, jumping up on the windowsill and barking a few times after sniffing the air. Whatever he was smelling, I sure wasn't seeing it, so after peering into the darkness for a minute or two, I just take Teddy back into the TV room where he stopped his barking. All was quiet again, so I carried on with my reading. About an hour later, the same thing happens all over again. Teddy jumps up from the rug, barking up a storm, only this time he seems considerably more aggressive. He bounds over to the door of the TV room, scratching at the handle and growling in a way that actually kind of frightened me. Like I said before, I had never seen Teddy act like that, and he was a completely different dog. When I let him out of the TV room, Teddy ran through the open door of the kitchen and started barking and scratching at the back door. I mean, he was going back there, and there was no way I was going to let him outside. The mood he was in, he would probably run off as fast as he could and getting himself lost. And besides that, I felt strangely safer with Teddy around. He stopped barking for a second, sniffed the air, and then bolted back into the TV room where he started barking even louder at the glass patio doors that led to the backyard. I follow him. I'm all like, get him boy, tear him up. But when I catch a glimpse of the sliding glass doors, I'd swear I saw something moving in the shadows outside. I couldn't even tell you what I saw. It was nothing more than a flash of movement, but it was obvious enough for me to grab that recurve bow that I had propped up against the couch. I was so scared that I could barely line the arrow up with the drawstring. Teddy was going crazy at this point, acting like he was fixing to smash through the glass windows and chase down whatever he could smell. And like I said, it might have even just been the way the firelight reflected on the glass, but I wasn't willing to roll the dice on something being out there. Then suddenly, Teddy stops barking again. I figure it's because he lost the scent or something, because he shuts up entirely and stops pawing at the glass in the back door. But then he went and did the weirdest thing. He backs off from the doors, stands in front of me, shaking on all fours, and takes a piss right there on the carpet. He hadn't done anything like that since he was a puppy. Teddy was hardcore house trained. It's definitely not out of fear of some black bear either. Teddy's been in the same area as those ever since he was a puppy, and unless he actually saw one, I can't imagine he would freak out the way that he did. But the fact remains that animals like dogs have been known to just go to the bathroom on themselves whenever a much larger predator is in the area. Only I can't imagine how much larger it must have been to make Teddy forget his house training. After that, he was almost completely silent, just the occasional whimper while I stood there in the firelight, just waiting for the mother of all black bears to come smashing through the back windows. At least, I hoped it was nothing but a black bear. I understand those animals, but I didn't understand what was going on during that power out at all, and it just about scared the crap out of me.
but by far the worst part of the experience was when I actually heard something on the little side walkway to my house. See, there's a little gravel path where my wife used to grow vegetables, right around the side of my house, and I swear to the Almighty that I heard two distinct crunches on the gravel right as I'm staring out into the darkness for like the hundredth time. That's when I started to call out, I know you're there. I'm armed. Now you better get out of here. I listened again, and for the next few minutes, there was nothing but silence. Just then, when I started to think I had imagined the whole thing, I heard it again, clear as day. Footfalls on the gravel. That time I was closer, and I had heard people walk up and down the gravel path a hundred times over the years. So I'm telling you right now, whatever was outside my house that night was way, way bigger than a person. If it was a black bear, it must have been the biggest one on the entire East Coast. Now I'm not saying it wasn't a bear or something, maybe it was just a big old dog that got lost and took to wandering into my yard. But like I said, it was big, really big. And you can bet I was shaking like a dog as I heard its footfalls getting quieter and quieter as it made its way off my property. I didn't hear anything for the rest of the night. Teddy didn't bark again, but he seemed like he had thrown in the towel with that line of defense anyway but I didn't hear anything outside, and evidently nothing broke into the house, otherwise I'd be rambling on about it. It's just kind of surreal to me that one of the scariest experiences of my life comes across like a second-rate campfire tale. I don't scare easy, and what happened during that blackout scared me to death. I just hope whatever the thing was, whether it was a bear or the Turner Beast or something else entirely, stays well away from my property in the future because it would take far more than just a few arrows to take down a beast as big as that.
Thank <laughs> you.